but very fast. But but how is it that this very complex, intricate thing, uh, which is very obviously alive because it grows, it moves, uh, it it divides to to form daughter cells. Um, uh, how this thing is actually alive? Um, nobody nobody really knows and. And I will touch on this, on the problem for this, because this is a very, very fundamental problem, which I feel uh, exists within the, within the whole field of, of life sciences. Okay, so now let's talk about fine tuning. Um, it's, it's actually, a, fine tuning is a very, very simple concept, uh, which, which is basically to, to, to adjust, very finely adjust um, um, in order to, to have greater performance, to say very simply. Um, different fields have more intricate uh, definitions, but in, in essence, it's the act of making fine adjustments so as to get the desired um, outcome, right? So this, we see this uh, in, in developing a city, right? In, 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 in uh, developing automobiles, and even in simple tasks like making coffee, we see that some, some kind of fine tuning is involved. Uh, you know, perhaps it's too bitter, perhaps you need to add more sugar. Uh, like, you know, so for, from at every level of human endeavor, we can see that there is fine tuning. Um, in fact, I would even argue that there is, there's almost no endeavor where there's no fine tuning, right? And so, so this, I think we, we all can, can very easily accept. Now, if you look at the at animals, we see that it is also there. So it's not just limited to human beings, but it's also uh, present in animals. For example, um, it, is, it, is, it has been shown that chimpanzees and other primates are able to, to use, to make different types of simple tools uh, in order to get their food. Um, so they would use um, uh, sticks or, or long straws of grass, for example, to, um, to put into anthills or and nest in order to, to, to get the end out as food. So this is one, one example. Uh, and then of course, the, the building of a nest by a bird is, is extremely intricate. And it's not that the bird gets it right the first time all the time, right? It, there's all, there's, if you look at the whole process, there's a lot of, of um, trial and error and fine tuning before they get, they get the, the, the perfect nest, so, so to speak. Um, and, and also in mice, uh, even within the lab, um, scientists has, have shown that, that mice are able to learn, the, and, and this is not just limited to mice, uh, the same has been shown with fruit flies, where they are able to learn a certain uh, route um, within a maze, and over time, they are actually able to get through the maze uh, at a faster pace, uh, right? So we, we see that this is this trait is very very much um, um, associated with animals, and to be more precise, it is actually very much associated with uh, learning and memory. Uh, it has been shown that uh, let's we, we go back to the mice or even the fruit fly. It has been shown that when certain parts of the brain, to be more specific, the the hippocampus region of the brain, when those parts of the brain are um, um, affected in some way, right? Either certain uh, genes associated with learning and memory are downregulated or knocked down, or if um, you actually make a dissection, we see that um, this phenomenon of, of being able to learn and fine tune stops, right? The animal is not able to do this anymore. So, so we can we can safely say that uh, this is very much present also in animals, but it is impaired when certain parts of the brain is, um, is blocked or hindered. Uh, and so this, this uh, the, the part of the brain slightly differs between humans and mice and um, uh, the drosophila or the fruit fly. But the point of the matter is that it is it exists, okay? Now, in my observation, uh, this is less seen within simpler organisms. Uh, for example, with cells or um, um, uh, different types of cells, right? Procari prokaryotes, eukaryotes. Um, in my observation, this is less obvious. Um, uh, so when, when somehow when the nervous system is not present, 
we realize that that this this act of fine tuning is less um, obvious, but rather we see that there is more of a um, um, uh, passive action, meaning to say when there's a, it's more of a stimuli response kind of relationship where when you put a stimuli, the organism moves towards it. And when you re remove the stimuli, uh, the, um, the organism doesn't move towards it. So it's, it's, it becomes, it seems to indicate that has the, the intricacy of the organism and has um, the sophistication of the nervous system goes down uh, to the point of there's no nervous system, uh, there, there is lesser evidence of um, uh, these kind of fine tuning mechanisms within the organism. Now, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to discuss this further because there are other schools of thought that say that on a subtle level, it is still there, uh, which I'm not arguing against, but I'm speaking when you look under the microscope, we see that this is less obvious. So it almost, be the cell uh, almost becomes like a dust particle that is, that is being bombarded uh, by different molecules and moves around by Br Brownian motion. It almost becomes like that, um, uh, even though the cell itself is alive. Okay, so now, so we have, we have looked at how um, uh, humans, how animals, how, uh, and, and simpler organisms um, use fine tuning, right? It has, they move about. So the, the summary is that the more higher the intellect, uh, the more advanced the brain structure, the more sophisticated or intricate the, the whole fine tuning mechanism they use. Okay, now let us look from another perspective, right? Let us look at uh, from, uh, from an outside perspective and let's look at, at our creation. Let's look at the atoms. Let's look at the cells. Let's look at the universe. And let's see how much evidence of fine tuning we can find. And I'm sure you know this answer already that there's immense, immense evidence of fine tuning everywhere in nature from as simple as um, the, the, the structure of an electron, right? Um, uh, um, uh, having, having the balance of positive and negative charges, having very specific proton weights, having, um, um, uh, having very specific, uh, um, uh, what is this called? Uh, um, orbital orbital theories that that function that that till to date uh, nobody exactly knows how it's happening, but it is happening in 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 a very precise way. And if any of these parameters uh, change, the whole the whole uh, atom itself would collapse, right? So so we see that even from from as simple as uh, an atom, uh, there is such elaborate fine tuning at work. Uh, that, that today uh, humans are not able to co fully comprehend, right? We all speak about the, um, um, the electron, but no one has actually seen the electron. We see, we study the symptoms of the electron, but we, no one has really seen the electron. Um, you know, so, so we can understand, the point of the method is that we can understand it's extremely, extremely complete, complex. And biological systems, right? That, I mean, that takes the complexity to another level because all these atoms are being applied um, uh, in, a, in a very complex system that allows us to function the way we are functioning. Um, um, our brains, uh, our brains, our memory, our feelings, our emotions, all of these are um, to a large extent dictated by different biological systems that, that, um, that if, if a certain parameter, for example, if, the, if a certain uh, um, ionic channel within our brain does not function like it's, it should function, uh, we immediately suffer from different uh, sickness. Uh, the same way if um, uh, we can see this a lot in, in stroke patients, for example, when, when a certain portion of the brain gets, gets um, uh, disrupted for whatever reason, we see that there's an impairment in, in our complete activity. Uh, in the same way, not, not just the, the nervous system, the same with the cardiac system, the same um, with our muscular system, everything is so very uh, precisely fine-tuned that if, if something were to be tweaked, uh, everything else um, uh, suffers, right? So all of, these, all of these systems work 
very much together in order for us to be what we are right and 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 the, the same the way the way crystal structures form the angles between excuse me the angles between them um all of these things are very very um uh, intricately designed in in such a way that they have to work in a, a certain way look at our atmosphere our um our earth uh, and the moon is about the same distance from the sun right it's it's about the same distance but if we were to live on the moon we would either get frozen to i mean apart from from having oxygen and all that we'd either get frozen or we'd get cooked but we are comfortable on earth why because we have we have an atmosphere that allows us to be comfortable here um the same if you if you look at a lake um uh during winter the top of the lake may be frozen but at the same time we see that fish live underneath uh, aquatic life goes on underneath right and the reason for this is because water has its highest density at 4 degrees celsius which uh while it freezes at 0 degrees so so at 4 degrees the water is heavier it goes down uh and the top portion gets frozen so all of these are so in are so beautifully um fine tuned such that that life continues as it is uh, and then of course um there's the principle of the golden ratio where um where when where a lot of nature follows that gives it gives nature the the beauty we see in nature right so this, uh, like i won't go into this because even i am not uh, an expert in this but the point of the matter is that everything is so nicely fine tuned um in almost every aspect uh, that we look at um so these the, the picture on the right was was taken just a few days ago uh uh, uh by nasa and i think i believe there should be two other pictures coming out if they have not come out already um so the picture on the on the left is our milky way galaxy and we are supposed we are supposed to be somewhere there at least according to this article but um in this picture this picture was is um i think uh 40 billion years back in time right this 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 is a snapshot of i think like 40 billion years back in time um and and we can and what we see is just like our milky way we see many galaxies um uh, right so this they were able to cap use infrared uh capture to capture many galaxies in the distant from the distant past i should say uh and it is shown that some of these galaxies actually bent or at least they seem to to be bending because of the because of the of the um, strong gravitational pull of some of these of some of these uh, celestial bodies um i don't this is not my field i don't understand it well enough but the point of the matter is that is that all of these all of these are being governed by very precise laws um uh within the universe right and and it is because of these precision these fine tuned precision and these fine tuned laws that things exist the way they exist right the the not so not just from the atom atomic point of view not just from a biological point of view but we see this prevalent throughout the whole universe right and um these are some of the of the um uh, different constants fundamental constants we see uh, uh within this universe so it so the point is that it the entire creation is rampant with this, with signs of fine tuning um uh and it's so it's so complex that after decades of study we as human beings still don't understand um how all of these things work or why these things work the way they work um so based on what we mentioned earlier that the the more sophisticated uh the organism like for example with 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 comparing humans um with uh, single cell organisms it seems that the more sophisticated the organism the more sophisticated the fine tuning the more sophisticated um um or more intricate the fine tuning and design so just from this we can already logically infer that the creator of this universe must be extremely intelligent right i think that's a very very logical um inference that we can make right and that is exactly what um the the vedantic perspective of 
speaks about. Right? It talks about how, how the symptom of life, the symptom of life everywhere from, from the uh, single cell organism um, all the way till humans and, and, and beyond is consciousness. And the higher the, con the amount of consciousness that's being exhibited, um, so I'm talking about the exhibition of consciousness, not the consciousness of the, the higher the level of consciousness that's exhibited, we see there's more, uh, in this case, there's more evidence of fine tuning, but there's also, um, there's more intricacies, there's more um, deeper in thinking. Uh, and we can see, we can see this even in um, um, our previous sages, right? Because they are able to develop their consciousness and exhibit a very, very high level of consciousness. Um, they are able to go into realms and perspectives that we cannot understand, right? And even, um, I'll be very happy to, to discuss more about this. I don't want to go too much into detail here, but we can even see um, uh, very advanced uh, scientists and mathematicians right? because they uh, because they have put in or invested so much um, of their energy into certain subject areas, they they are prom they they are able to conceive of things that general mathematicians or scientists are not able to. Right. So so I think this just boils down to the fact that um, even if someone does not believe. Um, um, if someone is an agnostic and they do not know whether there is um, uh, such a thing as a God, they can already understand that, 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 that whoever or whatever created this universe must be extremely intelligent. Now we'll touch on this a little bit more uh, in the coming slides. So from the Vedantic perspective, this is very, very clear, right? Uh, for example, the, the scripture called the Brahma Samhita speaks about this, Ishwara Parama Krishna, Sachid Ananda Vikra, Nadir Adir Govinda, Sarva Karana Karanam. Meaning to say that, um, that the, this prayer by Lord Brahma is, is saying that Krishna is the topmost, is the topmost God of gods, so to speak, uh, to say in, in, in English. Um, and that his entire being is not material, right? So this whole material world, everything um, is made of matter, um, uh, including our bodies, right? As soon as, as a person passes away, the body starts to deteriorate. But here he's saying that, but the form of God is not made of matter. Um, he's a, he is the beginning of everything and the cause of all causes. So when we think of a, a, of a creator like that, then looking at the intricacies we see in this world is not surprising. That and then in another in in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Lord Krishna himself says, "Aham sarvasya prabhavo matta sarvam pravartute iti matva bhajantema buddha bhava samanvitaha." I am the source of all spiritual and material worlds. Everything emanates from me. The wise who perfectly know this engaged in my engage in my devotional service and worship me with all their hearts. So, uh, but the problem is, the problem is, um, even, even though to us it may seem very straightforward, um, what I've discussed, um, the, the, general, the general feeling or the general idea or the general concept of scientists today is very, very different. Because, um, Having, having been trained as a scientist myself, uh, and as you would have heard in the, in the key, keynote lecture earlier before this session started by uh, Dr. T.D. Singh, um, the, the general sentiments of scientists is that everything needs to be explained by sense perception. Um, there, there seems to be, at least from my, from my uh, experience as a biological scientist, there seems to be uh, uh, almost like like an animosity against God, to 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 say it in an understandable way. Um, uh, the object the objective of science is to understand um, the truth, right? But for some reason, scientists just do not want to accept um, the concept of God 
has been true. Because, and one reason for this is because they feel that, that when we accept a higher being, a higher authority, um, uh, such as God, then, then immediately science cannot explain. So they, they, so even, so it seems as if even though all the evidence is pointing towards a higher being, they just would. It is something they do not want to accept, and so they give the explanation that everything is happening by chance. Um, uh, all that we spoke about, all the fine tuning in in biology, all the fine tuning in the universe, um, happened by chance over very, very long periods of time. So obviously, um, uh, this is not very, very uh, logical because it's, it's um, an example I like to give is like uh, saying, when you see a, a, a building made of Lego or a castle, a huge castle made of Lego, um, uh, and, you, and you, say that, you say that if you keep throwing this into the air, um, over a long period of time, some of these may assemble together to form a Lego uh, castle, right? Which so it, it, it does not make any sense, uh, but but that is the that is the um, idea most biological scientists prefer to take. So if you if you look at uh, uh, biological uh, literature, a lot of biological literature, a lot the the term of uh, of um, uh, certain phenomenon evolved to become something, right? Or a certain, or, or a certain uh, pathway evolved to become the way it is. It's very common. They would always use the term uh, um, over time, over evolution, uh, by, uh, by mechanisms of evolution, certain properties have come about. Um, so things like that have become a norm within the, the uh, scientific community as long as we do not involve God in. But having said that, there are also a group of scientists who may not necessarily um, use God for their arguments, but they at least admit that they don't really know how things happen. Okay, so uh, we, know, we know from the Vedic uh, scriptures that knowledge can be derived in different ways. Um, there, there are actually 10 different ways, but you can summarize this into three as direct perception, inference, and revealed knowledge. Uh, so the, the, the modern scientific paradigm um, prefers to only use direct perception and inference for their knowledge. Uh, uh, for example, the whole, the whole um, theory of evolution came, came about because uh, um, Darwin and uh, what's his other name? Uh, Wallace, right? In different parts of the world around the same time. Uh, and, and, and there are reports of people even before that. Um, they studied nature and they saw similarities between different organisms, uh, similarities between different people. Uh, uh, um, and they came up with this idea that one evolved to the other, um, right? So, so, um, so they prefer to use the, uh, inference um, and direct perception as their only means, and they completely disregard um, uh, revealed knowledge as, as, having, as having any kind of value. Uh, but this is very dangerous because, because then we would always be like a fish in a pond trying to understand the ocean, or in this example, like blind men feeling different parts of the elephant uh, and coming up with their own idea um, of what the elephant is. So what happened? What is happening today is that you have different blind men feeling different parts of the of the elephant, and they publish their idea of what the elephant is. They come to conferences and talk about their idea of what the elephant is. But there's no way you can actually understand the elephant by 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 studying one one part of the elephant, right? So unfortunately, um, this. This is what's happening today in the field of, um, or at least at least for most uh, uh, life science areas. So because of this, um, uh, everything about everything we know about ourselves boil down to atoms, molecules, cells, organs, organ systems, but not more than that. Um, uh, which and, and and like like what was was earlier men mentioned. 
uh, about the, the nanoparticles that contain mercury. Um, so from, you know, because that is coming from a, from a higher source, it is able to, to serve its function of, of, um, of serving humanity. While if we try to study it from the molecular point of view, there's no way a drug like that will be sanctioned. So one, one point um, which I want to uh, ask is, uh, and, 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 and I was hoping for some discussion here, is so if there's a creator, right? Um, and I, which I think everyone on this, on this uh, um, call or in, in this platform agrees, then what is the purpose of creation? Now, we, this can be answered from two ways. It can be answered from our um, uh, background of, or from whichever faiths or cultures we come from. But uh, let us maybe take a step away from our, our, our religious or cultural background. And let us think from the point of view of, of as a scientist, uh, from a scientific point of view, um, what would be the purpose of this creation? So with this, I would like to open up the, the question and answer um, um, and, and have a discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you, Katti. What should I call you, Vinesh or Katti? Uh, my, my, fir my first name is Vignesh. And I know that, yeah. Yeah, okay. so Vig Vignesh is fine. Okay, fine. Okay, Vinesh, I, you have really given almost 20 minutes to this audience to have lots of discussion. And the subject is such that it is really expected that it will pro evoke a lot of questions. I already have questions on my hand and I will read them out for you and I, I invite the remaining audience to keep writing whatever the questions they have and Vinish will try to discuss it. It's not a question of answering, we are discussing. So the first question is from Professor Anurag Mishra, University of Delhi. Question is, you have linked higher consciousness to more evidence of FT, okay. Can you please elaborate it? That is the first. And how do you distinguish consciousness with higher consciousness? So he's describing consciousness having two levels, one lower, another higher, and wants you to distinguish between these two consciousness. Repeat, one is linking the higher consciousness with evidence of FT. Second, Distinguish between the two consciousness, okay. please. Very nice question. Thank you very much for this question. So the first question is um, uh, linking uh, higher consciousness with, F, with fine tuning. So um, it's not about having higher or lower consciousness because according to, this, according to the science of consciousness, um, consciousness is the symptom of the spiriton, right? Or the soul. So, um, so it's not about higher or lower consciousness, but what, what it is, is that different organisms exhibit different levels of consciousness. Um, let us just see, let us see just, just um, <clears throat> within what we have experienced. Um, the amount of consciousness exhibited by a plant is very different from the amount of consciousness exhibited by a mouse, which is very different from the amount of consciousness exhibited by um, uh, a chimpanzee, which is very different from the level of consciousness exhibited by a human being. Do we agree with this? Anyone in the house agree with it? Or disagree? <laughs> or Anurag, do you agree with it? Yeah. Okay, Anurag okay. agrees. Okay. So, so, so it's not so much about consciousness. Because consciousness is the, like I mentioned, is the symptom of the soul. It's about the exhibition of consciousness based on the bodies uh, the different organisms have. Uh, so we can see that um, for organisms that have a more sophisticated nervous system, uh, they, tend the, they tend to exhibit more um, intricate fine tuning. 
right? And so I gave the example of, of humans versus uh, the mice, for example. So there is there are symptoms of fine tuning even in the mice, but it's still very uh, it's very preliminary compared to what you see in humans. So that uh, so that is for the first question. Is that clear? Okay. We have another question. Question yeah. two. You deliberated upon the fine tuning of nature, animals, and humans. Had it been so, the human face should have been the perfect always through its median, right? Through its medium. So you already showed about the, uh, the golden ratio. I appreciate that. But this is almost like a very similar question. But question is, uh, had it, if humans are more evolved than animals, then how about the human face? Should it not have been more perfect than it is today? Okay. Uh, okay. Be, be, but before, before, before I answer this, um, I just want to ask the previous question. Is it okay? Previous question was. No, is it, is it answered properly? Like, do you want me to yeah, add more? Okay. He has answered. If you want to add, you can add. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Then we'll go to the next question. So you're saying that why is the human face more, not more perfect? Is it? Yes. Yes. Um, so, so this, see, so I, the way I was saying is that I was talking about uh, two things. Right? One is fine tuning exhibited by human activities, right? So we see that the, the more intricate the nervous system, the more intricate the fine tuning exhibited by the organism with humans being uh, the most advanced. Now, the human face is not a design of the human being. Human, the human face is is um, is a design is there are many factors that that come into the human face genetic factors environmental factors um, you know so 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 it is what it is <laughs> because it's, it's based on on the genes we get from our parents which is based on the genes we get from their parents which is based on the which is also based on uh, environmental factors so there are intrinsic and extrinsic factors that play a, a role in this um, so this this is has nothing to do with fine tuning. I can add one thing to what Vinesh said that any of you who read, especially the students, I am telling the uh, golden ratio. It's a beautiful ratio yes. which you find everywhere, and there has been a lot of research on human face and on many aspects, even our yes. ear and the whole face, the length from the top to the your uh, uh, nose and nose to the lips and lips to this yes. all of them if you think they actually come in the golden ratio yeah. if you within the bracket of uncertainty yeah i mean so, error limit very 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 true very and very rightly uh, mentioned also in fact they take it one step further to say that um people with with that follow the golden ratio more accurately uh, tend to be more attractive, right? Exactly. But yeah, so 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 it follows the golden ratio. But I think the human face itself is is them is it's a it's a genetic fact. There's so many factors involved. Accept that. Yeah. Any questions, please, please pass on. Yeah. Please, yeah, H hand over your questions to here. Okay, that will be nice. Yeah, please hand over. Right. So here is a, a question uh, from. Uh, Srimoy Parui, uh, she is uh, a seventh standard student, student from, uh, okay, she is asking the same thing. Uh, what is the meaning of golden ratio and how is this related with creation and consciousness? That's interesting. Okay, uh, can yeah, we so finish on the screen? Don't put the screen on my face. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so... <laughs> So the, the golden ratio is just is just like has what uh, Prof mentioned is it's um, a way of a way things form that make it very attractive. Um, so it's it's actually a mathematical uh, phenomenon. You can read a lot about this, but it what is been noticed is that you can find evidence of the golden ratio in many areas. Um, in uh, for example, the forming of a coral. Uh, or rather a forming of a shell, uh, a forming of a conch, 
um, uh, within leaves, uh, we can find the golden ratio. I think you can even see it within the structure of um, of snow of snowflakes. All of these tend to follow um, this golden ratio, and it is shown that the more accurately you follow the golden ratio, um, the more the more aesthetically pleasing it is to the to the eye or to the mind. The and that Simu is yo. Sorry? How is this ratio written and consciousness? Okay, so so but the the this ratio, so the point, the connection with creation is that we find it everywhere. Uh, it, it see it seems to it seems to be a rule that is we find everywhere. So again, it it, it boils down to fine tuning that that creation is not made in a very messy way. It follows certain very uh, very precise formulas. That's that's the point I want to say. Uh, with consciousness is different because um, you, there are two there are two kinds of nature: material and spiritual. Material nature is what we are talking about: the golden ratio and all these things. These are based on matter, but consciousness is a symptom of a soul which has a spiritual. It is which is spiritual in nature. So when something is spiritual, it means that it is not governed by the laws of physics. It is not, um, you, um, you cannot, it has mentioned in many places, it's not something that you can, you can tear, it's not something that you can burn, it's not something that you can cut. It is made of a different element, so to speak, that is not part of the material world. So consciousness is on a different level compared to, to what you see in the golden ratio. Can, met can metaphysics, Talk about it. Finish. About consciousness, you mean? It does matter. I too. Yeah, so, sorry, please, please repeat the question. Can metaphysics speak about consciousness? Is it? Does, does metaphysics handle this issue of consciousness? Yes, yes, it does. It definitely does. I'm not, I, um, I don't know so much about metaphysics, uh, but but I think the basis, the entire basis of metaphysics is consciousness, from my understanding. Right. Yeah. More questions are coming for you, Vinish. I mean, a very a wonderful topic that you have started. Now we have Sabit asking two questions. Is fine tuning an essential sure. component of a sophisticated and complex system? And is it virtually impossible for a complex system to exist without fine tuning? I hope you understood both the questions, right? Yeah, I think I think fine tuning is a natural part of any kind of complex system. Yeah, it has to be any because um, um, it it has to be there, right? Because otherwise, how will it how how can it derive its complexity? Yeah, I think he he talked about it that yeah. it's uh, the complex system and sophistication are interrelated. Another question coming. <clears throat> this is from uh, Niket, and the question is: If every intricately designed delicate structures we start living to be fine tuned by the intelligent creator, then would it not create myths? and thus measured by logic base. I didn't understand the question myself. Okay. The question is something like, if every intricately designed delicate structures, we start living to be fine tuned. Yes, every, every delicate structures are fine tuned by the creator. Now, would it not create myths and thus unanswered by logic base, I'm not understanding what is logic base. Yeah, I think I think I think what in my understanding from the question is that if we accept that this is designed by a, a creator, then 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 we fall in the in, isn't it dangerous that we may fall into the risk of making everything into a myth and there's no no logic behind it. Is that is that my understanding? Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this is the same fear that scientists have, 
which is why they don't want to accept they, they don't want to accept a higher creator you are, you are muted i think uh no am i hello hello can you hear me i i can hear you hello 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 yeah Bin binish any more comment you have on this uh, yeah can you hear me yes yes we are able to hear you properly okay okay so no, what, what i want to say is this is the same fear that scientists have because if they accept if they accept that there is a god then where do you draw the line uh, uh, for science uh to say that something is scientific or something comes from god because every time we cannot explain something with science we would say that god is the cause of this right and and um so i understand where the question is coming from because that's the same question that many scientists have but i think uh this is where there should be good dialogue between the scientists and and the the spiritualists because we need to we need to um set guidelines as to where uh, what like where the the where science what science can answer and what is beyond science you know so the the my conclusion is that there should be good dialogue between scientists and uh, spiritualists here is an interesting question from dr heman since uh, when you were talking about fine tuning <clears throat> and when you were talking about the weakness of modern science you refer to this uh, uh, knowledge that is shabda question is mm. does shabda include both shabda and nishabda or silence with the revealed knowledge um okay i'm not familiar with nishabda nishabda means no shabda <laughs> <laughs> so the so the, the basis of of shabda here is that is it's reveal knowledge that I means it's coming from a higher source or a higher authorized source um it's it's the the simple example is when a child wants to learn the alphabet the teacher would say this is how you write a and this is how you write b and if the child were to argue say no i want to i want to write i want to find out how to write myself and if he doesn't listen to what is a and what is b he'll never learn how to write right so basically it's knowledge coming from a higher source um that's that's the definition of shabda yeah i think one of the uh, uh, thing that i am trying to uh, uh, get from this question is can you produce knowledge out of silence so a very large part of knowledge comes comes um from inspiration and intuition um and that and that is from from the vedantic perspective that comes from the prompting of paramatma who is in our heart right so there is no there is no audible sound that gives that knowledge but it's it's from from the heart so yeah it is nishabda for the outer world but it is shabda for the inner mm -hmm. world yes yes so 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 that is also considered shabda because it's it's coming from the from a higher source but yes you're right for the outside world it's nishabda so by avijit satpati a medical student uh, questions are there in the world we are able to uh, artificial i mean create artificial skin kidney and even the whole body i don't i don't think so uh, avijit but at least i can agree that artificial skin kidney and there are ways of uh, people are talking about artificial heart and then artificial blood i mean which are yet to be done but there is a need of human intervention for this particular thing right scientists wants to make cells and add life to it also that's what avijit tells now his question starts what is your comment on human ethics on the experiments um so to to create a cell and to add life into it in my opinion is impossible um uh, because life is life is 
is not a material thing which you can just create. Uh, life is a, is a, is a spiritual uh, element. So you cannot just create that, right? You can, you can manipulate material things, um, but you cannot create life. So now with, with regard to artificial skin, yes, you can create artificial skin, but it's very different from the skin as we know. Um, uh, because we have worked on, on artificial skin in the lab. And what we are doing is we are using cells to and aligning cells in such a way to form skin. But it's still very different from, from skin natural skin, but it does its function. Um, so, so in my opinion, this, this is very, this work like this should continue, but we should know our, we should know our limits that we cannot, we cannot create life from nothing. A, a question which is very similar to this is that if human beings are able to create a life, then what will be the that uh, purpose of that life? <laughs> so, so in my opinion, fundamentally, that's not possible. Uh, yeah. Any more? Oh, we have more questions coming. Okay. Yeah. We have a, a question from a computational biology uh, person, Dinesh Joshi, is do doing his MTech. A uh, question is basically. How do you see the problem of central dogma of molecular biology? I heard about it, yes. When the genes are transcribed to the mRNA, then the mRNA is translated to the peptide chain, yes. But for this translation to occur, other transfer RNAs and are required. Yeah. Translate the mRNA into amino acid and so on and so forth. Okay. And this is a chicken and egg problem that also he admits. Now, how do you see this? So this chicken and egg problem related to DNA and yeah. DNA, RNA, that whole thing. Central dogma, yeah. basically it's a question on central dogma. Yeah, so, so basically it's, uh, from uh, DNA to RNA, RNA to protein, right? But from DNA to RNA and RNA to protein, you still need proteins and RNAs to be involved. So, so how did those come about? before, like you mentioned, it's a chicken and egg question. So it's obvious that the, the central dogma of molecular biology does not hold. Um, uh, because if you break it down into the mechanistic, mo mechanistic model, um, that what came from the other, then there is a problem, right? So there are many theories uh, revolving around this. Um, uh, uh, there's like RNA theories and there's, um, um, uh, how after the whole central dogma was established, then certain RNAs di disintegrated and, and things like that. So, the, but the, the point is nobody really knows. Uh, but if we, if we can understand that there is a, there's a higher cause or there's a higher designer involved, then it makes, it makes the understanding easier. Uh, because then we don't have to crack our head about which came first, the chicken or the egg. Okay, I mean, this is the final question, and maybe you get only one minute to answer this. Uh, how mantra meditation helps us to raise our awareness and consciousness? Okay, so our so we have our mind, and our mind is controlling our senses. Um, okay, but what happens is when we are when we are in an in ordinary life, our mind and our senses get meshed up. So as soon as our senses get disturbed, our mind gets disturbed, correct? Uh, I think we all have experienced this. So what mantra does is that it frees the mind and it brings mind back to becoming the controller of the senses. And so once the mind again is the controller of the senses, then we can, the mind can control our emotions, we can control our anger, we can control our senses. And in that way, it, it, it frees us. So this, this, and this is just on the basic level. On a higher level, the mantra can also work on our soul. So that's the simple answer for one minute. Okay. I mean, that was an interesting session with a lot of questions and a very nice presentation by Vinesh. <clears throat> and on behalf of uh, the summer school team and on my own personal behalf, I propose that we thank uh, Vinish, Biknish, sorry, I'm telling, it is Biknish, okay.
yes. i prefer to call you krishna or katti okay and uh, next time I, when i am in singapore definitely i will uh, visit you please uh, do please do sure sure we visited ntu and nus very recently okay uh, so let us propose this vote of thanks and our heartfelt thanks to viknesh who has elaborated this difficult concept of sail to universe the beauty and fine tuning so please join me in thanking him in our own way the next speaker who is waiting uh, is dr dhiraj dubey prakash chan dr dhiraj are you online yeah i'm online okay hi 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 dhiraj yeah hi sujit sujit roy from iit bhubaneswar previously at iit kharagpur and it is my uh, proud privilege to introduce to this audience uh, uh, dhiraj dhiraj is a postdoctoral research fellow at the university of california that is ucl uh, university of california at san diego he received his btech in mechanical engineering from iit bhu during 2010 to 14 then he obtained his phd in biophysics in 2021 from tie for hyderabad his research in interests include bio macro molecules and their complex transitions in biology systems then the principles of drug design and computational biophysics he works in the deciphering the major modes of fluctuations guided by chemical propensities of the interacting species yes behind the nucleating precursors and large scale macromolecular transition events that what the, i mean previous speaker was trying to say perhaps we are going to see more on uh, uh, dhiraj's uh, uh, presentation he is also keenly interested in the interface of theoretical biology and the principles of ayurvedic sciences dhiraj just let me tell you that i was uh, involved in this inquiry of ayurvedic drugs for 7 years i still have the interest but my research team is not capable of handling it so far but i will like to take your help in some of seeking some of these questions that i have on some inorganic metal based drugs so ladies and gentlemen uh, the topic on which dr dhiraj will be speaking is revisiting the non reductionist thick ayurvedic approach in light of modern biophysics a very appropriate talk, talk for this conference i mean school dheeraj over to you uh, thank you so much sir uh, am, am i audible hello yeah hello uh, uh, okay you, we are you are audible okay. just let me add that will give you 40 minutes time and yes, after sir. which i will uh, try to uh, give you a signal sure. and you will have five more minutes but in because this is summer school and lot of students are there so we would like to have at least 15 minutes of discussion time so your 40 minutes starts now thank you sir uh, thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction Uh, i would like to give a small disclaimer before starting uh, so i am basically new to the topic that i am trying to present today and uh, my main purpose is to learn more about this subject matter so i would highly appreciate any minor or major uh, uh, critical comments coming from the uh, respected audience and uh, there are one or two questions from my side uh, which i shall try to pro- uh, post during the course of my talk uh, if i remember them and uh, yeah so i would like to start off with uh, uh, these two definitions of health uh, uh, one by uh, who and the other by uh, ayurveda so who defines health as a state of complete well being uh, consisting of physical mental social uh, well being along with the absence of uh, disease or 
or infirmity uh while ayurveda chooses to describe health as a balanced uh, and connectedness between body mind uh, spirit and environment so uh, there are a couple of differences between these two viewpoints uh, that i would like to point out amongst them the major one is the absence of uh, disease or infirmity which is mentioned in uh, the the who definition and not in ayurveda definition uh the another very important point is that uh, balance and connectedness that is mentioned in ayurveda the we will realize du- du- this during the talk and uh, i will try to bring up this point of uh, balance and connectedness again and uh, having said that i would like to bring out uh, this important point of uh, uh, sorry to interrupt you can you put yes. it on full screen oh uh, okay is it on full screen uh, i i think so this is uh, yeah this is the full full screen okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so so yeah i would like to begin uh, by talking about the concept of reductionistic approach in uh, modern medical practice uh, this is a practice of uh, analytical evaluation of the natural world by the divide and conquer approach the basic assumption being that the can uh, the complex uh, pro- problems are solvable by dividing them into smaller simpler and thus more tractable uh, units uh, since long uh, since quite long reduction re- reductionism has been pervading almost all the major scientific disciplines and has been responsible for the tremendous success as well still there are certain limits to reductionism and an alternative explanation must be sought to complement it in case of biology an alternative view has emerged where the problems are approached through systems perspective rather than dividing a complex problem into its com- uh, component parts uh, the systems perspective uh, basically appreciates the mo- the holistic and the composite uh, uh, characteristics of a problem and evaluates the problem with the use of computational and uh, mathematical tools uh, the systems perspective is rooted in the assumption that the forest as a whole cannot be explained by studying the trees individually so uh, while the implementation of uh, clinic uh, clinical medicine is uh, systems oriented the science of clinical medicine is fundamentally reduc- uh, reductionistic uh, this is shown in four prominent practices in medicines uh, the four uh, the, the number one being the focus on uh, a singular pre- dominant factor uh emphasis on a homeostasis uh inexact uh, uh, risk modification and the fourth one being the additive treatments i'll try to uh, speak on each of these points so much like a me- mechanic who repairs a broken car by locating the defective part uh, physicians typically treat disease by identifying the the isolatable abnormality a uh, implicit uh, with this practice is the deeply rooted belief that each disease has a potential singular target for uh, medical treatment uh, for infection the target is pathogen for cancer it is tumor and for gastrointestinal bleeding it is the bleeding vessel or ulcer uh, this approach leaves little room for contextual information uh, suppose uh, for uh, like for example a young immunocompromised man will with uh, uh, pneumonia usually gets the same antibiotic treatment as an elderly woman with the same infection the disease and not the person becomes affected uh, by this treatment and becomes the focus uh, central focus of the treatment uh, our contem- uh, our contemporary analytical tools are simply not designed to address more complex questions and thus questions such as how do a person's uh, sleeping habits diet living condition uh, comfort co- comorbidities and stress collectively contribute to a particular disease remain largely unanswered uh the the another uh, problem faced in medical science is an over emphasis on homeostasis uh, homeostasis is a remarkable idea introduced by uh, cloud uh, bernard and walter b cannon uh, which is basically the ability of the body to maintain the stability when exposed to stresses uh incorporated into uh, clinic clinical practice illness is defined as a failed homeostatic mechanism 
and uh, treatment requires physicians to uh, substitute for this failed mechanism by correcting deviations and placing the parameters within the normal range. This corrective uh, treatment is adopted for a range of uh, uh, medical conditions from hypothyroidism to hypokalemia to uh, diabetes. A homeostasis be biased with reductionistic interpretation results in an overemphasis on correcting the deviated parameters which uh, belies the importance of uh, system-wide uh, operation. There may be either alternate or uh, less intuitive targets that may be more effective. Uh, also, uh, correction of the deviated parameters may itself have harmful system-wide effects. Uh, basically, homeostasis is the ability of the system to maintain stability and robustness. The smaller units that we consider in reductionistic approach could have a dynamic interplay and uh, could still maintain the overall system-wide stability. And here by robustness, I mean the capability of the system to perform normally, even when it is exposed to uh, external perturbations. For example, um, as, an, uh, as a consideration of dynamic equilibrium in the overall system, we could pictureize uh, circadian uh, uh, rhythms as oscillatory stable states and the complex heart rate variability uh, could be considered to be chaotic uh, uh, elements contributing and feedbacking to the overall system's equilibrium. So overall, we, uh, we could have a homeodynamics instead of homeostatic in the system. Uh, inexact risk modification. So attempts are basically made to identify and single out the precursor factors for a disease with certainty. The common unidimensional one risk factor to one disease approach used in medical epidemiology, however, has uh, several limitations. For example, hypertension is considered to be a risk factor for coronary heart disease. Uh, based on Framingham uh, study, it is suggested that individuals with uh, systolic uh, blood pressure greater than uh, 140 should get pharmacological and lifestyle treatment. Uh, but these kinds of study only measure a chance of acquiring that disease. Now, a country can have 70% uh, of population having blood pressure lower than 140. And this population will have a higher case of uh, higher cases of uh, uh, coronary heart disease because of the huge sample size. Uh, that is the 70% of the country's population. Uh, majority of the people uh, from the remaining 30% population might not at all get uh, coronary heart disease. And this is what leads us to uh, something called uh, pre prevention paradox. Uh, uh, and this leads to twofold problem. Number one, people taking medicine of the prescription based on the statistical study might not get heart disease, but could develop some other side effects from the preventive medicines. Number two, because of the certain risk factors still unknown to the medical community, a majority of the population is still exposed to the risk of acquiring the heart disease. So this is a typical scenario where we often see the medical community constantly lowering the threshold value of a particular parameter in a particular uh, in the treatment in the treatment of a particular disease uh, because they want you to be counted in that particular 30 percent population group so that you get the preventive uh, medication. Uh, this kind of approach actually uh, has a little benefit to most uh, people individually. The fourth problem that we face is uh, the in reductionistic approach is this uh, additive treatments. So multiple problems in a system are typically tackled piece by piece. And even in say uh, each problem is basically partitioned and uh, address individually. Uh, so for example, in cor coronary heart disease, each known risk factor is addressed individually, whether it is hyperlipidemia or hypertension. The strategy is also extended to coexisting diseases if the same person is having multiple diseases, uh, such as hypothyroidism, along with diabetes, along with uh, coronary heart disease. Each disease is treated individually as if the treatment of one disorder has minimal or no effect on the treatment of another. Uh, while this approach is uh, uh, is easily executable in clinical practice, it neglects the complexity, uh, the complex interplay between the disease and the treatment. The assumption is that the result of the treatments are additive rather than non-linear. 
so i would like to like summarize the four points and uh, that we just discussed and uh, so reductionistic in, in reductionistic approach uh, normalcy is considered to be healthy uh, as it was stated in the who definition which says that it's a complete all around well being in terms of social uh, mental and physical um, well being uh, so normalcy is appreciated in reductionistic approach while in system oriented approach uh, robustness is given more importance uh, which means the system should be able to perform well even under external stresses so in the in reduction is so so basically this means that uh, the parameters and the indicators medical indicators and parameters that we are trying to track for a particular disease may not be in the range but the uh, but if the person is able to like function the various functionality of the body is still perfect uh, that is called uh, robustness and that is uh, appreciated so in reductionism basically treatment involves uh, risk reduction while in systems oriented approach adaptability and the plasticity of the system is appreciated and in many scenarios even if the uh, parameters and indicators are out of range if the robustness is maintained the person may not require the treatment uh, reductionism requires the body bodily system to be homeostatic while in systems oriented approach it is supposed to be homeodynamic uh, reductionism requires uh, uh, singling out uh, one causative factor while in systems uh, oriented approach multiple factors can be accommodated in the model to uh, assess the robust dynamics of the system and uh, so finally in reductionism the system's behavior is considered to be is expected to be uh, linear predictable and frequently deterministic uh, while in uh, a systems oriented approach we allow the system to have a uh, non linear and sensitive to initial conditions stochastic and chaotic behavior so now i will uh, try to introduce some basics of uh, ayurveda uh, so like in modern science we have different disciplines to study the different lens scale phenomena at a very small lens scale we make use of concepts of physics to solve the problem uh, while uh, when some uh, atoms combine together to form small molecules we need uh, uh, chemistry to uh, approach the problem Uh, similarly to study large macro molecules we need uh, biochemistry and biophysics and when these bio uh, macro molecules form huge community in the form of various cell organelles we need biology to study the problem but uh, more or less the working principle behind the uh, uh, behind the various phenomena at all the lens scale is definitely uh, expected to be governed by the laws of modern physics which is directly considered in the case of small lens scales similarly in the vedic understanding of reality uh, sankhya darshan is considered to be the base for all the phenomenon around us uh, subtle and gross uh, sankhya darshan basically enumerates and analyzes the various element, uh, elements in uh, different realms gross subtle and spiritual Uh, our existence is considered to be made up of five different layers known as uh, panch koshas or five coverings uh, the physical body uh, that is that we can see uh, and feel and touch is manifestation of the grossest covering known as uh, annamaya kosh then comes our uh, subtle realm made up of uh, mind intelligence and false ego uh, and uh, which constitute the three uh, uh, coverings known as uh, pranamaya kosh manomaya kosh and vigyanamaya kosh the spiritual uh, realm constitutes the real our, our real plane of existence and is known as uh, anandamaya kosh uh, ayurved mainly uh, deals with the imbalances of the gross realm Uh, for, and there are different disciplines in uh, vedic uh, system of knowledge to deal with different uh, imbalances like for dealing with the imbalances in the subtle realm uh, of uh, mind uh, intelligence and false ego we uh, we have these uh, practices of yoga pranayam and uh, pranayam and uh, yamaniyam 
similarly for the for restoring the spiritual balance we need dhyan sadhana and uh, mantra meditation uh, so uh, like uh, we uh, segregate the inorganic and organic uh, uh, matter in modern science the biological phenomena are basically better explained in terms of uh, interaction between the organic matter similarly in the vedic philosophy of sankhya the gross reality uh, consists of uh, earth water fire air and ether uh, and earth uh, being the grossest element uh, while the ether being the subtlest element uh, these five elements uh, combine in a special form uh, and and these five five elements are, these five elements are basically known as uh, panchmahabhutas and they combine in they combine in special pairs to form organic elements of uh, kapha pitta and uh, vat uh, kapha being made of uh, earth and water pitta being made of uh, uh, water and fire and vat being made up of uh, air and ether so technically speaking we have five uh, different uh, elements uh, describing the gross uh, realm and uh, these five uh, so so if if you were to make uh, uh the organic matter in choosing two of them we we should have uh, have we should have got 10 combinations uh, uh technically but we have only three combinations one of my personal query that i would like to delve deeper into is uh, uh, do we have uh, like why don't we consider a combination of fire and air uh, that is one of my query that i have and i would like to uh, i would like the uh, audience to uh, maybe someone can answer for this question now uh, now i'll uh, uh, now in the next three slides i'll be trying to uh, speak about the properties of these uh, three uh, organic elements that are considered in ayurveda and the overall biological function that these elements are responsible for so uh, so the first one is the subtlest uh, among the three that i am trying to consider and uh, the there is a shloka from uh, ashtanga hridayam so uh, this is a scripture uh, and the first chapter uh, the 10th tenth, tenth shloka of the of this uh, uh, book called ashtanga hridayam describes the various properties of vat element so it uh, so so it describes that vat has properties like uh, dry light cold rough subtle and mobile and this element is mainly responsible for the intake of nutrients pushing out of waste and regulating and obstructing the toxins from entering the body the next grosser element amongst the three organic elements is the pitta and it has a properties like oily absorbent hot light odorous uh, mobile and fluid this element is mainly responsible for the transportation of nutrients into useful uh, uh, components and uh, preparing the waste that needs to be thrown out so in other words this element is more or less uh, responsible for digestion and metabolism and uh, uh, this is the, and this is described in the 11th shloka of chapter 1 of ashtanga hridayam similarly the 12th shloka we see the properties of kapha being enlisted as uh, oily cold heavy viscous smooth slimy and immobile so this is mainly helpful in the storage of useful uh, material and providing uh, structure to the body and uh, so these three uh, elements uh, form uh, prakriti and prakriti literally means uh, constitution or nature and consists of three doshas which are nothing but the three elements that we just discussed that is the vat the pitta and kapha the three uh, striking constitutions of prakriti vat the pitta and kapha present a set of uh, metabolic tendencies which help in determining the reaction of the body and mind when con confronted by a stimulus in ayurveda the three doshas are understood to have their regions within the body where they predominate so like uh, the vat is uh, predominant uh, below the navel region uh, 
uh, pit is predominant between the uh, calvicle and the navel region calvicle is basically the collarbone that we have and uh, cuff is uh, predominant in the region above the calvicle region Generally, there is a natural predominance of one or more doshas in an individual. Uh, every individual, in order to remain healthy, must maintain their balance of doshas as determined by their prakriti, which is believed to be determined at the time of conception. And uh, this prakriti remains uh, unaltered during the lifetime. The susceptibility to different diseases depends upon the type of prakriti Uh, constitution in an indi individual uh, therefore assessment of prakriti analysis will not only help in understanding the physical and mental constitution of the patient but also plays a vital role in uh, prognosis diagnosis treatment and prevention of many complex diseases uh, recently we have uh, seen works by uh, govindraj et al uh, that i have just cited in this slide and uh, show which shows classification of prakritis using uh, genome wide uh, uh, snp markers which is uh, single nucleotide polymorphism uh, now there are many uh, researches recent researches going on in the field of integrative and alternative medicines and there are many publications which show a direct correlation between prakriti and metabolism the rate of metabolism is different for different doshas for kapha it is slow for pitta it is uh, fast and for vata it is variable a uh, number of studies uh, have um, demonstrated or hypothesized the the links of uh, ayurvedic tridosha theory with various uh, metabolic systems and biomarkers among which some have even demonstrated the genomic linkages as well one more study describes the concept of prakriti in aging stating that the individuals which have pit uh, pit uh, predominance in their prakriti have high basal uh, metabolic rate and high energy consum uh, consumption uh, leading to uh, uh, rapid uh, tissue destruction and premature aging and uh, thereby an average life uh, life span Uh, while the individuals with uh, kapha predominance uh, uh, in prakriti have a tendency to delay the manifestation of aging and have a longer life span uh, it has been shown in the study by uh, sera et al that the tridosha theory of ayurveda is uh, mediated by certain uh, nuclear receptors mainly those related to Uh, androgen uh, t cells and thyroxine which are in study related to uh, pitt kapha and vata respectively these uh, regulator uh, these receptors regulate the expression of certain genes and thus have an overall control over embryonic uh, development adult homeostasis and finally the metabolism of an organism Uh, similarly there are many works reported uh, relating uh, prakriti and genomes uh, we realize that uh, the need of the r is also to bridge the ontologic divide between uh, ayurveda and current sciences with the development of common vocabulary uh, evidence is present and mounting regarding the links between prakriti and various genes through which these uh, associations Very work nice. yes you you have 5 uh, minutes okay sure uh, such links between prakriti and genetics have been clearly elaborated by uh, patwardhan and bodekar in 2008 uh, which have now become the basis for uh, scientific investigation related to ayurvedic theory uh, the basis for this was an earlier work by uh, by patwardhan et al in uh, uh, 2005 in which they demonstrated a uh, significant correlation between various uh, uh, alleles of uh, human leukocyte antigen genotype and prakriti where they uh, provide rational and preliminary uh, ex uh, experimental support for the concept of an association between the uh, hla alleles and the ayurvedic tridosha theory in other studies associ associations have been uh, 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 discovered between various genes related to 
inflammatory pathways and oxidative stress pathways in rheumatoid uh, arthritis patients and their prakriti uh, other associations between genetics and prakriti have been drawn out for genes related to uh, drug metabolism such as uh, um, uh, such as C- cyp2c19 uh, where the genotype related to extensive metabolizers uh, was associated with people having pitta prakriti while the genotype associated with poor metabolizer metabolizer was highest in the people with kapha prakriti also it has been uh, found that there are certain inflammatory markers which are found to be higher in the kapha body type individuals now the prakriti uh, types are as described in ayurveda can be considered as phenotypes that have distinct links with uh, various metabolic pathways disease uh, susceptibility uh especially that with chronic diseases and uh, uh and last but not the least with the differing uh, genotypes as these uh, links of prakriti become further defined it is not difficult to imagine a time in, in the near future when it will be possible to identify specific genomes that are rela- linked to any uh, given prakriti type this opens the door for an idea that has not been proposed before it is uh, quite possible that in near future newborns can be screened at the time of their birth for their prakriti using the genotype uh, profile uh, which is further correlated by other biochemical uh, parameters and uh, can be set a specific set of certain uh, criteria using uh, genetic markers and biochemical markers can be set up uh not only to identify extreme extreme prakriti types but all but also the mixed prakriti types uh ayurvedic uh, physicians job would then uh, to be uh, would then be to uh, detect uh, detect the extent of derangement and bring back the doshas to normal state uh, linkages of ayurvedic uh, tridosha principle with modern scientific biochemical and genetic markers are being unearthed Uh, this is a, a very significant step towards integrative ayurvedic th- theories with modern scientific findings and it is quite likely that linkages uh, that linking the tridosha theory of ayurveda with current medical practices can improve health outcomes so uh, i would like to move towards the like some of the realizations that uh, that are like important like one of them is like looking at all these correlations that we are getting we uh, should not get carried away and uh, we should realize that correlation is not always uh, the uh, does not always bring out causation so while doing these kinds of research we should have that uh, rigorous scientific temperament uh, to to, uh, to to understand this these different correlations that we are trying to unearth the another realization that i wanted to share uh, in this uh, uh, while i was trying to prepare this talk was uh, that uh, so this is basically what ayurveda will ultimately make you realize or anyone who is studying it will rea- will realize that uh, we are not the body and uh, we do not have a soul but we are the soul and we have the body so this way uh, this different perspective that we have for uh, uh towards uh, health will will definitely have uh, like positive effect and uh, will help improve the healthcare system uh and uh, like these are some of the references that i made use while preparing this talk and uh, i deeply appreciate your patience thank you thank you uh, thank you very much dheeraj uh, uh, i would have but have another time i will discuss with you on my little experience i can share with you regarding doshas and uh, yeah i can share with you all those but uh, today i'll limit uh, to whatever the audience ask questions yes so, we can invite maybe three to four questions please write it down and hand it over to me uh, dheeraj your email is on the uh, is there right yes yes 
Yes, I will share some of my sure. thoughts on this. <clears throat> yeah, so one question has come and the name is not known. Okay, please write your name when you are putting the questions. So in Ayurveda, it is told that the navel region of the body is very important for health. Can you please explain it according to modern science and Ayurveda? Yeah, so in, uh, so in this particular talk, one of the point that I brought out is like, it's a, it's a, it's a dividing region between the uh, vata type and the pitta type uh, uh, predominant region of our body. So above the navel, you have a pitta type region and below uh, the navel region, you have the vat type region. So uh, even I'm like uh, trying to understand these uh, concepts and um, all I understand is like pitta is very important in uh, metabol metabolism. And uh, uh, yeah, so like I'm, I'm still trying to, even I'm in the stage of learning. So uh, like uh, I, I, maybe some of the, some of the audience can also help in answering this question maybe. Any questions? Any more? Yes, yes. One more question is coming. I can tell you one thing. Uh, yes. That the there had been in, since two thousand four, there has been a big initiative on Ayurveda uh, by many of the IITs and IISC and the universities. And this initiative was taken by none other than the principal uh, secretary, uh, I mean, principal scientific secretary to the prime minister, Dr. R. Chidambaram. And I also participated in uh, uh, work related to that, uh, that particular uh, initiative. We call it uh, Initiative of Ayurveda in Science. Okay, in India, Asia. So this Asia initiative has produced very important uh, concepts in Ayurveda. Okay, related to the dosha, I can tell you that already there is a software being developed and obviously it has 100 plus questions which will be asked by the Ayurvedic doctors to the patient. And once this, they answer, this, they will down. They will put it up and send to the central uh, server, which is best in Pune, and they will provide you which prakriti you are, or whether you are a mixed prakriti. So I can share all those details with you later. So here is a question from uh, Anurag Mishra: What do you think should be done to enable Ayurveda to take up critical emergencies? Yeah, so this was one of the point I wanted to share in the last slide. Uh, so there, there is a like, uh, there is a, there is a like opinion amongst the practitioners also that uh, right now we do not have uh, a like well developed uh, medical system for handling critical cases. Uh, but definitely the chronic uh, cases and the uh, lifestyle like uh, lifestyle based diseases, uh, they can definitely be uh, better cured and better handled by uh, Ayurveda than any uh, other medical system like uh, allopathy. Yeah. So what is one small question from Niket to lead a healthy life, which dosha should be more like we want delayed aging. Oh, I see. I mean, I can answer this question. So, kapha needs to be more, but for good yeah. metabolism or pitta should be for high level yeah. or they all need to be just balanced. So, it's a question yeah. of for a good life, what kind of dosha adjustment you need to have? Yeah, this is also a difficult question to answer for now. Uh, but yeah, it also depends on your own prakriti. Like what, what is main, uh, like um, what is most predominant in your, in your prakriti 
or which uh, combination is more predominant in your prakriti that also decides like uh, what what would be the that's why uh, this uh, having one particular range for the entire population uh, one particular range of uh, parameters and uh, indicators for the entire population is not a very good idea uh, and it's not appreciated in ayurveda i can add something yes. to this question yes sir please you are a, every person is of a particular prakriti it can be mixed prakriti also now that software i told you it was developed by iisc bangalore along with university of hyderabad uh, researchers and doctors and ayurvedic doctors they have actually found out eight different mixed properties earlier it was only three okay pure uh, pitta pure kapha and pure dosha nowadays it is eight they have found and they are telling that more they study the genotype and phenotype more will come up yeah. so you come from a but you belong to a particular prakriti at the time of your birth if you know that then there is ayurvedic uh, 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 ayurvedic prescriptions that how should you live your life okay that is the understanding okay based on yes. your prakriti you have to live accordingly and you will be having a happy life so there is no question of you are a you are a bata prakriti and you will feel sad all the time that no no i don't have a little bit of kapha <laughs> okay so that is yeah. the understanding you live according to your prakriti yeah yeah thank you one more question uh, from manal or manas manas yeah yeah manas asked these questions in uh, yeah in modern medicine general medicines are prescribed for one ailment this is a good question yeah to everyone for example paracetamol for fever yeah. in ayurvedic medicine depends on the vata pitta kapha combination of a person right Yes. So still, how are general medicines being prescribed in Ayurveda? Yeah, still the, are general medicines which are been prescribed in Ayurveda? Yeah, this is again uh, like uh, like some of the uh, uh, Ayurvedic practitioners are like against this. Like uh, like I've heard some people saying even that uh, uh, having a tablet tabulated form of medicine is also not prescribed in Ayurveda. uh like you have these uh, like i don't want to name any uh, one or any companies but yeah there are some companies uh, some commercial uh, commercially selling medicines available which are uh, so which are not like uh, prescribed by ayurvedic pr practitioners uh, but they are available in market people use them uh, so ayurveda has this concept of prana so whenever you are making use of a particular herb or basically a, a, a medicine the pran and that medicine will help you uh, is very crucial in in the process of uh, curing so when you make that in tablet form it's almost the dead form of that medicine so that that is uh, yeah one of my like my comments that i would like to give and uh, there is one friend of mine uh, who is in like trying to uh, attend this meeting he is attending the meeting and he wants to answer like his name is bupendra dandekar if someone can mute him he wants to answer like a point yeah we are running out of time so we cannot perhaps yeah, take yeah. any more question uh, yeah sure no uh, there are two questions uh, which perhaps i can answer to dinesh joshi one yes. is uh, uh, how do we defend ayurveda as a if somebody says ayurveda is a pseudo science will you defend we don't don't need to defend ayurveda is one of the one of those practice okay one of those philosophy and such a huge science behind that philosophy ayurveda doesn't need to defend itself before modern science i mean this is my understanding after 7 years of work only for on a one single compound and i still am 50% to know about it just 50% knowledge i have and there is a very rich uh ayurvedic text where everything is known okay problem is that we, we nowadays go to a shop we want to buy paracetamol and similarly want to buy a ayurvedic drug 
But if you really go to an Ayurvedic doctor who is sitting in Kerala, you will find the way they treat. And when the Ayurveda Ayur, Ayur, Ayur Shala Kotakkal is a place where people from all over the country comes, all over the world comes, when all, all uh, medications fail, okay, allopathy has failed, homeopathy has failed, all other contemporary, contemporary medicines have failed, those kind of patients they treat, I have seen that place because in my project they were a partner, I had to really see. So they have cured patients which have really given up hope on their life and they treated them and put them back to life because they do it through Ayurveda. I have great respect for Ayurveda only after I launched myself little bit, only Bindu me Sindhu. I mean Sindhu re Bindu. Okay, not so. And this is the last question I cannot, I know this is a very interesting subject. However, we change our living habits. If we know our, if we know our Prakriti, like how can we change the Bata Pitta Kapha for a good life? I think I have already answered this one and uh, Dhiraj has also uh, answered. You don't have to change your uh, uh, Prakriti. You, you live according to your Prakriti. And with this uh, very, uh, with uh, very happily and with a warm heart, I should thank Dr. Dhiraj. He is doing a postdoctoral research fellow. We expect Hello. him to come back to India, be a professor somewhere. Okay. I mean, obviously, it is a global village, but it is my expectations like people like this, Dhiraj and others, who have tested modern science, have also been art testing Ayurveda, have a deep sense on the philosophy of Vedanta. They should be here to nurture the practice of the modern our life science. Okay. With this word, Dr. Dhiraj, I mean, I'll certainly be with you, uh, contacting you, but give me this opportunity to thank you on behalf of myself and the entire house uh, very, very uh, warm-heartedly. It's our namaskar to you. Please, little more clap. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Dhiraj, and uh, I thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to uh, chair this uh, session. Thanks to all the Swamiji's, basically. I want to touch their feet and learn them. I mean, who am I to chair a session? Okay? It's really ridiculous that I will be chairing a session instead of Bodu Nagarwal or Vasudev Brau or others. Okay? So, anyway, most humbly, uh, I have chaired it. And I, I feel very happy that I'm part of this, uh, uh, this movement, this movement, which is the movement of uh, understanding science in terms of uh, Vedanta, which was, I mean, Dr. T.D. Singh has started and is continued. And thank, thanks to all of you for attending this particular session. We'll take a short break. Okay. And it will be then. Yes. Sir, I would uh, interrupt. I would like to interrupt you in between. Uh, sir, I would request you to kindly come on to the stage. And I would request uh, Sri K. Vasudev Rao to come on to the stage, please. On behalf of Summer School 2022. On behalf of Summer School 2022, I would request Sri K. Vasudev Rao and Sri Varun Agarwalji to kindly present a small token of appreciation to Professor Sujit Roy. I think it is very difficult to find a, <clears throat> a great scientist as well as a, a great humble person. I think his, with his humility is putting even the Science to shame, what kind of humility he has. So, thank you, sir. Thank you very much.
Which we are from IIT Kanpur. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Roy. Thank you, Swamiji. And uh, with this, I would uh, like to declare a short break, uh, refreshment break of 10 minutes. And uh, I request all of them to kindly adhere to the time and reconvene in exactly 10 minutes and uh, start off the next session. The topic of the next session is limits in mathematical modeling. And a lot of us have been looking forward to it. And uh, uh, it will be followed by a lunch break. And then we will be having a very young and dynamic speaker amongst us. Uh, master students from student from IIT Bhuvaneshwar, Mr. Ritwik will be delivering a sh uh, short talk on mystery of consciousness. So this is a prelude to what is coming up. Thank you. There is another short announcement. As some of us are leaving early, the prize distribution for poster presentation will be held just before lunch. So uh, I hope you all are waiting. Uh, most of all of us know the results, but yes, the winners are waiting for the uh, prizes and presentations. Thank you.
May I request all the audience to take their seats back. We are starting the next session. So in our session two, the topic of the session two is limits in mathematical modeling. And session chair is uh, Dr. Balaram Sahu, IASC, Bangalore. May I request Dr. Balaram Sahu and onto the stage. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. It's a privilege to chair this session. Uh, I request all of you to uh, have your seat. I request all the audience to please take your seat, please. May I request humbly all the audience to take your seat. Session is starting. Chairperson is already on the stage. Yeah, uh, good morning, Hare Krishna to everyone. Yeah, this session uh, is going to begin. Uh, is, it, is it okay? Yeah. Yeah, myself, uh, Balram Sahu from IAC Bangalore. Um, this session, uh, today's second session, is overview on foundations of uh, science. And um, uh, we have your, our uh, first talk, um, that is uh, a comparison of axiom-based spaces and uh, hypothesis-based mathematical modeling. And that will be given by uh, Professor Sandeep Kumar from IIT BHU, Varanasi. Um, before we start this uh, talk, uh, I will briefly tell about uh, uh, Professor Sandeep Kumar. Uh, from IIT Varnasi. Uh, Dr. Sandeep Kumar is a professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, BHU, Varnasi, and he graduated from MNREC, Allahabad, and completed post graduation from BHU, Varnasi. His field of interest is computational mechanics. After completing PhD from IIT Delhi in the field of uh, composite plates and cells, he has worked in various fields of research, such as uh, uh, meshless methods, Chaos theory, and uh, wavelets, etc. Before joining IIT BHU, he worked in the REC Kurukhetra, Beats Pilani, and uh, AIMST uh, Malaysia. Um, he has completed several research projects for DST and BRC. Uh, he has numerous publications in uh, international journals of repute. He has authored a popular book, Mathematical Theory of Subdivisions, uh, Finite Elements and uh, Wavelet Methods, uh, which is published by CRC PACE. With uh, this uh, brief introduction, I invite uh, uh, Professor Sandeep Kumar to begin his talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, Thank you, uh, Professor Sandeep Kumar. Uh, you have uh, 45 minutes in total, and there will be 10 minutes of uh, question and answer session. And um, with, with this uh, 45 minutes, I will remind you once uh, uh, after 40 minutes. So then uh, you can continue and uh, sum up uh, whatever uh, your topic is. And uh, uh, then we'll have some question and answer uh, from the audience. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Professor Sao, uh, giving me this opportunity. I wanted to come to Puri and attend this workshop, but because of some my personal reasons, I could not attend this. So, uh, <clears throat> I'll share my screen for just a minute.
uh, I hope you can see this uh, screen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can speak on uh, basically exam based exam based spaces uh, and compare with this uh, hypothesis based mathematical modeling. Mathematical modeling most of the time. For example, this is what we have done in our PhD. Okay, so we so all this is a very common problem for problem in this presential problem uh, this deflection is, is very small and then we develop mathematical model mathematical equations and then we try to solve these equations so i'll solve because you have to develop one term and you just run it and you can go to very large deflection. So in the left side figure here, I've shown a very large deflection. You know? It's a post buckling, it's called post buckling. And in the dynamic response also, it's... So doing this mathematical modeling, deflections. Now, it's completely incorrect. people the problem is that I guess there is a problem of convergence. We don't we don't discuss it. For example, in my case, one point is both bubbling region. So sorry, sir. The results are not converging. Yeah. So sorry to disturb you. Yeah. Your voice is breaking. Uh, yeah. uh, if we can check the net connectivity, it'll be nice. Okay, I'm just trying to make another. Sir, are you there? With them. Yeah, uh, still it is breaking. Server. Earlier, uh, just I was using. Uh, the other other server is also not running. Sir, is it possible to disconnect and connect again? We will try that. I'm just trying that. Okay, I have connected with another server. Can you hear, can you hear me? Is it better? Uh, somewhat okay. Okay, I have connected with another server. This is Airtel. So uh, I'll continue with this then. Okay, so uh, so this is a problem when you when you uh, uh, make this kind of modeling, 
initially you have to make some assumptions and later you find that you are yourself violating these assumptions okay just to show some beautiful results this is common you know in physics and every field and this is a particularly big problem if you are solving a non linear if you are solving a non linear equations for linear equations it's okay for non linear equations this is a bigger problem and most of the things are non linear in nature so if uh, if you can validate your results with the help of some experiment then it is good if you cannot validate your results with the help of experiments then uh, i think it is a useless thing you know because uh, first thing is that the you, uh, you do not have any proof now, of course people what people do they compare their results with some other mathematical modeling that is not very good technique like for example i compared my results with some standard results okay their results will match our results will match but that is not a good uh, way to prove uh, the validity of the results so big bang is also like that you know initially we make uh, some assumptions and then we extrapolate it okay now here uh, just showing you uh, my concept of my understanding on mathematical modeling and laws and how they are related you know this model i open show so if you see this uh, model i have i have shown that uh, in the bottom mathematical model now mathematical model is basically for finding the perfect logic okay the mathematical model gives perfect logic then if you want to get some laws you know using mathematical model you know like uh, thermodynamics laws newton's laws you cannot get using mathematical model okay and if you have laws if you want to prove some matter for example there exists something like a gold or iron you cannot prove that using scientific laws and if you have a matter you cannot prove using that that there exists some living being okay and if you have living being you cannot prove that there exists some god means it is not possible to go upward it is possible to go downward means if you have some scientific laws prove the mathematical equations we will show it later also <clears throat> now explain it further let us take this equation a very simple equation uh, this is heat conduction equation now if you see this equation say u2 t equal to u xx means double derivative with x and you know derivative with in terms of time now this is uh who is the temperature in rod at some position x time t now this t is equal to u x s is mathematical equation it is giving some law uh, sorry uh, uh logic it is giving some logic flow this equation will be valid in many cases now if you want to add some physics okay then you have to tell that u is temperature and c is say uh, c can be expressed in terms of some properties this is another uh, physics of that rod you know thermal conductivity specific heat density etc so in the logic you are putting some math, uh, physics laws and if you want further then you can say that this is iron rod you know the matter so 
this equation or this phenomena you can understand in three steps instead of just one is equation one is the mathematics which gives the pure logic another is physics or the laws another is you can say physics and chemistry or matter so instead of uh, seeing ut is equal to c square uxx as a single i am just splitting this concept in three parts so i'll focus mainly on mathematics not in physics or other high dimension okay so now without mathematics you cannot understand the things properly now mathematics logic is very important you see in quantum mechanics you know everybody is observing the phenomena but they are giving different theories why because some proper mathematics is missing bohr heisenberg gives one concept wheeler gives another bohm another similarly <laughs> einstein schrodinger de broglie they give other concepts so the same phenomena but people are they are great scientists and they are giving the different concept the reasons logic why because they are not having the proper mathematics at present on quantum mechanics so mathematics is essential you know without that you cannot so again i have shown the same thing here i am putting the mathematical models this logic at the bottom scientific laws matter and the highest level the living uh, living being and above that this absolute truth brahman why i am saying mathematics mathematics is a, uh, is gives only logic perfect logic uh, this is like a projection i am saying that like matter is a you can compare with three dimension then scientific laws two dimension you are reducing dimension and mathematical model another lower dimension so mathematical model what i say is that at the lowest model but it is the easiest and it gives the perfect logic the other scientific laws and matter are at the high dimension because you are adding dimensions so anything if you want to understand you know you have to use mathematical models and mathematical model gives the perfect logic now this because everything in this universe is perfectly logical everything is logical in the universe and the mathematics eliminate absurd concepts so if you want to you know uh, remove any any anything which is not proper you have to use mathematics no doubt about it now what uh, in generally mathematics we do we generally use the proper axioms form a space develop proper logic perform sensible experiment this is the process of course uh, mathematics starts in the real visible world you know you have, you see and then you form the mathematics then we use axiom for high dimension because high dimension you cannot make any equipment and measure the things or you know observe the things so if you want to understand the high dimension you have to use mathematical spaces for example if you want to use brahman brahman is at the higher space Uh, absolute truth these are the higher space there you cannot perform any experiment and prove the things so in mathematics we use uh, axioms and form a space and then similarly here also you have to use for higher space you have to use axioms and now when you create a proper space then only you can uh get proper logic and get continuity of logic you know otherwise you uh, know everybody knows that if the logic is not continuous then it means that is something is wrong everybody can understand that there is something is wrong so continuity of logic is very important and that is continuity you can get only in a proper space now let us take a very simple example you know we all know that 1 plus 1 equal to 2 and also we know that 1 plus 1 is equal to 
if you take z2 field it is 1 plus 1 is 0 and if you take real number integer number 1 plus 1 so in two different fields you have a two different results so concept of field and concept of space is very important you have to select proper con uh, axioms proper field proper space and then only you can create proper logic okay now let us take example of this uh, standard spaces hilbert space banach space topological space you know. now here these are all based on some axioms we will discuss these few spaces and in these spaces we try to uh, develop theorems and these theorems we apply in practical problems. In fact, these theorems, uh, without these theorems, you cannot under understand some of the very important engineering problems also. Not only uh, that very high dimension space problem, but some engineering problems also you cannot understand. Yeah? Uh, otherwise, you will make some mistakes in uh, solution or methodology. So, uh, for example, most of the time we get the classical solution, but there's sometimes we try to get the solution in uh, Hilbert space and Sobolev space also. And another interesting thing is uh, we form or we get get energy principle in Sobolev space also. So this is another very interesting thing. You know, energy principle is our physical concepts. But then, if you understand uh, this Sobolev space, you will find that this is energy principle is just a simple case. So here, what we are trying to do or we will do to generalize uh, this concept of space, not only uh, uh, mathematical sets, but also in uh, spirituality also. Now, let us take a very simple case of generalization. Okay, how we form the numbers? Say one banana, one flower, one bird. You say you represent it using some symbol. Similarly, two banana, two uh, flowers, two birds, we represent symbol two. So this way we are generalizing it and we are creating a symbolic language. And this uh, we call mathematics. Uh, which is used for quantifying ability of the human mind. Then we further extended this uh, from positive number, we extended to negative number, decimal. Then we also developed the operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and then square and square root. And then we found the square root of negative number also. Now square root of negative number, you cannot demonstrate by any experiment. Other things, of course, you can demonstrate it, you can prove it. But by simple experiment, you cannot demonstrate. But it is logically correct. So we accept it. And then now we find it a lot of applications. So logic is very important. Now, let us come to higher dimension. You know, it's a lower dimension, higher dimension. When you want the concept of length, Okay, we develop the concept of norm. Okay, so this norm concept is based on some axioms. Okay, these are the axioms. Now, uh, say if you want to measure length in four dimension or high dimension, more than three dimension, then you cannot make any instrument to measure the length in four dimension or higher dimension. No, instrument will not work. You have to develop this concept using axioms. So using axioms, you develop this concept of length called norm. And these are simple uh, axioms, you know. Uh, those who know, uh, they can understand it easily. Otherwise, those who do not know, they have to spend some more time because here we do not have enough time to explain you. So higher dimension length concept called norm is developed using axioms. 
Similarly, the concept of angle is called inner product is also based on axioms. Now you further add some concept of like uh, convergence, etc. Then you develop the concept of Banach space and Hilbert space. This Hilbert space is high dimension of Euclidean space. Okay, so Euclidean three-dimensional space we are very much familiar. We all uh, work in this space, but those who go for higher studies in physics or mathematics, they only study the Hilbert spaces. Now, similarly, another mathematics uh, developed is called, oh no, topology. This is called topology. Now, this uh, topology is basically uh, science of properties of spaces and figures. Okay, now you are, you, you know the uh, spaces and figures, say geometrical figures. So they wanted something in form like invariant. Okay, they were thinking in that direction. So that they should remain unchained under continuous deformation. So with this concept, they developed slowly for a period, uh, very long period, the concept of topology. This is another very challenging and interesting uh, mathematics topology. So again, these are based on uh, some axioms and this topology gives the concept of neighborhood. Okay. Uh, and uh, the interior point and exterior points, uh, this gives the concept of interior point, exterior points. Of course, uh, in this, uh, we have the concept of metric spaces also. Another way of measuring distance. No. Sorry. So, uh, you see, although those who are not familiar with this kind of things, will be thinking what is the use of these things. Of course, when the mathematicians were developing this concept of topology, they were not thinking the application of uh, this mathematics. They were just finding the perfect logic, the axioms, the space, they are creating the space, they, and they develop the theorems, things like that, you know, in their way. And just for fun, you can say, you know, topology, most of the people initially, they were doing mathematics just for fun, without thinking much about its application. But now, you will find it's very wide application. So, one of the application which I use or I teach is computer aided design. You know, as I'm a mechanical engineer and I teach the this computer aided design subjects. So there we use the solid modeling. So in computer, we say that the model is solid. Now, how will you prove that the model is solid? You know, solid you you can you know touch it and you can say that this is solid. But when you are making a some model in computer, then how will you? say that this is a solid, okay, you, cannot, you, know, you cannot go and touch it. So math, the mathematical concept is developed. Uh, how to say that? Because in ma uh, computer, everything is pixel. It's nothing but pixels. Okay, it's a set of points or pixels. So how will you say that this set of pixels is solid and this set of pixels is surface or line? So this is not easy, you know, because every anyway, this is nothing but a set of pixels. So there you see the topology is very useful. Topology, they, they use the concept of interior point, they use the concept of boundary points, and the interior points and boundary points all are defined in terms of neighborhood, you know, which I earlier I showed. And then they develop the commands so that it should not violate the topology. Of the model, you know. So <clears throat> these are some of the commands which we use in uh, computer design. Now another uh, application of topology is knot theory. Now this is very useful uh, in a DNA analyzing DNA structure. 
when the people were studying topology that time they never thought that they will it will be useful in understanding dna but now this not theory concept is used in dna so what is important is that uh, this uh, concepts and these axiom based concepts are developed perfect logic is developed and then you find its vast applications recent things other which we, otherwise uh, you cannot understand now this is one way of uh, developing mathematics using axioms in a space now let us see the another uh, interesting thing in electromagnetic theory you know so electricity is of course uh, one of the greatest uh, achievement for human being uh, now if you see the history you know it started from benjamin franklin who discovered electricity in 1752 with the help of uh, tide experiment then 1780 coulomb's law then gauss generalized coulomb's law then initially people thought that electricity and magnetism were not related then christian oersted uh, proof accidentally that uh, they are related uh, then ampere proof uh, they gave the ampere's law and michael faraday in 1831 gave the electromagnetic induction now up to this stage they were uh, finding something uh, they were discovering something but they were confused you know how this electricity and magnetism were are related so in 1852 between 1850 and 1870 uh, maxwell gave uh, some equations called maxwell's equations and he established the relation between electricity and magnetism now initially people did not accept maxwell's equation uh, easily sorry these are the sorry uh, these are the four maxwell's equations which relate the electricity and magnetism uh helmholtz uh, was another great mathematician at that time and uh, he gave uh, his equations on field you know how vector field can be expressed and uh, henrich was a uh, student of uh, helmholtz so he encouraged uh, him to do some kind of experiment on on maxwell's equation and later uh, hertz henrich hertz perform experiment he discovered radio waves and then it proved the maxwell's equations now people started believing this now this maxwell this uh, these maxwell equation basically are based on the experimental first exper experimental evidence and then they found the uh, uh, mathematical logic and then they developed the another proof of uh, experiment radio waves now after uh, helmholtz you know it, it is something like in 1920 or 1940 i just forget to add this slide 1940 people could uh, researcher could extend the helmholtz equation the helmholtz give the equation for static field then some researchers extended this in dynamic field and then they prove the maxwell equation using helmholtz uh, uh, theorem so you see here the helmholtz equation is purely a mathematical equation okay and in fact he encouraged uh, his friend hertz to work on maxwell equation he was not knowing and then his equations uh, in the dynamic form it was extended later by researcher for dynamic uh, field dynamic uh, uh, field and then that dynamic field is used to prove the maxwell equation so you see the purely mathematical concept helmholtz equation purely mathematical concept and dynamic field another purely mathematical concept 
is now used to prove the Maxwell equation, which is which is like an axiom based approach. This is also called, you know, some mathematicians call it axiom based approach. Of course, using that mathematics, you cannot understand electricity and magnetism. This is one issue. You can understand that this is logically correct. This can happen something. Uh, something will happen like this. But you cannot feel, get the feeling of electricity and magnetism. You can only prove that this is logically correct. So this is the power of mathematics. Okay, using mathematics, you, know, you can prove uh, anything which is logical. And everything is logical, so everything is mathematic, mathematical. Now here, I'm trying to generalize the concept of consciousness. Okay, just like, you know, uh, Topolar concept of topology or or vector spaces norm or inner product. I'm trying to generalize it. Now I'm just showing it two x uh, boxes which are isolated. You know nothing can go outside from inside the box and nothing can come inside from outside uh, or surrounding. So within this box there's a you can say bad etc. The bulb and then some seed. We put some seed on the soil and then put water and then you see that nice tree will grow. Now, if you don't put seed and so give everything, then nothing will grow. So it means that to get something, you need some consciousness, which is there in this seed. Okay, this is a basic observation. So without seed, you cannot get the tree, you know. So you see here in both the cases, in the second, second case, right hand side, you see the, the entropy is increasing, yeah, or disorderness is increasing here also. But here in the left side, we see that there's a, some orderness is also developing, uh, nice uh, plant and, and uh, flowers, etc. So this means that if you want to reduce the entropy in any system, you need some higher consciousness. Otherwise, a lower consciousness or no consciousness will only increase the disorderness or entropy. This we can observe. Now you can further observe this any home also. A lot of children are there if they will create the disorderness and when the mother comes, it, she arranges everything. And Bhagavad Gita also says the same thing. Yada yada hi dharmas te glanir bhauti bharat abhiuthanam dharmas te taratmanam silamyam. So basically, when the disorderness increases, the higher consciousness comes and increases the orderness. Now, this phenomena, you can, you can see that this is a, like a universal phenomena. Now, if there is a higher consciousness, the orderness will increase and disorderness will decrease. And if there is only the, uh, lower con consciousness, then uh, they will reduce uh, the disorderness by uh, eliminating each other. You know? Our nature reduces entropy due to tamsic mode by creating elimination process among themselves. They, they, they fight and they kill each other. And, Disorder like animals and and the dancing peoples. So here I am trying to show the Brahman with the help of second uh, uh, tensor. Of course, you know that uh, the second rank tensor, but tensor is basically is a kind of invariant. So Brahman is also invariant and Brahman is basically projected. You know, Brahman, higher dimension Brahman in the beginning I showed is, is projecting on the lower dimensional space. That space of living being or matter or uh, the laws or the mathematics. So mathematics is the lowest dimension. So Brahman, which is invariant, we can express like a high rank tensor and 
I don't know the the order of the tensor and all, uh, but we can express it like this. Now this Brahman, you know, is doing all uh, lila or playing game or enjoying the yeah, playful game. They are doing a playful game, trading. So in that, everybody is uh, uh, trying to enjoy as much as possible. So in that, what we express that consciousness uh, divide itself in three operators: man, buddhi, ahankar. And then this one with the anchor provides all kind of dynamics, and we are all involved in that dynamics. The consciousness just for fun, just for enjoyment, you know, finding the enjoyment in a particular way, in a, in a, in a, uh, in a personal way, or you know, uh, it performs various kind of dynamics. So I am just expressing this one with the anchor dynamics. Using this spring uh, mass and damper system, and uh, if you see our uh, dharma, you know, is also uh, I try to express using axioms. So here I'm saying that everything is it eternal. Uh, everything is eternal, but changes its form. Due to dynamics, and second is, axiom there is a consciousness or chetna in all living beings due to living forces called uh, or known as Brahman Atma. Every chetna has some specific desire of of faculty. You know, like we have particular type of uh, uh, ear, nose, etc. And that a next life wise desired faculty and capability in dharma is not violated. No. Generally, only human being only violates dharma. Only human consciousness has freedom to violate the dharma. You know, we only sometimes violate the dharma. Dharma and other performed by a person will be many future lives which would be attained by this. Level of consciousness increases by following the dharma. Okay. Peace and happiness increases with enhancement in the level of consciousness. So these are some of the axioms which all religion developed in India, which we call dharmic religions, like whether you take uh, uh, Buddhist or Jain or Sikh or uh, Sanatani, you know. Uh, which we call sometimes Vaishnava or Shavasam, they will accept these uh, concepts. They all accept it. So I call them as axioms. And all religions, you know, which are uh, whether you take Buddhism as a religion or Jain as a religion or Sanatan, you know, they have different ways of worshipping God. But they accept these axioms and they worship God uh, they, in their way. That's, that's okay. And the dharma says that that you have to raise the your level of consciousness. So if you see this uh, our dharma, they all emphasize on one thing that there is a consciousness which we have demonstrated using the simple experiment with using the uh, mathematical concepts. And then the the lila is to how to raise the consciousness. Okay, how to raise the consciousness. So this, you can easily observe that if you perform, uh, if you raise the level of consciousness, you will enjoy more. Okay. And Bhagavad Gita says that uh, Yeah, yeah, it's this is this last slide. So Yagyodanam tapasyaiva pavnani manishinam. Okay. So uh, this way one can raise the level of consciousness and understand the things in a better way. So this is all I wanted to show you that first thing is that everything is logical. Everything you can express in mathematical form. Okay. And uh, this is, uh, you can form the 
mathematics using the spaces, higher dimensional spaces. Uh, this is in the higher dimensional space. Uh, Brahman is a higher dimensional space. Here you can see this is at the highest dimensional space. Living beings before below that. So going to a dimension, it's okay. You can you can perform the experiment and you can do many things. But for higher dimension, you have to use only axioms. Okay, and this is what I want to show you. And if you want to understand, say God, and simple by using some experiment or some physics without uh, using the upper axiom, then it is not possible. That's all. Yeah, thank you very it's much. All from, this, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Interesting talk. You have a lot of concepts uh, which are new uh, and. Uh, I guess uh, there should be a lot of questions. Um, so now the session is open for questions and answers. So you can raise your hand. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, yeah. my, my question is regarding like consciousness that you told higher living means higher consciousness beings uh, means means increases the orderness and decreases disorderness. But yeah. uh, the highest uh, means the controller of all means the Supreme Lord is at the highest level of consciousness. So yeah. but like we see so many kind of uh, natural calamities happening like flood in Assam happened recently and likewise earthquakes and all like natural calamities happen. So in that way, so much disorderness increases all of a sudden, then how it is told that means uh, higher uh, consciousness decreases disorderness. Yes, sir. No, these, uh, these are very temporary phenomena for a very short period of time, you can say. One thing and uh, another thing is that those who are at the higher level of consciousness, they actually go to the you know better place. They always uh, get the better place. Uh, in the life also, you can see that uh, the people who are uh, whose consciousness is higher, uh, you may get some kind of setback, you know, sometime, you know, but that is a temporary and that is uh, just a learning process. See, the whole thing is you have to understand that it is a lila. We say that this is a lila. It's a game. So like you are playing a chess and sometimes you lose and sometimes you win. So if you lose, you don't become too much disappointed. You know, It's something like this. So if, if you see something wrong, it's like uh, you are in the process of learning. You know, That from the wrong thing, you are only in the process of learning. So uh, you need not to be very much disturbed just because of some small incidents. The, uh, what we have to do or we have to think, you know, how to raise our level of consciousness. This is a game. So anybody who is able to raise the level of consciousness uh, will be more happy. Okay. okay thank you. Is there any so those, those, who are, those who are in the high level consciousness, you know, Bhagavad Gita also says that you should not be worried, you know, uh, Bhagavad Gita uh, to Arjun that they, this person will be killed or that person will be killed. There was a no time when you were not there. There was no time when I was not there. And there will be no time when you will not, will not be there or I will not be there. So we are all you know, uh, ex uh, living and existing in this universe since, since time immemorial. So you don't have to be too much worried because of that. So this is what uh, Gita teaches us. And this is just a Leela, you know. Leela is a performing sometime you lose sometime you gain that's all so these setbacks are only like that uh, okay sir thank you so much but um, my question is uh, like i i want to speak which form of living is the best at logical analytical and mathematical life or uh, simple honest and ethical life which form of life is righteous in nature please uh, no, see, uh, logical logical life is essential. You know, everything is logical. First thing is that. And spiritual life is also very logical. See, sometimes we are not able to understand logic properly. You know? So, uh, see, you have to understand that. Uh, I said the logic depends on the spaces. So in the human being also, you find that uh, uh, a lot of variation in spaces. Some people are in tamasic mode, dasic mode. 
and sattvic mode they all are logical in their space first thing is that everybody is logical in the, in his space the only thing is that we have to raise the level of our space we have to move towards higher consciousness okay everything is mathematical everything is logical spirituality says that you raise the level of consciousness or you move towards higher space okay so if somebody is spiritual it does not mean that he is violating any any logical things or he is not logical it's not like that everything is logical in this universe the difference is only in the level of space so we have to move towards higher space higher level of consciousness so spiritual be religion and all they teaches us only to move towards higher level of consciousness or space okay thank you professor kumar is there any other question okay uh, there is a question from professor anurag um are entropy and consciousness inverse inversely proportional if yes how do you perceive mahabharat into this so no, no. <laughs> mahabharat you know the uh, lord krishna is there and then his his job is only to reduce the entropy disorderness okay raise the level of consciousness Maybe. that's what he has done yes, sir i so have so he is uh, he, yeah yeah i have a related question so yeah. don't you think the consciousness and the entropy are in orthogonal spaces no 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 i don't think that they are orthogonal spaces uh, consciousness uh, because disorderness increases you know, when the uh, uh, consciousness reduces disorderness or entropy increases when entropy increases when consciousness reduces But so you can see the terrorists the terrorists completely yeah. isolated the consciousness and entropy we can completely isolate no no you see the terrorist you see the terrorist their consciousness is very low okay so they are increasing the disorderness and you see the saintly people their consciousness is very high they are everything in a very nice way so they are not in the orthogonal space so they are very much in, related even in physical space when we say let's say sky doesn't mix with any any of the physical uh, the whatever we visibly see all those physical entities are not mixing with sky because okay. all these panchabhutas are independent uh, elements okay so that means uh, i mean when we go even deeper everything what emerges uh, will be independent of this so the spaces that we are considering entropy is the physical space but when we consider consciousness and uh, we go uh, beyond that so that is uh, uh, orthogonal to this uh, physical space uh, not uh, i just don't know actually the concept of entropy is further generalized you know uh, initially like Uh, classical thermodynamics gives the concept of entropy, and then uh, uh, Boltzmann gives the concept of entropy uh, in statistical thermodynamics. So when I am saying the entropy, I am taking more the uh, the concept of Boltzmann and is further extending it. So he has basically gave the concept of uh, for molecular dynamics or statistical thermodynamics concept of entropy. Now I am further extending it to the level of consciousness. okay so the uh, the definition of uh, uh, classical thermodynamics entropy or definition of statistical thermodynamics entropy may not be applicable in this uh, in our case okay we have to extend that definition we have to further generalize like like we have shown in the mathematical concept that how we are generalizing the concept uh, the concept so similarly i am trying to generalize the concept of entropy also and when we generalize the concept of entropy keeping the the issue of uh, disorderness at the center then i find that this uh, consciousness and entropy are inversely related means uh, as the consciousness in increases uh, the entropy reduces uh, okay so i have another question um so when you consider the hilbert space hilbert space okay yeah and, um, so you showed the tensor related to brahman 
So yeah. in Hilbert space, we have uh, complex numbers. We can have. No, see Hilbert space. I just showed to show that uh, how the uh, Euclidean space is generalized. You know, using axioms, you are generalizing uh, the uh, uh, using axioms. You are generalizing the space, and you are getting the higher dimensional space. So that was the purpose of. Uh, uh, showing Hilbert space. Now, when I am talking about the tensor, I am saying that tensor is invariant, and Brahman is also invariant. Okay, so I am I am just trying to correlate tensor with the Brahman. I am relating the uh, uh, Hilbert space with the Brahman. You know, tensor like when the uh, uh, mathematician developed the concept of tensor, they wanted some invariant quantity which can be projected in a different spaces. That was the idea, you know, your tensor projected in a three-dimensional space or two-dimensional space, and then how is the invariant? That was the the uh, the idea was that this quantity is invariant. So when we say that the Brahman Brahman is invariant in that sense, and uh, I am saying that it is something like a tensor. So I am I am taking the concept of invariance of tensor and uh, uh, equating that invariance with the Brahman. And not with the Hilbert space. Hilbert space is just like n-dimension because here, when you say the Hilbert space is basically uh, talks about the numbers, but when we are talking about the Brahman, it has a uh, many properties like laws, you know, physical laws, is a matter, a uh, living being, soul is con concept is there. So Brahman has many other uh, dimensions which uh, the number cannot uh, express. Uh, for example, laws and matter and all the number cannot express that. So Brahman's dimensions are very uh, much higher in that sense, not in the sense of number adding the numbers, or, but in something which is uh, uh, which is beyond the mathematics. You can say, like I am saying, the scientific laws matter. So Brahman is including that dimensions in a higher dimension, and we we do not know how many high uh, levels are there because we are the living beings, and our our living being all other things are like uh, Brahman about us. Is we do not know uh, what what is there about us. Okay, and uh, I mean uh, when we we don't understand something, let's say for example we take um, uh, absorption, so there we have complex quantities. Okay. Complex numbers. So the yeah. real part we say that's the physical observable quantity, and the imaginary yeah. part whatever we don't understand we put everything in the imaginary part. Yeah. In this case, I mean, in your uh, definition, uh, I mean, whatever uh, tensor you gave, so those numbers uh, or elements are complex numbers or uh, because they should also contain something what we don't know. Uh, uh, actually, I, I you know, uh, means uh, I do not like to express because uh, there is a relation between the imaginary and the real also, you can say that. But here, when you go for higher dimension, actually, you find that this, uh, and, uh, these things are totally independent, like orthogonal kind of things. Okay, when you say that uh, real number, imaginary number, but uh, uh, there's some relation is there. But when you go for totally orthogonal spaces, when you then say you find that they are number. totally independent. And so what I feel that they are totally independent, the higher dimensions, you know, uh, one dimension is totally independent, the orthogonal. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Kumar. Yeah. Is there any other question? Okay, if there is no other question, let's thank uh, Professor Kumar again uh, for his very nice uh, talk. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, this session is now uh, closed. So I would like to call upon our chairperson, Dr. Balram Sahuji, onto the stage. And I would request sir, uh, Professor Haridas to come and felicitate our chairperson, Balram Sahuji. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So we move on to the next program. I have some announcements to be made. <clears throat> we
have the Bhaktivedanta Institute publications, Bhaktivedanta Institute, which is organizing the summer school. We have our own publications, journals, journals for scientists and journals for students, academicians and uh, thinkers. So all those books are on display to my left side. So you all can go through that one and you can subscribe for those journals. We have Tattva Jignasa and we have Savigyanam, both are journals for which you can subscribe. So please do visit the stall, book stall and uh, the person there will help you to subscribe for those books and the thoughts of dr td singh who is the founder director of this institute are brought out his own thoughts and the thoughts of the great greatest scientists nobel laureates and great thinkers have been brought out in the form of books and if you're all really interested in this theme of the topic for the summer school and anything any topic that relates to science and spirituality synthesis those details are available in the form of books so you can just have a look and subscribe for those books now we move on to the next item that is price distribution for the poster presentation so a lot of young minds have taken part in our poster presentation and uh, our Honorable judges have evaluated them and given their conclusion and the results were already announced yesterday. Uh, since they are, some of them are leaving today early, so we thought we'll distribute the prizes now. So the last, uh, the third prize goes to Srimoyi Parin and Debolina Nag. So may I request Srimoyi Parin and Debolina Nag to come on to the stage. And uh, I request uh, Dr. Balaram Sahu, sir, you can you can you can just remove this. So, Dr. Balaram Sahu is uh, from IAC. Uh, Bangalore. So you all should be happy to receive the certificates and the gift, the gift money of gift money of rupees two thousand for the third prize winner. Give them again a big round of applause, please. Next, the second prize is shared by. Dr. Chaitanya P. and Dr. Nandin Patel. May I request Dr. Chaitanya and Dr. Nandini Patel onto the stage, please. Okay. Both the participants are doctors or from the Ayurvedic College. So you all can go and have a look at their poster presentation that is poster number six and poster number five. So that is presented by both of them. So congratulations. Uh, I would request uh, Sri Vasudev Rao to come and uh, felicitate the winners, second prize winners. Let's all give them a big round of applause. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, now we move on to the first prize winner. And who's the first prize winner? He's combing his hair to come onto the stage now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Niket Jha. Yeah. Niket Jha has been a serious participant of all our conferences and seminars of recently. And he actively participates 
he catches the points and puts the right questions and sometimes puts the speakers into uncomfortable position also <laughs> so he gets the first prize and to felicitate our uh, nikeja i would request professor debashish khan iit bhu bhu to come on to the stage please so the second prize money was uh, rupees 3000 and the first prize money is uh, rupees 5000 with a certificate and a moment thank you very much thank you thank you sirs so another uh, after this we have a session on young mind speak followed by uh, another session and at last we'll have a panel session and for this panel session unlike any panel discussion the speakers will not be speaking you all can write your questions from the day one whatever questions you have from all the sessions you can write down the questions and hand it over to us and we will ask the concerned uh, speaker to answer uh, those questions so please this is this will also summarize our understanding of the whole summer school so please do participate write down your questions it could be to it could be regarding any topic in all the sessions so for uh, completed and uh, we will have those answers from the speakers okay so that is that's it uh, now we will break for lunch uh, 45 minutes and we'll reassemble again here by uh 215 oh sorry 115 i'm sorry <laughs> 1245 right uh no, this is good 1230 right now sorry that's a this 1230 right now so 115 or latest by 130 yeah lunch break <laughs> yeah. ah. okay uh, there is another announcement your participation certificates will be distributed at the end of the program so please do collect your participation certificates it will be distributed at the back stage i mean back, uh, the back side so please collect your participation certificates thank you One thirty. One thirty. We'll come here at one thirty.
announce an announcement please the lunch is almost ready so it'll take 10 more minutes 10 to 15 minutes then you can proceed So as announced, you can write down your questions and hand it over to me.
Hello. Now, now the lunch is ready. You all can go for your lunch and come back quickly. Thank you very much.
agents with science is very particular because science is only one. It's universal, it's global, and religions are not. So a dialogue is not possible unless one thinks to the common ideas in all religions, but this is re restrictive. And I think that it's important that different religions are present on the, on the earth because they offer different approaches to, to the knowledge of the reality of God. And it is important to have biodiversity even in religion. Anyway, what is the most important at this moment is the search for a language, for a common language, for a paradigm, for a terminology in which to understand each other. And this is not obtained by removing the old terms, because they have a lot of content which should not be lost. We could say, instead of conscience, let us say AB. This will not, would be not a success. We should use and suffer the reality contained in the terms which science will use in the future. I think that terms understand, and of course, by God we should mean not uh, uh, a person, a uh, defined entity, which is different in different religions, but the eternity, the, the, the universe, uh, the, the, the order, something which we scientists could define, even if the definition will be surely unsatisfactory. But we scientists are used to work with unsatisfactory definitions. This is the way science progresses, finding new terms, new definitions, and uh, new agreements. So that's, uh, that's an important, I think, uh, concept. But uh, as, a, as a scientist, let's say you are a biologist in genetics, and uh, Professor Mann is a cosmologist and a physicist. And, uh, and uh, from the scientific, let's say, the fields, uh, I think some of the areas that uh, we would like to uh, explain, at least it's a conception of God with a semi-rational approach, some kind of a rationality in that to it. So is there any, let's say, uh, area or conception that uh, we could uh, do in that, in that direction? Suggestions or ideas? Do you want to go first? <laughs> you mean the concept of God? No, probably scientific, let's say, explaining about the yes. concept of God. Of course, this is the richest concept in our existence, the concept of God. And uh, any definition is a reduction this concept, surely. So we shouldn't be afraid to, to introduce in the scientific papers the concept of we God. We should not be afraid. We should not be afraid uh, of it, even if this produces controversies and, <laughs> and difficulties. But we should try. I have introduced the concept of soul in my talk which is also controversial. One can say mind in the scientific, and also consciousness, but not, not soul. So I, I wanted to introduce this concept, considering all the difficulties that this creates, but we need such difficulties. 
if you're asking what are possible future ideas for conferences, I, I would have a number. I think the problem, the mind-brain problem of consciousness is one. I see there's actually already a meeting planned on that. I think the whole notion of what information is
What will you do? What will you change? Will you make something better? Will you create something entirely new? Our Dell Technologies advisors provide you with the tools and expertise you need to do incredible things. Because we believe there's an innovator in all of us. When you see West Indies India series fan court, you can choose to choose. Ravi Shastri as your commentator. In this match, you can choose any commentator. Ravi Shastri! Go, 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 go. Ravi Shastri! Watch India vs. West Indies, streaming only on Fangold. Download now.
So those who have already written down the questions, you can hand out the questions to me for the panelists. So students, I got a few questions from one of my friends. So others can hand out the questions to me. Or you can think it over and later write it down and give it to me. Some volunteers can uh, call the students who are having their lunch. If they finish, they can join. Thank you. 
I got questions from few participants. Others can write down your questions for the panelists. Thank you. You can have more than one question also, absolutely no problem. As many questions as possible. You have the whole session for question answer. Ganesh, questions for the panelists? You are happy with the sessions?
so we have some more students uh, having their lunch so we'll sh start sharp by two o'clock
So welcome back. Uh, compared to other days, today's lunch was a little bit light. So I hope like we all will be in a better position to listen to the following sessions. The afternoon session will start with uh, the young mind speak. Hello. And our speaker for the today's session, Young Mind Speak, is uh, Mr. Ruthvik Galem, second year MTech. Ruthvik Galem is a second year MTech student pursuing his uh, integrated dual degree of BTech in civil engineering and MTech in environmental engineering at IIT Bhuvaneswar. His research interests include environmental engineering and air pollution assess assessment check, check. along with his academics he is good at sports sports with uh, national level participation in table tennis check, check. in addition he has keen interest in the field of consciousness from both scientific and vedantic paradigms so i would uh, invite uh, ruthik over to you. Let's give him a big hand. Let's give him a big round of applause so that others can wake up also. <laughs> it's an afternoon session. <laughs> so difficult. So Ruthvik's uh, job is to keep every one of us awake. <laughs> yes, sir, sure. Consciously sure. speaking on mystery of consciousness. Can I start? Can I start? Can I start? Yeah, they can. Uh, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, I'm Ruthvik, and today I'm going to present on the topic uh, Mystery of Consciousness. So, this topic is very questionable. Like, we can ask so many questions on this topic. So please be ready with the questions then at the end. So next slide, please. So I would like to dedicate my presentation to Sri Varun Agarwalji for always guiding me and also giving inspiration to present on this topic. Next slide. So these are the presentation contents. So first I will be explaining about the, the development of modern science. And then I will be giving some examples related to consciousness, like candle versus man, and physics and free will, and who is a real observer, why fundamental limitations are coming, and finally, the Vedantic views. Next slide, please. So uh, in the beginning of the modern science, like uh, around 400 years back, uh, Newtonian mechanics started. So at that time, we would like to uh, model the things. So everything was fitting well. So let us assume on a rough surface, we have kept a block and putting a force F. So we will have some movement according to the force applied, or there may not be any movement also. We could able to clearly calculate and estimate what is going to happen. Same with that, like if we have apply some force F on a ball, so it will rebound with some force and it will come back with some velocity. We could able to, uh, also able to model it and calculate it, what is going to happen. And even with the rotational mechanics also, which is very complicated, but still we could able to find many complicated issues or complicated calculations also we could able to do you using the Newtonian sorry. mechanics. Sorry, so, sorry. Ruthie. Yes, yes. Sorry. Can you maintain silence, please? Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. So, so this mechanics and everything went very deep, very deep. Uh, like it also useful in the aeronautical engineering. It also useful in the very complex calculations also. So everywhere it is going well and we could able to model many different kinds of things. So this is one very good thing. So then we go next, next slide please. Uh, then after going deeply, so physicists start inquiring about these things. So they went a little bit deep. Can we able to model a person? Like, is it possible? So 
they took like uh, a candle and a man so what happens is candle takes oxygen and emits carbon dioxide same with the human being so it also like take oxygen and gives out the carbon dioxide so are they both same because both are doing the same thing or is there some is there some difference so what could be the uh, difference or what is the possible differences which are in between them like are we just a combustion engine or are we something more than the combustion engine so this they start questioning so which is a famous question by richard feynman so he's a nobel laureate in physics so he started questioning like this so are we same or are we something different or something more than that so this question started the next slide please so same with that uh, this this concept so let us assume uh, we took a ball uh, a spherical ball very small spherical ball and we drop it in a water body at time t equal to 0 seconds then we will release it so it will go down uh, slowly it will increase its velocity and it will reach to a terminal velocity and it will go with the same velocity uh, till down so we could able to uh, put the laws like which what law we can put we can put the strokes law strokes law is applicable here so we can properly use the strokes law and we could able to find the drag force so what is the drag force applied on that so finally estimating through that we will get the velocity terminal velocity and then it will go to constantly so let us assume at time t equal to 10 seconds we can able to predict few things like what we can predict its speed we can predict its speed if you could able to uh, if it is in accelerating mode so it will be in, in somewhere there or if you have reached the terminal velocity it has some velocity so it reached we, we can able to find out what is its speed and we can able to predict what is its location also like by knowing this its speed and the time taken so we can find what is its location also and moreover the direction of motion also what is the direction it just goes down so there is no other option for that so we could able to predict all these things well quiet and good but then comes the issue next slide please so if we put a fish in a water body so what what is the possibility what we can predict can someone predict few things related to its speed or its location or its direction of motion like is it possible practically actually no it's actually not possible right so it's very complicated because it depends on its free will like whatever it wants it like to do it want to go there if it, if it like if it is hungry it will search for food so wherever it finds the food it will go there if it is if it want to fight with its friends then it will find its friends and it will fight with that and if it is feeling sleepy then it will stop there and will not move nowhere so it will be there itself so the dynamics of fish is quite uncertain like it is very very complicated to predict so this is the one of the deep questions which we could able to think of so the next slide please so if we compare these two things the the spherical ball and the fish so what we can infer or what we can tell uh, like there is something inside the fish which is beyond the laws of physics like we can use our whatever equations we have schrodinger equation we call newtonian mechanics or put whatever equation we put it is actually impossible to predict the dynamics of the fish we can predict so there is something inside the fish which is beyond the laws of physics it is not inside that it is just going outside that so what it could be and because the fish possess a free will because because why because of this thing is it has some free will it has a potential to decide like actually which is called a property of consciousness is physics and at last by at the end of the movie uh, the conclusion is the dynamics of fish is unpredictable so it's still a mystery in the physics so next slide please so our heisenberg says this so any science that deals with living organisms must needs cover the phenomenon of consciousness because consciousness too is a part of reality so he's he's telling that we cannot neglect the consciousness it is there 
it is unavoidable so this he he is pointing it out so we cannot avoid consciousness it is there but it is going beyond our laws next slide please and our Wigner is saying he's a Nobel laureate in physics so he's telling the loss of quantum mechanics itself cannot be formulated without resource to the concept of consciousness so he was telling uh, to calculate some quantum mechanical equations the consciousness is a must so consciousness is 100 percent required there so without that we cannot formulate the things so it is very very essential in the quantum mechanics so next slide please so then finally the question comes so what is a consciousness so we are trying to explore it now so so finally what is a consciousness we when we look at uh, the mirror in the morning we can see yes uh, i'm looking at myself so but the question comes who is looking at whom who is actually the real observer so who is actually observing then the question remains who is that one that is actually still a question so that because of that the there is no still a general definition for consciousness still even the modern science could not able to define like what is it what is it but there are some school of thoughts which try to approach the uh, consciousness like neuroscience neuroscience tries to explain through the neuronal activity in the brain and uh, quantum mechanics tries to explain through the collapse of the wave function and the artificial intelligence cognitive science psychology philosophy all these uh, different school of thoughts tries to explain the consciousness but many are having the many different perspectives some says the consciousness is as wakefulness and some says the consciousness as awareness some says the consciousness as like uh, it is a living property or a soul so there are many school of thoughts on the consciousness but there is no complete picture in our modern science about the consciousness next slide please and there are many big scientists also working on it because they said right it is unavoidable it is there in our picture so many big scientists tried to understand the consciousness starting with our Descartes and Schrodinger, Helmholtz and Leibniz. so they are very deeply trying to understand the consciousness because it is there in the picture it is not going away so they want to understand that next slide please so so okay we could able to understand like some hu uh, humans are having conscious but what about the animals so there is a test called mirror test mirror self recognition test so we will put a big mirror and we will check that uh, whether the animal could able to estimate that I am, I am that animal, like I will just stand, uh, if some animal is there, it could able to recognize itself in front of mirror or not. They will put some symbols on it and they will check that whether they could able to check it that with the symbol they could able to identify or not. So many uh, animals could able to pass on this test like uh, elephant, elephant passed in this test and the dolphins are also passed in this test. So they could able to recognize that yes, I am this. So through the mirror test what we can predict is like self-awareness so mirror tells that it is aware about itself about, about uh, aware about its surroundings so this is the inference we can give from the mirror test but again the question comes is awareness the only function of consciousness so if we are aware are we conscious so this again question comes because if we take a small baby it is not aware of the surroundings it is having almost very less awareness about its surroundings, but still it is con he is conscious. So is the awareness the only property? Then we need to find deeply find it out more. So what are the laws that indicate that we have consciousness is a very deeper thing to know. So next slide, please. And what about the my microorganisms? They are very, very small and they don't have brain. So the question is like where the consciousness lies because bacteria if we take the bacteria it is also conscious because it is aware about surroundings if it requires some food then it could able to sense the food and if it would able to defend something it would it will defend it will sense that because it is aware about its surroundings but it don't have any brain like we have the brain but the question is where this consciousness presents is it inside the brain or is it inside the heart or where it is so that is again a question again in the science law so where the consciousness lies so bacteria don't have a brain but they are conscious so where the consciousness lies next slide please 
So here our Niels Bohr, uh, he's telling that we can admittedly find nothing in physics or chemistry that has even a remote bearing on consciousness. Yet all of us know that there is such a thing as consciousness, simply because we have it ourselves. Hence consciousness must be the part of nature or more generally of reality, which means that quite apart from the laws of physics and chemistry, as laid down in the quantum theory, we must also consider the laws of a quite a different nature. So you can, uh, you can see that uh, highlighted parts. He's telling that it has a quite different properties from the laws of physics and chemistry. The properties of consciousness are something deeper or something beyond the laws of physics and chemistry. And he's telling that this should be considered, uh, it has a very quite a different nature of the uh, consciousness, have very quite different properties and all those things. Next slide, please. So let's understand one more thing here. So uh, who is actually the observer? So all these questions will merge in one point. So in next uh, two slides, uh, I will going to explain why all these questions are coming. So this is also one more question, like who is actually the observer? So let us assume, uh, uh, let's take something. So I will take this bottle. So if I look at this bottle, so I can see that, uh, yes, using my eyes, I can see this bottle. So the object instrument of observation and the observer. So there are three things here. So this is the object and my eyes are the instrument of observation and uh, uh, there is observer. And if you see the micro, uh, if you see this bottle with the mic microscope, uh, here the microscope is the inst instrument of observation and this itself is the object and there is something inside the observer. And if you just remove the microscope outside and if we see eyes are the instrument of observer and the observer remains question like who is actually observing the things because eyes are the instrument for the observation. He, he's, it is an, uh, eyes are not the like who are observing. There are someone who is uh, behind or someone who is back who is actually observing. So what it is, so it is going question behind this because Newman asked this question in that. So next slide, please. So can you take that uh, outside like from the top? Uh, ah, yeah. So in the development of modern science, we found many new applications. So we can see uh, in this hall only, we have nice PPT, we could able to do in hybrid mode, so both online and offline. So this is a very good advantages we got in the modern science. We have the electricity, we are very comfortable. So we got an AC and we got the mic, everyone can listen. So all these new applications are coming in the development of modern science and many different technologies are coming. So my laptops, miles, everything. So many different kinds of technologies, every day it's are updating. And along with that, some other elements are also coming, which are called paradoxes. So it's a self questionable statement. So all the paradoxes are also coming. And these paradoxes are questioning the foundations like which we are defining. So yesterday, our brother Nikhil was questioning, right? So what is mass? So we could not able to like still uh, completely define it. So these paradoxes are questioning the foundations, our foundational things which we have. So all these foundational questions are coming and which are inferring to something which are deeper than that, which is the spiritual aspects, which is going beyond the laws of mathematics, physics and chemistry. So now let's go in further deep. Next slide, please. So he's our Francis Crick. He's uh, he from the helical structure of DNA molecule. So he's telling now it is time to think scientifically about consciousness and its relationship, if any, to the hypothetical immoral soul. And most important of all, the time to start the experimental study of consciousness in a serious deliberate way. So he is telling that to find out and to know about these deeper things because we cannot avoid, they are coming in. So we want to study them and this is very, very important, he is telling that. So next slide, please. So let me get into the Vedantic perspectives. So all the questions which we could not able to answer or what is the thing which is going beyond the laws of physics chemistry is actually given in the very first, like in the very beginning chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, 
by Lord Sri Krishna. So he's defined like uh, I put it in an equation you so that you can easily understand. So life equals to a genome like you can a physical aspect. Uh, so the matter which is having the uh, carbon, hydrogen and oxygen molecules which are made up of. So these are all considered under the genome and next aspect are like psychological aspect. Psychological aspect is they have we have that but we cannot touch them or we cannot uh, infer them. So they're like mind, not the brain, it's the mind. Mind, intelligence and fall they go. They are within us but they are very subtle. So the psychological aspect. And there is one more deeper thing which we are trying to find and which is going the going in the beyond the laws of physics and chemistry is that the soul which is all the questions which we could not able to answer this is the soul which is the main thing or the main issue which is the beyond beyond that so then we will find it about the soul in the uh, next cut uh, next coming slides next slide please so this soul has the property of consciousness so this is the main thing which we want to know like you can understand electron electron has a property of charge so negative charge negative charge is the property and electron itself is a particle so if you can consider the soul as a particle soul has the consciousness and similarly like uh, electron has the mass electron has some uh, area to occupy similarly like soul also has some other properties also free will it has a free will it has a uh, own capacity to decide what it wants and it has a purpose purpose why why we are doing all these things what is the purpose what is the purpose of my life so there are many deeper things so it questions about the soul what is the purpose and uh, one greater quality the humility is uh, not imposing the conception on others and so it is very higher qualities which are of not this body which are of very deeper things it, which is about the soul and other properties also like it has love compassion relationship happiness desire gratitude forgiveness in terms so these are not of these bodily properties these are very deeper properties so then next slide please so then now uh, i would like to conclude uh, with uh, a quote by charles town so he's telling that uh, I look at science and religion as both working on the same problem. So he's telling that they are working on the same problem. So namely to, uh, the understanding of what our universe and our life are all about. So they are trying to find out these new things and uh, both are trying to find the same thing. I hope that each approach will be successful and they will meet and join in a close kind way. So Charles Stones, he's a Nobel laureate in physics. He's calling for the synthesis. So if both are together, the science and the spirituality, then the clear picture of the nature or the clear understanding about the deeper aspects of the life can be easily understood. So this is what he's telling. So next slide, please. So this is the publication of Bhakti Vedanta Institute. So, and this is the, I took most of the contents from this book. Uh, this I recommend everyone if you get time, uh, you can take this book and you can have, you can go through it. So next slide, please. So thank you. Thank you so much for patiently listening to me. And I thank Bhakti Vedanta Institute for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present my talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ritwik. Uh, I would, uh, now it's time to take some questions, either offline or online among the audience. <laughs> sir, I'm very small, sir, please. No, no, no. I really, the first time I saw somebody putting a question before me, telling that this is consciousness. Okay. I feel, I mean, really, I mean, you, have, you must have gone through this book much more deeply than any of us. Mm -hmm. That's why you could put this one. But now, in one of your slides, when you were talking about the different properties, mm -hmm. you put all the good qualities. Mm -hmm. So why did you uh, eliminate the negative ones? Just uh, a slide before. Okay, can you put the slide please? Two before, two, two back. slides with back. Back. Go back, two slides. Go back, yes. Yes, the properties of soul, yes. Ah, you see all are positive ones. Yes. That Does it mean that soul does not have any negative, uh, like you have written love, 
वॉट अबाउट हेट डस सोल हेट डस सोल आई मीन इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ कॉम्पैशन यू कैन से रिवर्स all the rivers ah, okay that's okay. will have that okay that's me so yes sir that was a wonderful question so let me try to present what i understood so the thing is soul has all these good qualities but because it is in this body which is made up of matter because of that this all the uh, rivers qualities are developed because of this body and because of the interaction with this we say in the scriptures it is a material nature because of the interaction with the material nature all these qualities are coming up or else in general every soul is very very uh, like it's pure all the souls are very pure but the thing is they are covered covered with some material uh, what we say the material contamination what we say because of that it is uh, all these bad qualities what we are trying to think these are coming up or else the soul is pure and it has only the good qualities only like what we say it don't have because of this uh, uh, interaction with the material nature which has all the qualities like we are there are some qualities described anger lust and greed uh, these are these come out from the uh, interaction with the matter interaction with like i think uh, i am especially asking this because little while ago i was talking to uh, <coughs> barun ji i mean barun uh, swami barun ji and talking about a person who is having all of this negative doesn't he have a soul uh no sir all all these reverse things don't like soul has only the positive and the good qualities true i uh, means in general a soul has only this pure qualities because of the interaction with the matter or interaction with this material thing these qualities are coming out all this negative or what we are thinking but in general a soul everyone like whoever it is whatever the living entity or we say is whatever it is its soul is very very pure satchitanand vigraha we say so it is very very pure constitutionally it's very very pure like god but because it is covered with its uh material nature so that's why these all these qualities are coming up i hope i could able to tell some points i know so, uh, there is an extension on the same topic by yeah. uh, dr hemant mishra yes. i'll hand over the mic to him uh, uh rithik uh, nice uh, uh, presentation thank you sir. uh is it uh, sir what was uh, the question of uh, uh-huh. sir uh, that uh, is it due to the direction of the free will uh-huh. if the free will is in the wrong direction all the negatives of the other qualities come okay. you see happiness ah. if the direction of the free will is different mm. then that happiness becomes sorrow okay so then the yes. negative quality comes mm. then if the intent for mm. something okay. if your free will is in the wrong direction uh-huh. the intent or okay. forgiveness yes. gratitude everything goes in the wrong direction yes. can we interpret in that way yes yes this point uh, using this point we can explain very nice sir we are given with a free will like we are not robots we are given a minute free will it is a very minute minute all that is also minute because of this we are trying to find happiness or we are trying to find good things in the way which we want but in general we will get happiness or the completeness through the spiritual process and it is told and explained uh, by the god so we will get the true happiness in that but because of the uh, free will which is given to us because of we can say the misuse misuse of the free will which actually the free will is used to serve the god in general but the free will is used to serve our own things so because of that we are indebted to things which are opposite to these things i hope i could able to put some points yeah, so mr rithvik uh, we have a couple of more questions yeah. before winding up yeah uh, yes uh, good afternoon uh, my question is regarding this uh, consciousness that how we are quantifying consciousness of a being of a living being like is it only the purpose with which we are quantifying the consciousness like human beings have a higher purpose we say that they want to understand more about nature and the higher realities they want to understand so we quantify it in 
higher consciousness likewise we see ants we are they are struggling for survival so we are putting in lower likewise plants in middle so is it the purpose only with which we are quantifying the consciousness or there are any other attributes also so you want to put the levels no no i want to understand like on what basis we are understand we are classifying the consciousness of a uh, living being lower or higher you mean uh, like yes, that yes so on like, what basis yes on what properties is okay. it only purpose or something else also yes ha uh, yes yes along with the purpose uh, there are some more deeper things on which uh, the what we say the consciousness is defined so i will tell the few things so in general it is said that the trees are having very less consciousness and above that uh, animals have uh, like little more consciousness than them above that uh, humans humans have more consciousness and above the humans who are like like we can consider who are trying to question about the life so they are considered in they are in the fourth level which who are trying to question like now we are gathered here to find out the very deeper questions like who are trying to question about the things then they will come to the third level to the fourth level so or else they will be staying in the third level only and then when a person get able to understand completely and they could they got the complete realization then they will get into the fifth fifth level it is called completely uh, bloom bloom consciousness he has the full consciousness so these all are defined by mostly what you say uh, the the one most important thing is the purpose like what we want to do because by understanding this uh, third level and fourth level persons it differs only with what they are trying to do like they are uh, fourth level people are trying to question about the life so they are defining their purpose and they are trying to dig out the deeper things in their life so they are shifting they are shifting to higher higher level and who are in the third level like uh, who are in general people in general like who are like just uh, who are normal people we have so they are generally in the third level so who are trying to define or who into trying to think and other than purpose few more things are like the the questioning or the method of questioning so whoever tries to question the things this is very in the very beginning it's a jigyasa atha to brahma jigyasa the very big uh, very starting of the vedanta sutra so whoever has this jigyasa it starts from boosting up from third to fourth level and this atha to brahma jigyasa could not be possible in the lower animals because they are engaged in their uh, activities like generally for the food searching of the food and the sleeping and all of these things so yes. i hope i answered mr atwik we have two more minutes so yeah, i yeah. take a quick question and i we i, okay. I request you to give a very quick reply to it yeah. hi atwik uh, yes that was really a nice presentation that was simple yes. so continue to uh, sir's question you just uh, give the answer that uh, sachidananda uh, yes. you you said that the property of soul is pure yeah you all uh, you characterized all the positive terms in the soul yes so and along with that you tell that uh, you told that sachidananda is also pure but he was in a materialistic form like we all are in human he was also in human so how can you who say who is in the human huh? sachidananda uh actually sri chaitanya sorry sri chaitanya sachit ananda are like uh, it's sorry, not a sri chaitanya uh sri chetan uh who sri chetan jin ko hum pooja karte hain sure okay chetan sri mahaprabhu. chetan mahaprabhu you yeah, want yeah. to say oh, acha okay okay so so uh, uh -huh. how can be he is so pure means not questioning about his thought but uh, you hmm. just told that uh, what is the difference you want to find uh -huh. so what is the difference in normal human and no no uh, you tell that sri chaitanya is also pure and uh, you along with that you tell that all the negative qualities which we got from this materialistic things okay okay, okay. then i want to know how he was so pure how he was so pure he, so pure. he was in okay. materialistic uh, world. because he was completely engaged uh, in these thoughts which you are telling na in the very beginning thoughts uh, uh, yeah <laughs> so he reached the fifth level so what i was telling so 1 2 3 4 5 i was telling so they reached the fifth level so when they reach the fifth level so whatever they do whatever they utilize whatever they do so everything become 
pure everything becomes completely pure so whatever whatever they eat whatever the activities they do they're completely pure because they reach that level and whatever they are doing it is for actually uh, to serve a higher greater purpose so they are completely situated in that so that way they are completely satchitanam means completely happy satchitanam so they are complete but we in general normal people are not completely in the serving in the higher purpose there is a, some higher purpose or higher mission so we are not completely in that so that's why we are like this but hope the time when they will come <laughs> uh, there is an extension comment by shri k vasudev rao on the same topic yes sir. um very excellent question um sir has put i would like to add a little bit generally this is not the format try to answer this question uh, no problem <laughs> yes sir you are most welcome um sir really excellent question can you please go back to the slide the consciousness free will that slide oh, yes so uh, he has put many qualities sir this consciousness free will actually if you see all other aspects they are actually a content of consciousness or a state of consciousness actually <clears throat> you see free will it is a conscious related to consciousness it is a conscious state to will something similarly love it is also a conscious state all the other things which are mentioned actually part of the consciousness <clears throat> so therefore whether your soul is there or not how to distinguish is whether particular thing is conscious or not that is how we um, understand that's, that's how in the vedic tradition animals also have soul now coming to the negative qualities <clears throat> among these qualities happiness happiness is very very important uh, aspect of consciousness because it is very very fundamental it is more fundamental than the free will within the conscious states happiness is more fundamental if i am very happy sometimes i give up my free will to somebody whom i love <laughs> if i am very happy with somebody i will just say yes to everybody for example a loving father he is a very strict police officer is very strict but when he goes home and he sees his son or daughter he says everything okay no no <laughs> he surrender his free will so in the satchidananda vigraha sat is eternity related to the uh, existence chit is conscious or awareness ananda vigraha ananda will come vigraha is as a form vigraha is form is also there but ananda is specially highlighted apart from the consciousness because of its very very fundamental in nature so we cannot take away earning to be happy from any conscious being it is very very fundamental it is like a ground state of the consciousness or soul every conscious being wants to be happy because that is a ground state because we are scientists to understand just using the <laughs> a uh, scientific term happiness is the ground state so therefore when the conception of the soul gets contaminated it's try to derive happiness to negative qualities opposite qualities so that's why we say happiness is most fundamental if we don't get happiness in love somebody fail in love he may turn into some terrorist <laughs> somebody did not get um, some good relationship may turn into something else but you know whether it is positive quality or negative quality earning for happiness is the fundamental thing so happiness so therefore spirituality is trying to give a taste of happiness in the positive things to give a uh, like a advertisement or to give a taste you know that in order to be happy we don't need to resort recourse to the negative things positive things actually can give more happiness and lasting happiness and uh, uh, collective happiness not only i am happy others are happy together we will be more happy so this is the spirituality that happiness we don't need to go to the negative qualities to be happy we can be more happy with the positive qualities thank you sir
Yes, sir. Definitely. Both of them, Putin and Zelensky, the Russia and Ukraine war going on. <laughs> Every being, even an ant, even an ant is trying to be happy. He has shown a bacteria. Even the bacteria is trying to be happy by collecting food or trying to survive. Happiness is very, very fundamental to the living beings consciousness and the, among the consciousness states happiness is very fundamental and that is driving other qualities so therefore it is very important to introduce happiness on positive things that is all the spirituality is about thank you very much thank you thank you so much sorry sir vigraha is form form means soul has a form we will talk about, I have a talk later on, we will have some idea. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I would request the audience to uh, join hands to give this discussion a big round of applause. <laughs> we had a numerous viewpoints, right from the speaker to uh, learned scholars over here. So without wasting much time, I would request Professor Andy Haridas to come on the stage and present uh, the speaker with a small token of appreciation. Professor Haridas, please. Thank you, Professor Haridas. Thank you, Mr. Ritwik. And uh, with that, with this talk and this uh, felicitation, um, we, uh, we come to the end of the third day and the beginning of the last session of this summer school. So the third session of third day of summer school 2022. The topic is very interesting and we are all, uh, we are all waiting for this topic directly, Science and Vedanta. So the topic is quite straightforward, Science and Vedanta. The session chair is Professor Deva Prasad Das from Gopavandhu Ayurvedic College. And the session will be co-chaired by Sri Subhash Chandra Singh, Bhaktivedanta Institute, Kolkata. I request the session chair and session co-chair to kindly come on to the stage and the audience to welcome the session chair and co-chair with a big round of applause. Jai Jagannath and thank you Bhaktivedanta Institute
थैंक यू जगन्नाथ एंड थैंक यू मॉन्क्स एंड साइंटिस्ट सो इट इज अ गुड कॉम्बिनेशन ऑफ ट्रेडिशन एंड टेक्नोलॉजी थैंक यू सेक्रेटरी एंड थैंक यू प्रिंसिपल पूरी गोपबंधु आयुर्वेद कॉलेज यू गेव मी सम प्लेस टू चेयर दिस सेशन एंड माई फ्रेंड को चेयर मिस्टर सिंह सो दिस सेशन आई कैन इनवाइट श्री डॉक्टर हरे कृष्ण महंत He is a basically scientist, engineer, and he has a hobby in spirituality. I hope it's a good combination. He belongs to department of chemical engineering, Beats Pilani, Rajasthan. He obtained B. Chemical engineering. एम टेक केमिकल इंजीनियरिंग फ्रॉम द आई आई टी कानपुर एंड पी ए टी फ्रॉम केमिकल इंजीनियरिंग इन टू थाउजेंड सिक्स फ्रॉम बीट्स पिलानी एंड ही इज अ टीचर इन द पिलानी इंस्टीट्यूट सो ही इज आई ऑलरेडी टोल ही इज अ साइंटिस्ट एंड इंटरेस्ट टू स्पिरिचुअलिटी सो आई विल नॉट कीप प्लेस and bar before you better he can share his thoughts and emotion and paper to the audience sir please साउंड सुन थैंक यू सर फॉर गिविंग मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी टू स्पीक ऑन दिस टॉपिक वैदिक कॉस्मोलॉजी So before starting, uh, I have small prayer. Om Agyana Dimira Andhasya Gyanan Jana Sarapaya Shakturan Militam Jena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nirachala Nivasaya Jaya Paramatma Balabhadra Subhadra Vyan Jagannathaya Priya Namaha So uh, this topic, uh, Vedic Cosmology, actually this is just introduction to Vedic Cosmology. So this is very vast topic. so here in this particular time frame we'll be covering only a small portion of that and that may give us uh, some idea some glimpse of what the vedic cosmology is so uh, in vedic uh, science or um, vedic philosophy everything is based on uh, a fundamental aspect that there is a creator or supreme creator and he has certain desires and so there is creation and thereby the creation has a purpose okay so it is based on that we can go to next slide please so i dedicate this to my internal spiritual master dr pd singh his holiness bhakti swarup damodar swami sri sipal maharaj next yeah so hello okay 
Is it audible? So unlike the modern science, so Vedic science is based on, as I told you, on a fundamental aspect that there is a supreme creator. And in the Vedic literature, it is very nicely given that that supreme personality of Godhead, who is the cause of all causes, is nothing but Lord Sri Krishna. Okay. So he desires to create <coughs> and therefore the creation is there. Next. Okay. So entire spiritual and material universe is created by the Supreme Lord. So this is the fundamental understanding before we try to understand everything. So all whether material or spiritual entire creation is done by himself. Okay, so the Lord creates the spiritual universes using its spiritual energy in the ratio of three parts to one mat part material energy. That means the spiritual creation is very vast compared to the material universe or material uh, world or material <coughs> creation. So here you can see from the slide that if you see the whole slide only one portion of that one corner of that belong to the material creation so it is just like it is one fourth of the whole creation that means the spiritual creation or spiritual world is very very vast compared to the material universe so now we'll be talking about the material universe but we'll be talking about only one universe there are a lot of a lot many material universes all comprised together only a small portion of the entire creation by the Lord. Next. So, before going deep into this Vedic understanding of creation and of course cosmology, so these three aspects must be understood. So, the Supreme Lord, in order to do the material creation, he expands in three Vishnu forms. So, one is the Mahavishnu, you can see here in the left hand side. Okay. Another is the Garbhodakasai Vishnu. And third one is the Kriyodakasai Vishnu or Paramatma. So these three Vishnu aspects are to be understood properly. So before we can understand what creation is. Ah, no. So, uh, Mahavishnu, he is also called as the Karanadakasai Vishnu because he lies down in the Karan Ocean, the causal ocean, and the universes, universes, they are generated, they are generated forth from his body, just like sweats are coming out from our body, sweat drops, and then they become one one universe. <clears throat> okay, so this is so vast. He is so vast, and this small the universes, of course, they come in a small size and gradually they grow to bigger universes. So this is we'll be uh, talking about Mahavishnu. So is the first, then second, in after this creation of the uh, different universes, so he has to enter to each and every universe as Garbhodakasai Vishnu. And then half of that inverse will fill with water that is called Garbhodaka and then again he lies there. Okay. And then for that particular universe he will create, so he will create the material elements and then he will create the Brahma of that particular universe. So that is called as the primary creation or Sarga. So up to that he will do and after Brahma is created so he will hand over the charge for secondary creation to Brahmaji who will take care of all other creations in that particular universe. So now from many universes we are going into one universe and in one universe there is one Brahma and then there will be number of planetary systems and all that we will be discussing. Okay, now when Brahmaji will be creating all this, the Lord again will help because he is not so powerful. So when Brahmaji will plan for different <coughs> planetary systems, the Lord has to enter 
to keep them in their orbit system. So then he expands as Kiroda Gosai Vishnu and enters into each and every uh, planetary system, planets, and not only even planets, to each and everybody's heart up to the uh, inside of the atom. Okay, so here, what is the need? What is the need of creation? So there are two, two things. One is to fulfill the desires of the jivas, the living entities, to enjoy separately from the Lord. Because that separate enjoyment is not possible in the spiritual world. Because there everybody is now, <coughs> everyone lovingly related to the Lord, and they will not violate with the, uh, against the desire of the Lord. So that is not possible to enjoy separately from the Lord in the spiritual world. So therefore, whenever there is that desire, so for that living entity, that spiritual world is not the place. So Lord has to create another place, just like a loving father, when the, one particular son is not wanting to stay with him, so he'll give uh, some prop, uh, property, some other place. So he'll go there and enjoy. Similarly, Lord has to create this material world. This is one purpose. Second one, and now, after coming to this material world, somebody will now come to senses that I was happy there. Okay, now I'm getting so much distress. How to come out of that? How to regain my original state? So he will try to go back that, and that chance is also given here in this material world. So there's twofold reasons for creation of the material world. Next, please. Next slide. Okay. Yeah, so uh, here <coughs> I wanted to show that uh, this is Mahavishnu or Karandaksha Vishnu first. <coughs> yes, here. So, who is direct expansion of the Supreme Lord, Supreme Personality of God, Krishna, direct expansion of uh, the Lord, his Mahavishnu or Karandaksha Vishnu, first picture. Uh, second, so innumerable universes are coming from his body. Okay. And there, uh, duration is duration of existence of this universe is the period of exhalation and inhalation that period so when he exhales they will just all the uh, brahmanas will sustain then when he inhales all them all of them will enter into it okay so this is it <coughs> next this is called as past purusha avatar karandaksha vishnu next please yeah this is second purusha avatar that is called as garbhadaksha vishnu now to each and every universe the Lord enters as Garbhodaka Vishnu and fills half with Garbha water and lies there and then he creates the Brahma of that universe. That is the business of Garbhodaka Vishnu. Okay. So then he hands over the further creation to Brahmaji. That is his job. Next please. Yeah. Third Purusha Avatara, as I told, third Purusha Avatara, when the second that whatever secondary creation will be done by Brahmaji, he has to support that. So he, the Lord again expands and enters to each and every uh, planetary systems, planets, and all, uh, even up to the atom. Okay, and uh, even if it to the heart of every living entity. Yes, next. Yeah. <clears throat> so there are two things. One is primary creation, another is secondary. Primary creation is called as sarga. Sarga means primary creation of matter and elements. Because, so when Lord creates <coughs> the material elements, those material elements will be required for further creation. So that he gives to Brahmaji. Just like um, a um, contractor may require various uh, building materials. Okay, so this ingredients have to be supplied by the owner so that the contractor can do the construction work, similar like that. And second, second category, uh, that is called Visarga, that creation, uh, that uh, creation which is done by Brahmaji. So Visarga. Next. Yeah, here just a glimpse of uh, what, uh, uh, how this uh, universe is. Like, I'm taking on, only one example, one Brahmanda only we are considering. And beyond that, there is spiritual world. So there is, so you can see here there in the middle, just like, yeah, there's Mohabishnu or is called as Karandaksha Vishnu. 
and there are innumerable universes which are floating on the Karanos <coughs> uh, water. So one of them you can see, uh, only one of them that is Garbhodaksha Vishnu and the Brahma is uh, created in that, that we are showing. Now there are not only one Brahmanda, there are many Brahmandas are there, okay, all of them are in that. <coughs> so above that there is a dividing line which divides from the material world to the spiritual world. So that is called uh, that uh, then that is uh, the Biraja as a dividing line. Beyond that, there is a Brahma Jyoti. So Brahma Jyoti, in the Brahma Jyoti, there are all Vaikunda planets are there. In number of Vaikunda the planets, these are part of the spiritual world. Okay, next please. Okay, so now just uh, giving you some idea how the creation takes place. Okay, so there are various models, like modern theory also, there is Big Bang theory. So in our Vedic version, so um, Dr. T.D. Singh has given us this theory. It is the, the theory is there in the Srimad Bhagavatam. So he given this word like big vision theory. He coined this word big vision theory. So this is like this, that the all material elements in their seed form, all material elements in their seed form, these are called as Pradhan. Pradhan in the seed form, all the material ingredients, okay that combined with three modes that makes the prakriti or the material nature and when because this creation and dissolution this is taking place in a cyclic manner so when the next creation has to happen the lord uh Kusai vishnu the first purusha avatara he glances over this prakriti which is just like sleeping just like sleeping when he glances over the prakriti material nature there is uh, a <coughs> turbulent status in the prakriti okay and as soon as it glances that material time starts kala starts from there so that happens when lord desires to create so that depends on the will of the lord and then this uh, prakriti converts to mahatvatva that again converts to ahankara again these are all uh, <coughs> different uh, <coughs> in mode of goodness, mode of passion, and mode of ignorance, different elements will come, <coughs> different tanmatras will come, all these things will come. <coughs> okay, that will come in the next, I think, next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so here, <coughs> uh, the prime uh, divine avatar lying in the spiritual causal ocean is such a great affair that in the pores of his divine form, spring up merits of spirits of universes so how this come out that again i am explaining next please it's already explained so it comes like that like that like a small uh, <coughs> a small uh, drop it will come and again ex expands okay so they are covered by five great elements so earth water fire air ether and then uh, this uh, universes the small small these are called golden eggs initially uh, they will expand. The universes are created during the exhalation of the Lord, as I told you. Okay, and also the, how this um, elements, earth, water, fire, air, ether, these are created, I will explain uh, uh, later on. Next page. Yeah. So they enter the material energy. So when uh, from the body of, it's coming from the Mahavish. So they enter into this material. When he glances, they are actually casted upon there and the material, uh, uh, and is that material part, material world part. Okay, then they will grow, <coughs> they will grow. Okay, uh, so they enter the material energy Maya, which is on the other side of the Biraja river, so I told you. Okay, as they enter the, and, and they grow in size, the gradual they grow in size. Next. Yeah, they will grow bigger and bigger. Next please. Yeah, so here, the Lord does not, intervene directly with Maya. So he, he interacts in the form of Lord Shiva. <coughs> so there, so he's, uh, he's glancing, he's glancing on the ma this material, uh, material nature is compared to us um, <coughs> that Lord Shiva intervening the Maya Devi. Okay, next please. Yeah, at this point, all the golden universes, these are small golden universes, are covered off by the five elements and they are all clustered together at the same time there are 18 other inanimate elements waiting to act so next please 
only five are there, let all elements will come. Yeah. So as soon as it glances, this time starts, material time starts. Next. Yeah. <clears throat> so the matter does not increase or decrease unless it is spiritually tossed. Unless there is spiritual intervention, the matter will not grow. Okay. So, so in his, the, then the Lord's universal form, Virat Rupa, becomes established um, so that other creation will take place. Next, please. Uh, next, you can skip that. Yeah, here I want to explain. So when Lord wants to create, so, um, <clears throat> so first comes this sound, 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 and sound get transformed to <clears throat> um, ether, the space. Okay, so, but they, so when Lord uh, uh, glances, uh, <clears throat> this ether again get transferred to touch and then to air so just like here so sound can be sound is that element which passes through the space that is ether okay so that means ether contains sound now when it further get transformation that uh, <coughs> it get transferred to touch <coughs> touch so that touch uh, the gross form of touch is air because in air both sound is there and also touch is there. Sound and touch both are there. And then the air gets transformed. So in each stage, there is intervention of Lord. So material elements do, do not act themselves. So every stage they stop. Then Lord again has to glance, intervene. Then next, like this it happens. Okay. So then form. So form means the gross, gross uh, element is fire. That contains all other before plus form, sound, touch, form. Similarly, again, it will get transformed to taste and the gross form is water and that contains all previous things plus taste. And finally, the smell, okay, which, whose gross form is earth. That contains all five, all five uh, tanmatras. These are called tanmatras, sound, touch, form, all these tanmatras. And these are the gross elements and now, so when Lord has created, so he has to create also, these elements I have created, but if they are not pursued by the living entity, how they could, there should be some sensor, which can be sensed. So he develops ear to sense sound, skin to sense touch, eyes to perceive form, tongue to taste, and nose to smell. So these elements, so not only this gross thing, what we are seeing, there is a subtle element corresponding to that which does which does smelling, so something, some subtle element inside this, so, so, some, something sees some subtle element in the eyes. Suppose somebody is dead, eyes are there, but they do not see. So these are actually done. These are called Ganendriyas. Similarly, <coughs> now when these are there, Lord also creates <coughs> some in charge because that department has to be there, which will take care of that. Suppose you have a car, some different parts are there. So some part is broken, something. So you have to spare part. So some uh, in charge must be there. So he creates uh, this uh, post, uh, this for uh, ear, for uh, touch, bayou, for form, surya. These are in charge, various in demigods in charge. Okay, these are devatas, which are in charge of these elements. And then karmendriyas, because they have to living entity, they have to survive. So karmendriyas and corresponding devatas in charges. Right now, devatas are not formed. That they will be formed in secondary creation when Brahma will create. But the posts are created now. Posts are created now. Who will be occupying this post later on? Next please. <coughs> okay, when the desires of the living entities are strong, the Lord sprouts a golden lotus from his navel. The first one Brahma is brought into this universe. Uh, the lotus is said to be a reservoir of all the living entities within the universe. So this. I told you, this is an act of Garbhadakshai Vishnu. So when he sees that the living entities, <coughs> the desire is strong, so he creates. So next please. Yeah, <coughs> the Visarga, the secondary creation. So up to this primary creation, okay. Primary creation is up to Brahma's creation. All these elements plus Brahma. This creation up to primary creation. And then secondary creation will be done by Brahma. When Brahma appeared, so when Brahma appeared, in the universe, 
he is alone nobody is there so he is bewildered what is my duty what i am supposed to do he does not do anything so he bewildered so when brahma appeared from the lotus he was bewildered at first he ventured around the and became afraid so what is my duty he just looked around nothing is there he is not able to see because lotus is very big very big from the garbha uh, sagar to the top of the universe <coughs> it is there and he heard a voice so he had just simply heard a voice do tapasya tap then he did tapasya for many years many years and then he actually uh, he actually um, he was revealed within his art about the uh, lord okay next please so thereafter brahma started the creation of many other elements as well as the upper middle and lower planetary systems so now he will create the upper planetary system middle planetary system lower planetary so this is the secondary creation part of the secondary creation of brahma yeah next okay so in nut cell in nut cell so there are three initially brahma divides the whole uh, universe into three parts <coughs> initially then later on 14 parts initially he divided into as this um, <coughs> a swarga loka marta loka and patal loka initially three divisions he did and then later on later on he made it to 14 divisions that seven up including bhu loka and seven down <coughs> up and so bhur loka bhuvar loka swarga <coughs> सोर लोक मोहर लोक जन्म लोक तपलोक सत्य लोक सत्य लोक इज ब्रह्मा साबोड ब्रह्मा हर ब्रह्मा दैट लोटस फ्लावर वाज प्राउट देयर हर ब्रह्मा वाज बर्न दैट इज सत्य लोक एंड बिलो अतळ वितळ सुतळ तळातळ महातळ रसातळ पाताळ सो दीज आर द लोअर प्लेनेटरी सिस्टम्स एंड बिलो द बिलो दैट आल्सो देयर इज सम दैट इज हेलिस प्लेनेट्स आर आल्सो देयर यस एंड नेक्स्ट प्लीज नेक्स्ट yeah so here uh, as the universe you can see this is just a universe means brahmanda in sanskrit brahma's egg or it is um, um a golden egg so it's just like egg shape that's why it's brahma's egg <coughs> okay so these are the locals as protein parent systems <coughs> okay uh, next please so here uh, just uh, giving uh, some ideas okay uh, so this uh, this vedic uh, cosmology we are presenting from shrimad bhagavatam okay so um, <clears throat> there may be some contradiction with the modern understanding but we are present what bhagavatam says so we have nothing to uh, uh, nothing personal in this <clears throat> so bhur loka where the earth planetary system planetary systems then bhuvar lokas where this uh, rakshasas ghost they reside and above that swarga loka that is called indra loka also and heavenly planets where the 33 million uh, <coughs> demigods they reside and demons then mohar loka jan loka tap loka satya loka like that they are upper and below atal bitala sutra talatala mahatala satya so they are also living entities are there so there is not a single place where the no living entities are there so it is um, <coughs> modern uh, scientists uh, they don't believe that living entities are there throughout but it's bhagavatam so living entities are there throughout the universe next please yeah here there is a difference here what bhagavatam presents is actually <coughs> uh, there is a bhu mandala so this bhu mandala actually it covers the entire uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, circumference of di- diameter of uh, one universe that is bhumandala that is bhumandala is not only the earth planet you can see so here is the difference and we have to so there there will be contradiction here <coughs> so this bhumandala <coughs> uh, is okay see this is just in the middle just in the middle of around the middle of the universe and below the that garbhadoka ocean is there and above all the uh, <coughs> lokas are there this uh, um, your bhur loka bhuvar loka uh, like and swarga loka these are there okay um, so here what is says is that ananda sesha resides on this surface of garbhadoka ocean and holds the entire uh, the earth from beneath so here the earth is not the this earth we are referring to now so this earth whatever mentions in bhagavad this entire bhumandala entire bhumandala it is like that okay and it is depicted as a 
flat thing. Yes. So this entire Bhumandala is as a total surface. It is considered. Next, please. So here you can see a little bit. Uh, <coughs> you see the Garbhadoko is around uh, fifty percent. Fifty percent is filled with Garbhadoko. So below nothing. So. <coughs> Uh, only Lord has to reside there and the Brahma of that universe is created. Okay, so now this small portion uh, here, so the Bhumandala, then Earth somewhere will come to that. And then above that, these are the planets which are as per our uh, scripture. Okay, so uh, Sun, so modern science, they don't believe. Uh, so Bhagavatam, what Bhagavatam says, Sun is closer to Earth, closer to Bhumandala compared to moon moon is far like that so rahu ketu are there sun moon <coughs> then venus mercury mars jupiter saturn all this okay these are in the middle then above that moharlaka janalaka tapalaka satalaka these are beyond these are quite beyond next okay here actually in a not cell everything is there but actually it is very very small so we cannot read out so you can see this at the middle <coughs> this bhu mandala the middle so these are, this is divided into seven islands, deep watch. Okay, seven oceans, seven islands. Uh, so these are alternatively. Uh, and just in the middle, there is something called as, uh, there is a uh, Meru or Sumeru, which is <coughs> one lakh Jojana's height. One lakh Jojana's height. And one Jojana is around eight miles. So you can, so eight lakh miles it is, but 84, 84, um, 84 thousand um, jojanas above the surface and 16 thousand jojanas below the surface. That is the Meru and um, <coughs> the Bhumandala is like this. And below that, there are the lower planetary systems which are so Atala, Bittala, Sutala, Talatala, Mahatala, Satala, up that. Then below that, there is some hellish planets and the, below that, there is uh, that uh, Garbhadaksha Vishnu and from whose novel that uh, goes up to this at the top Brahmaji is created. Okay, so this is in a nutshell. Uh, in a nutshell. Now, next please. Uh, okay, the universe is not just empty. So it is covered by seven layers. These are the layer, eight layers of concentric cells. These are all elements, whatever initially I told, earth, water, fire, air, ether. These are actually circulated. So this universe, uh, just like the egg has a covering, the, skin, uh, the cell. <coughs> Similarly, this is having, there are seven, eight layers are there, eight layers. Next, please. Yeah, so now I was telling about the Bhumandala, Bhumandala, how they're divided. So <coughs> the central, the central part is called Jambudipa. Jambudipa, which we are part of. We are part of Jambudipa. Then there is salt ocean. <coughs> Ocean of salt water, then Plakya Dipa, then the ocean of sugar can juice, then Salmari Dipa, then liquor ocean, then Kusa Dipa, the ghee ocean, then Crunch Dipa, covered by milk ocean. These are concentric circles actually. Okay. Then Saka Dipa, covered by yogurt ocean, then uh, Kuskara Dipa, covered by fresh water ocean. So these are in the entire Bhumandala we are talking about. So we don't, now we cannot believe. So we don't have that information even. So we have to, we don't have reach. Okay. But what Bhagavatam says, we are just present. Next, please. <laughs> so these are the seven islands. So Jambudipa surrounded by ocean of uh, salt water, Plakya Dipa, like that. All seven Dipas are there. Okay. Next. Okay. Now coming to Jambudipa, which are part. That is just uh, <clears throat> the innermost, innermost concentric circle. Innermost. Which, uh, which contains the uh, Meru, <coughs> Sumeru. So this is, this is again divided into seven, uh, these are nine, uh, nine verses. Okay, and one part is Bharat verse. Bharat verse you see just below. Okay, then there are um, one verse, so each verse they are divided by some mountain ranges. So these are names are also given. Bharat verse, then Kimpursa verse, Hari verse, then Bhadras verse, then Ilabrutha, middle one is Ilabrutha Varsha, then Ketumala Varsha, then Ramyak Varsha, Hiranya Varsha, and Kuru Varsha. And in between them, there are mountains, mountains. So these are described in Srimad Bhagavatam. Okay. 
that was the top view and this is the <coughs> front view in the front view you can see um, uh, that meru the meru is just in the middle 84000 jojanas high and 16000 jojanas below uh, it is spreading okay next okay at the top of this meru actually the stations of um, <coughs> center is uh, brahmapuri so just like um, <coughs> The different uh, government they put their ambas uh, embassy in uh, different uh, countries. Similarly, here in this metro, so all the Dikpalas and Brahma, so they have their uh, places. Okay, at the top of top of this uh, huge uh, Sumeru mountain. Okay, next please. So uh, this is the top view. Uh, next, yeah, and each. In Bhagavatam describes in each barsha there is a presiding deity and the people there or the main uh, uh, deity there these are given who worship and what then okay in Bharata barsha there is that Naranaran okay in Kim Purusha but Lord Rama is being worshipped like that there are in nine all nine uh, barshas the different deities and their main devotee and 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 their associates okay next yeah uh, here. Um, so one interesting thing which uh, which are discussed there in Bhagavatam, like when um, how this Ganga, Mother Ganga came to this material world. Actually, originally Mother Ganga was not there in the material world. When Lord Bamandeva, actually he um, <coughs> he lifted his left hand, okay, and uh, he expanded his leg, his left toe as pierced the eight layers of the universe covering. And there is a hole, and in through that hole, that Karana Ocean, okay, um, came forth, okay, sliding through his lotus feet. So that is Ganga, and that falls <coughs> uh, here in this Brahmapuri, and then it divides into four parts, okay, four branches rather, and they go to different verses. Describe next. Yeah, this is the front view. You can see how, what is the top. And they actually fall in different oceans in east, west, north, south in directions. Next, please. Yeah, here uh, in the north cell, uh, or we can conclude. <coughs> so this is a vertical cross section view of the universe. <coughs> what is there? So there is. Uh, <coughs> uh, you can see here uh, Satya Loka. <coughs> that is the topmost Brahma's uh, Loka. That is Tapal Loka, John Loka, these are actually visible. But and below, there's very small. Like that means, so when we take it out separately in the right hand side, right hand side, so you can see there, here we can see this uh, uh, Bhubanar, then Sun, then Rahu Ketu, then Moon, and then <coughs> these are the Nakhatras, 27 Nakhatras, the Jodek, okay, uh, then all, all other planets. Planetary systems, what planets, the Navagras, they are there. Okay. And then there is the uh, Dhruv, uh, this pole star, and Saptarsi, all these are there. Okay. So this is the, in not cell, um, not in detail. So this is just uh, a glimpse of the Vedic universe, it's very vast. I just have given only the introduction to this. Next, please. So uh, our devotees, they have actually they, they have made a model of that and they're trying to make a Vedic planetarium in Mayapur. So this is just a model of the Vedic universe. So whether it corresponds to modern universe or not, that is not a question. So I'm not going to that, take that question. So <laughs> what Bhagavatam presents, we are presenting as it is, without adding anything or deleting anything. Thank you so much. <coughs> Next, yeah, thank you. Any question? Mm -hmm. It's a very vast topic. And it's a dry topic also. But he tried to tune it to collect the nectar. So I will I will I will conclude some uh, good points. So there is a, what he told, Dr. Mahanta told, 
Okay. What Dr. Mahanta told, there is a Pindu and Brahmando. Pindu and Brahmando. What inside the body, same thing, the environment and man is made from five basic elements. What he told? Pancha Mahabhuta. Kitti of Tej Maruta bones. And he narrated how the sensory, how the motors are created. The function, internal function. And how the environment is maintained by three power. He, he wrote, uh, Adana, Visarga, Dana, Vikyapu. Three quality of the universe. Visarga, like sun, moon, and air, they controlling the universe. Sun is giving heat, moon is giving cool, and Visarga, uh, uh, and bio is maintaining the circulations. Inside our body, bata pitta kapascheti, trayodosa samasata, vikruta, abhikrutancha, granthite, vartantija. If you make the balance, harmony between the man and environment, the disease will be not there. This is the philosophy, the scientific philosophy here, sir. We have to obey the nature. We have to organize according to the state of the natures. Then, then nothing will happen. So there is a three cause of disease. Kala, Artha, Karma. Kala, the time created the disease. So accordingly we have to prepare. When to awake, when to pass the stools, when to eat, when to sleep, what to do and what not to do. This is the religious forms, but basically it is the scientific forms. Thank you, Mahant Babu. So very nicely, very vast. End of Brahmanda, you give in the pinda. So like he told about the Garvadoka. Garvadoka. Very typical, typical, sir. Swamiji, in Jagannath Puri, Jagannath created, a, suppose Ram, uh, Janmashtami or Ramnabami. Before that day, they offered the Garvadoka to Jagannath. Like one jeuta, in Odia we call the jeuta, one fruits, fruits is there in South India also available, that juice, they offer to the Jagannath to have a good uh, uh, pregnancy, Garbhodoka. In the day of the Ramanabhami and Janmashtami night, so they offer to the Jagannath. So Jagannath is a male, male or female, is very difficult to identify. You see, he put the uh, odona, he, Jagannath always cover the face, uh, head, and he has an ornament in nose. So like women, so it's very difficult. So he also taking the Garbhandoka to make the, produce the Rama and Kushtu. Thank you, sir. Thank you, And thank you. now the session is free to ask any suggestion or question if you interest. Yes, sir. Uh, my question is that in this model of universe and uh, origin of universe, how does this model actually stipulate upon the death of a star or a death of a destruction of uh, the matter? I mean, I think that is not taken up. Uh, it is creation and uh, preserving the matter. But how will this model take into account the destruction part? Okay, okay, okay. Can you go to the last? Next. Okay, so I'll come to that question. So Brahma, Brahma has a lifetime of 100 years in his calculation, but in our calculation, it comes to be this 311 trillion, 40 billion years. Okay. So after this, uh, at the end of his entire creation, all the universes are destroyed by the Rudras, <coughs> will destroy, and this is called total annihilation. Next. Next. Yeah, so total annihilation, all the, what will happen? The first element will uh, next uh, subtler, and the, so it will come just like the, Subtle to grass started, so to grass to subtle it will start, they will again again come and they will uh, merge inside like <coughs> the earth, all earth, the solid will become liquid.
so liquid then uh, this uh, you know, water earth element will merge in water element liquid and then all water element will merge in uh, uh, air air the bio element okay like that they will uh, they this will this uh, this will start in the reverse order and then finally it will come as a, in a very seed form called known as pradhana that pradhan will remain always pradhan will remain always but that will just like uh, with a slipping or equilibrium state okay and then when lord will try uh, will uh, will start the next question he has to intervene that will glance over that then again it will start emerge from subtle to gross is that answer Any other questions? Any comments? Swamiji comments? Suppose so one thing I want to add. Jambu Deepi. No, the term Jambu. You know very famous fruits, Jambu. You know Swamiji, Jambu? Now Indian China <coughs> became the capital of diabetes. Capital of diabetes. Both the country, Jambu Dipe. It is my interpretation, sir. When it term Jambu Dipe, he told, better I think being a school, the student of Ayurveda, I can um, pass some uh, uh, secrecy to you, sir. I think right place. So when we pray the J Ganesh, he gave some uh, um, image. Ganesh is there. Kapitha Jambu Phalacharu Vakhyanam. Uma Shutam, the mantra, the, the iconography and mantra of Ganesh. Uma Shutam Bhuta Ganadi Sevitam. Uma Shutam Bhuta Ganadi Sevitam. Kapitha Jambu Phalacharu Vakhyanam. Uma Shutam. Bhuta Gana Di Sevitam. You see the political scenario. <clears throat> if you go to any minister, any director, all the mafias are around them. So stress will be there. Type 2 diabetes is a big problem now. So around, you see, recently there is a publication, 99% of political leaders are suffering from diabetes. So what happened? So if you, if diabetes, so, it is, uh, so very short lens, okay. If you diabetes, sir, you see the Ganesh. I told you type 2 diabetes especially. Ganesh has a big ear, small eyes, big trunk, ha having an um, animal uh, um, uh, head. You compare with diabetes, if diabetes is there, a wrinkle is there. If you see the skin of the elephants, wrinkles are there. Aging is there. If you are suffering from diabetes, the wrinkles will be there. You cannot see properly. And there is a chance of amputations. So that's why. So Jambu, Kapitha Jambu, Palacharu Bhakkana. Ganesh is Hati. The elephant is checking every, all time. And Ganesh, we offer the Ganesh, the Kapitha Jambu. Jambu is the best tree best plan to control the diabetes and complication. Thank you, sir. So in, the, in this tropical area, jambu plant is plenty available in India, China, Vietnam, Burma, all entire geographical area. The, and if you go to the, if you search uh, any medicine from the Ayurveda, the jambu is there, jambu seeds are there. And all these, any bitter and astringent is good for the diabetes, sir. So it is jambu depot. Uh, thank you so much. Uh... Our professor, Hare Krishna Mohanta, he concluded 10 minutes ahead of his uh, time. That's why our uh, CR has taken a little bit of the time and it was very good. And uh, now we have another question from Manash. This question is, when astrologers calculate Bhavishya, do they calculate 
the nature of a being according to the alignment of planets and star of scientific planetary system or Vedic planetary system? I hope uh, our professor will give some hints. It is very uh, <laughs> obvious that this Vedic uh, Panchanga, so the, that is based on the Vedic planetary systems. So the Navagra systems, which include Rahu Ketu, <coughs> seven plus two, so that is based on this Navagra. So the, all the calculations, what are Panchanga, horoscope, etc., these are as per uh, this uh, planetary system, Vedic planetary systems calculated. And Western, I don't know um, whether what is their basis. Okay, I, I don't have any comment on that. Any other comment, questions? Uh, yes. Uh, I think uh, it is one of the best uh, presentations on Vedic uh, cosmology, Vedic process of creation, because it is there in many, many chapters and it takes a lot of uh, energy to imagine and understand sequence. But the way um, Hare Krishna Mahanta, Professor Hare Krishna Mahanta has put it, it is like peeling the banana and giving us to eat. Even that is very difficult for us. <laughs> what he has put in one hour, it is uh, Bhagavatam, like a uh, couple of cantos, books. So, I would like to congratulate and thank Dr. Thank Hare you. Krishna Mahanta uh, that after hearing his talk, we are again, it is like revising our, uh, whatever we read and uh, forgotten half <laughs> because it is, Cosmology is a very big subject in the Vedic cosmology also. So thank you, Dr. Hare Krishna Mahanta. We request you to come every conference and present this so that we refresh with this. And it's not very easy to remember. So, but some of these concepts can be helpful in our research. He may, so he very uh, transparently presented the Vedic cosmology. Sometimes we tempted to put our model and Vedic model together and uh, the audience they don't know what actually is the Vedic model, what actually is the speaker's model. But uh, Dr. Mohanta, he has put purely very uh, nicely, this is model presented in the way of Srimad Bhagavatam and uh, it's good for us to absorb it first. You no, know? If we want to utilize concepts in uh, one concept in another place, it is important for us to absorb actually what this model is. Uh, irrespective of its correctness, because when we sometimes focus on correctness, we lose the bigger picture and the concept, whole concept. So this uh, presentation gives us the overall concept of Vedic cosmology and creation. It could be helpful, but for example, when I hear universes coming from the pores of the Vishnu, uh, from uh, Pradhana, which is the basic or unmanifested form of energy, uh, it Reminds me a little bit about Big Bang. Is Big Bang is, is one of the, I'm not saying it's correct, but you may find some interesting inspirations like our founding fathers of quantum physics, they found inspiration in Vedanta. Similarly, in modern cosmology, we may find some concepts useful. If it may not be exact form, but they can be incorporated. Thank you, Dr. Mahanta. It's a very wonderful, excellent presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Swamiji. And I would like to thank the Bhaktivedanta Institute for giving me this opportunity to speak on this particular topic. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, Before I take the next speaker, uh, I would also like to say something because this is the concluding session of the, our summer school. The purpose of this summer school is to <laughs> share among the, the delegate and speakers yeah, uh, but in this last conclusion session, I'm saying only very num a few numbers of uh, delegate and speakers here. This is like a marathon, 46 kilometers running, and uh, many cannot reach to the final goal of this. You know, <laughs> those who remains are the stubborn, and they are really very inquisitive. And I really thanks for being with us in this uh, seminar uh, final session. This final session is, you know, um, need for a new science. 
So this Betty cosmology is another one option. This involves higher dimensions. Our professor, uh, this uh, from BSU in the morning session that our Sandeep Kumar, he had talked about something on the, you know, uh, say theoretical axioms and mathematical uh, say equations about the higher dimensions. Though uh, some of our um, delegates here and even the speakers, we may be not very much familiar with the higher dimensions, but there is a one section division of the quantum mechanics that is the M theory that involves in the higher dimension, or but they call it as a, a multi-dimensional nature of the universe that added six more dimension to our space-time continuum. But our founding director of Bhaktivedanta Institute, he had given us some perspective of about the higher dimensions, especially in the nature of this our uh, Vedic cosmology. And Bhaktivedanta Institute had a kind of you know, uh, journal in the 1989. In those days we were either in this world or not, we don't know. <laughs> and uh, once I inquire about this Vedic cosmology, he said that our Vedic cosmology cannot be represented in a three-dimensional model. What that means that we have to uh, elude it in the future seminar and summer classes that is very important. Only with that higher dimensional perspective, we can easily understand what is Vedic cosmology because there's an invisible planet like Rahu and Ketu, right? How can we define with the modern, say, uh, empirical, say, hypothesis that we have been learning about the cosmology? Carl Segal, one of the founding modern, you know, uh, cosmologist is very famous. He accepted that our Vedic cosmology is very close to uh, this modern astro, uh, astrophysics or cosmology. The reason is that I just want to sort up a little bit before I speak about, uh, I want to invite our uh, last speaker. Uh, just for an example, the space time Whatever we talk about the universe and what we talk about life as per our mentor, uh, Gurudev Sri T.D. Singh, this is new science, we need something that has to be incorporated in the grand unification theory. That must include consciousness. So consciousness is the one of the symptoms that we living being has. Without consciousness, certain aspect in the quantum mechanics about consciousness, that the physics encounter consciousness, the observer's consciousness, that involved with the experiment he does. Without consciousness, no Schrodinger's kids, nothing will happen. And uh, Einstein's and uh, Bohr's conversation of, if I'm not there, whether the moon and the sun will be there or not. This is all involving with the consciousness. So consciousness, consciousness must be included in, in this grand unifications. Then if consciousness is there, that involves a kind of physical laws of nature. What we have experienced today is a, just a kind of a, some, fractional manifestation of the nature. So there is another higher laws of nature, it's called paraprakriti, that we have not discovered so far in the empirical views, but it is there. There are many other uh, aspects of reality, but this is a little bit subjective. All of us are having dreams. In dreams, we have some kind of premonitions a remote viewing, a certain things are happening that individually we cannot have this kind of experience, but 
in some degree, like in the science, we are having discussion more on the, say, mathematics, mathematical models of the universe, consciousness, and biophysics, all subjects, you know. But likewise, there is also some discipline to know higher aspect of nature to be discovered. So now, uh, I would like to invite our next speaker, K. Vasudev Rao. Before I invite him on the stage, Yeah, so uh, let me just uh, read out a little bit of his VC. He's uh, one of our, after, you know, our Gurudev's uh, departure, he took part of this, um, you know, Bhakti Bhadanta Institute as a director, but uh, let me just read out a little bit. And after that, we'll also hand over a moment to do the, our uh, speaker, or shall we do it now, or? Okay. So I would like to invite our Professor Ji to hand over our a moment to our Hare Krishna Mahanta. <laughs> Sri Basudev Rao is an uh, alumnus of the prestigious IIT Kanpur, and his field of study was in the computer science from 1998 days. Right after that, he joined Bhaktivedanta Institute and is uh, currently the president of the Bhaktivedanta Institute, Kolkata. He is one of the major contributor to Bhaktivedanta Institute's publications and also the editor of Bhaktivedanta Institute's reputed annual journal called Savagyanam. Scientific exploration for a spiritual paradigm. He traveled widely across India and abroad, creating awareness regarding the interface of science and a spiritual, spirituality among the academic and professional circles. His deep interest in the foundations of mathematics and the fundamentals of the computer science and logic, and in relation to the nature of consciousness, nature of reality, as well as ancient Indian texts has led him to meet, the, interact with the renowned scholars of Harvard, Princeton, Stanford, and MIT. He has delivered numerous talks on computer science and spirituality. Under his able guidance, the supervisions, more than 10 national conferences, two international conferences, and over 100 seminars and workshops on science and spirituality have been organized by the institution in the past decade, which include contribution from more than 20 Nobel laureates and world-renowned scholars in editions. Over 200 papers have been published by the Bhakti Vedanta Institute. He was a former Global Council trustee of the United Religion Initiative, or UN URI. So, please, uh, yeah, Basudev Rauzi, please take that. Hello. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Okay. <clears throat> so, good afternoon and uh, thank you for uh, being patient for last three days. And uh, <clears throat> I am very happy for the privilege of uh, uh, delivering the last <laughs> lecture of the summer school. <clears throat> and um, my topic is foundations of a new science. Uh, some part of it I have presented earlier in IIT recently. But there is second part, you will find something new. <clears throat> so our summer school is uh, foundations of uh, a new science. So next. <clears throat> F 
foundations of science, right? We are dealing with this. What is a foundation? A basis such as a tenet, principle or axiom upon which something stands or is supported. <clears throat> so for foundations of science, we would like to understand what are those principles or axioms or uh, <clears throat> assumptions on which foundations of science works. I have put some of them, these are not absolute. I was, yesterday I was meditating because yesterday I have put a question along these lines. Mathematics is definitely a foundation of science because we use it for quantification and modeling <clears throat> and to give exactness to the sciences. Without mathematics, it is very difficult to imagine the exact science. Then we use logic to deduce or ascertain truths and facts. Then we have experiments or prediction and observation. We predict something and then do observation. So from this we get fundamental particles, forces, phenomena or fundamental laws. They also form the foundations of science or particular uh, department, particular field of science. And honesty, interestingly, honesty is a foundation of science because we cannot do experiment everything, nor we can study every field of science. So therefore, honesty is very important, but it is something little different from science. <clears throat> then in science, we have a methodology called methodological naturalism. Science works with the assumption or with the, with the philosophy that supernatural can't be part of science. <clears throat> if, if there is anything we have to use supernatural, we simply discard it. We don't deal with it. <clears throat> so there are maybe more, not in, uh, I could not get maybe. And then finally, scientism. So scientism is a concept that science can discover all the truths or science can explain all the truths. So this is a understanding by which the scientists, some of the scientists work, but whether it is true, it is a question mark, whether science can really explain all the reality in the present way of functioning, present methodology. So next. So why we need a new science? We are doing fine. We have wonderful things. What is the need for a new science? Next. 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 OK. So you have seen these fundamental constants. What is the origin of the constants? What is the origin of the loss of the universe? If we try to explain through science, then there is uh, no scientific explanation. Next. Next. So one of the possibilities is that there is a multiverse, there are other universes. Different universes have different constant values and our universe is supposed to be the universe, lucky universe, so we got this universe is constant and we are so here the life is possible next <clears throat> but we don't have scientific evidence of uh, other universes so therefore what we have is that two possibilities either we live with no explanation or subscribe to an explanation which is in the domain of faith so it is inevitable, scientifically inevitable to subscribe to one of these. Uh, if you want to have an answer, but if you don't want an answer, that's fine. But as a scientist, we always want to find the answers, if there are answers, because we assume there is Big Bang. So these constants, how they came about, how these last came about, it is an important question for us. Professor George F. R. Ellis is, uh, applied mathematician, 
he works with uh, Stephen Hawking and uh, Penrose. I do not see any serious difference in the faith you need to believe in a multiverse and the faith you need to believe in a God who creates it all. So we started with very strong proposition that we will not deal with the supernatural but with our advancements in understanding in the universe we are forced to subscribe to something supernatural. <clears throat> For example, hypothesis of a multiverse or a God, they are not very different. Both are not within the instruments. Next. So there is an element of faith in, even within the science that we must have faith that the universe is governed by reliable laws and further these laws can be discovered by human inquiry. The logic of human inquiry is trustworthy only if it's if nature is itself logical. So if nature is logical or not, this is again our faith. <clears throat> this is the faith of reason. Next. So some of the scientists, they started thinking, maybe perhaps we may never be able to understand the ultimate reality. Of course, we understand immediate reality, but ultimate reality means what is the background on which this universe stands or which st this reality which is visible stands may not be possible with the sci rigorous scientific approach which we do today. Next. And then there is problem of morality, the astonishing hypothesis which hypothesizes that all your actions, feelings are nothing but neural activity, interaction of the molecules. Next. So if you subscribe to that, there is a problem of morality. How do you account somebody as responsible for his actions, right? If it is only a neural activity, then how, whom do you punish? Do we punish the neurons or do you punish the person? So these problems will come next. <clears throat> then there is issue of responsibility. When we send robot to the universe, to the space, we don't feel responsible. It's okay if we don't get back the robot. But if you send a human being, we feel responsible. So the issue of responsibility, uh, inherently we have some understanding about life. And uh, next. So therefore, the legal issue of responsibility seems to imply that there is indeed within each of us some kind of an independent self with its own responsibilities. Next. Another important aspect which is uh, making us think about our foundations of science is the consciousness field. I think many of you have heard enough on this hard consciousness, hard problem of consciousness and easy problem of consciousness. So hard problem of consciousness is experience. How do we explain the experience? How do we quantify it? Or how do we explain the phenomenon of experience itself? Next. Next. For example, what is it like to be a bat? Thomas Nagel has asked, what is it like to be a bat? Whatever mathematical models we develop, whatever <coughs> uh, we try to theorize, how a bat is feeling when it is sleeping upside down in the night, right? We have experienced sleeping flat on the nice comfortable bed. But hanging to a tree in the night and sleeping for the whole night, what actually it is going through? That experience we will never be able to understand. <clears throat> so therefore, there is something already going beyond our uh, domain of uh, method, scientific method, which we have today. Next. So therefore, um, Consciousness is a principle that fundamentally transcends not only physics and chemistry, but also the mechanistic principle of living beings. So some further one step ahead that the consciousness is something beyond mechanistic principles, like one liver pushing another liver, another liver. There is something very different from that, that conception of understanding of uh, nature mechanics. Next. 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 Another very important thing is that 
totality of the forces. We know there are fundamental forces and we, we feel very comfortable that we can explain everything. But the question is that there is possibility that there may be forces other than the four forces known in science. It is unreasonable to think that we already know enough about the natural world to be confident about the totality of the forces. Like el electromagnetism, one fine day we found it, it is completely a fundamental new force like that. There may be other new forces in the nature. Are we sure? Do we know the universe enough to be confident that there are no new fo other forces? This is an important question. That is a, an, again, an act of faith. Next. Next. So, religion, all faith, science, all proven. Uh, this is not completely true. Of course, it is true, religion, a lot of portion is faith is there. In science, a lot of the portion is experimental and verified. But in science, there are a lot of things which are experimentally verified. And in science, there are many things which are based on faith. So, this conception we have a little bit amen. Next. For example, faith. We trust our instruments. We take a, a reading from the instrument we assume that the reading is correct, right? Instrument is giving the reading correct, but what is the, how do we make sure that it is giving correct? It is a faith. And then sometimes we also make mistake. The instrument is giving correct reading, but we may not be noting down properly. And then we trust our logic. We trust our others' experiments. We trust journals, the big, 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 big trust. They just give us graph. They don't give their experimental data. Every day they are noting down in the laboratory where they don't publish it. They publish some data, but that fits the curve nicely. And whatever their hypothesis is. <clears throat> but we have to keep it, otherwise we cannot do all the experiments. We have to. We trust the laws of physics to be same everywhere. Similarly, we trust our teacher. We, our teacher is teaching something in the class. We don't question. Of course, we do question to understand, but not that Whatever he is saying is really true that he has some other, he is teaching something else. Similarly, we trust driver, we trust cook. So faith is inevitable in every human activity, either science or religion. So we need to properly acknowledge this in science and create space for this, which, which area is the, we can allow faith to operate or which we acknowledge, that, okay, this, this is the area faith is involved. Next. Next, similarly, origin of life. Next. Then deeper meaning of life. <clears throat> uh, this is a little bigger quote. I would like to read it. That if we, if we mechanize, if we mechanistically understand the universe and our own selves, it could have complications or implications for our welfare, for our happiness. Charles Darwin is expressing, I have said that in one respect, my mind has changed during the last 20 or 30 years. Up to the age of 30 or beyond it, poetry of many kinds, such as the works of Milton, Gray, Byron, Wordsworth, Coleridge and Shelley gave me great pleasure. And even as a schoolboy, I took intense delight in Shakespeare, especially in the historical plays. I have also said that formerly pictures gave me considerable and music very great delight. But now for many years, I cannot endure to read a line of poetry. I have tried lately to read Shakespeare and found it so intolerably dull that it nauseated me. I have also almost lost my taste for pictures or music. Music generally sets me thinking too energetically on what I have been at work on. Instead of giving me pleasure, I retain some taste for fine scenery, but it does not cause me the exquisite delight which it formerly did. Next. My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding general laws out of large collection of facts. But why this should have caused the atrophy of that part of the brain alone on which the higher taste depend, I cannot conceive. The loss of these tastes is a loss of happiness and may possibly be injurious to intellect and more probably to the moral character by enfeebling the emotional part of our nature. So our worldview, it is not that I go to 
school, college, learn some worldview and live without worrying about it. Our worldview is shaped how we look out ourselves, the world, other persons. It is shaped by our worldview. A simply mechanistic worldview can have this kind of implications, drastic implications. Next. So these um, issues are uh, leading some of the thinkers that my own view would be that at least ethics and beauty do have meaning, though science cannot attain them. And what one gets here then is that some important aspects of existence lie within what science can deal, deal with and some lie outside what science can deal with. So therefore, it raises a question on scientism or whether science can address all aspects of reality most very, 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 very importantly, our reality of our own self. So, <clears throat> scientism is in a question mark. Next. And then there are foundational difficulties. <clears throat> For example, observation is one of the important aspects of our scientific method, but how much can we observe is a question mark. Next. Theoretically, <clears throat> we cannot observe the entire universe. Right? The universe is at least 250 times larger than the observable universe. We can't directly measure the size of the universe. We don't have, we have no means to access to the entire universe. So now how do we make a theory which is applicable to the whole universe? Then what to speak about origin of the universe and its place in the entire existence of reality. So therefore, there is a foundational difficulty about our observation about the universe. Next. Next. Then there are difficulties in the foundations of mathematics because mathematics is also one of the foundations. <clears throat> uh, there is a program to formalize all the mathematics with the goal of completeness, consistency, conservation and decidability. So this is basically an attempt to, if you, if you have an exams of basic principles, then all the facts of that system can be generated or you can verify that or you can address the facts. So similarly, if we model the physical universe with the basic laws or basic foundations, you can apply the logic to get the facts about this universe. So it turned out that uh, next, that Godel's incompleteness theorem showed that this Hilbert's program is unattainable. <clears throat> In his first theorem, Gödel showed that any consistent system with a computable set of axioms, which is capable of expressing arithmetic, can never be complete. So this you have already heard yesterday from Sushant's lecture, so I am not going into that. So the mathematics, which is the foundations of science, has problem in its foundation. So therefore, um, we, we have to carefully look into that. Professor Jagadishan Srivastava, he was a noted statistician associated with Bhakti Vandhi Institute. He was uh, initially not a theist, but after uh, coming across Godel's theorem, he started pondering about his position. And he said, science may never be able to fathom the depths of reality. Just like there are unanswered questions in an axiomatic system. You make axioms or fundamental laws, and uh, there may be questions which we may not be able to answer. Next. So this is a wonderful uh, diagram the, about uh, the nature of reality. Penrose diagram, this is by Penrose, that the, the, the down right is a physical world and the mathematical world. So how much of physical world can be modeled by mathematics is a question mark. Maybe we may not be able to model all the physical reality with the mathematics, but nowadays, how the mostly physicists, theoretical physicists or mathematical physicists, they work is they assume that somehow if we, if I develop some mathematics, if I develop a uh, new <clears throat> new mathematical space, maybe I may be able to describe the reality. But whether mathematics can completely describe the reality is also a, another question mark. Next, next. So when all these different endeavors are going on, Stephen Hawking at one point, he exclaimed, maybe it is not possible to formulate the theory of the universe in a finite number of statements. 
we and our models are both part of the universe we are de describing that the physical theory is self referencing like godel's theorem one might therefore expect it to be either inconsistent or incomplete the theories we have so far are both inconsistent and incomplete next so therefore we have either we live with the fact that some domain of reality we cannot deal with or we try to expand science the scope of science as a we incorporate the method we incorporate new fields of study or new realities or new methods of doing science so that we may have some chance to uh, understand further so some thoughts i am putting there is generally reluctance to uh, especially along the lines with along the lines of uh, supernatural right what is supernatural is also again question right what is supernatural until we have proper theory proper uh, or some instruments we can uh, capture until then anything may appear like a supernatural for example the existence of a consciousness which is not product of physics and chemistry it could be called as a could be a supernatural the soul could be a supernatural thing because that doesn't but polian is putting very nicely that the recognition of certain basic impossibilities has laid foundations of some major principles of physics and chemistry similarly recognition of the impossibility of understanding living things in terms of physics and chemistry far from setting limits to our understanding of life will guide it in the right direction such a demonstration would help to draw a truer image of life and man than that given by the present concepts of biology this is very very important because sometimes we are afraid oh maybe science will become if we try to incorporate something which is non physical non chemical maybe our whole science our it will be in a mess everybody will be say everything whatever they like and he is saying we don't need to worry impossibilities in physics have led to new concepts it has opened doors to new fields of understanding like quantum mechanics there are many strange things but we are living with it so he is saying similarly by recognizing certain impossibilities of describing living beings by physics and chemistry may open doors to a new field of study and uh, so we should not be very afraid we should not be afraid to introduce these concepts and study these concepts because consciousness is the is the field where a lot of research is required and it is where indian indian traditional wisdom has a role to offer so all the lot of models are there if you can go through it it will be very india can contribute a lot to biology and actually in biology what happens somehow physicists they claim phys physics supposed to be the foundational sciences of sciences within the sciences physics is considered as a foundational science because chemistry physics is the basis of chemistry similarly biology chemistry is basis for biology so somehow biologists were convinced convinced that physics and <laughs> chemistry are more fundamental than biology but in fact biology is more fundamental than physics and chemistry because there is something fundamental in life there is something fundamental we have not actually entered into understanding life we are stuck at physics and chemistry we have not actually entered into understanding real life sciences when life sciences enter into that area consciousness studies that would be more fundamental than physics and chemistry <clears throat> next so uh, we have uh, nils bohr we must consider laws of quite different kind from physics and chemistry next erwin schrodinger our science greek science is based on objectification but i do believe that this is precisely the point where our present way of thinking does need to be amended perhaps by a blood transfusion from eastern thought so we don't need to be feel ashamed of the eastern thought we don't need to feel inferior about the eastern thought rather this eastern thought is very very important to the reality so therefore it would be very very important for science 
So therefore, we should find novel ways to introduce Eastern thoughts within the scientific framework. <clears throat> and traditional wisdom, there are very unbelievable technical details. Some of them are very uh, very interesting. For example, biodiversity. Next, next. So according to Padma Purana, these are the biodiversity and one of the Nobel laureates, he, he met by Dr. T.D. Singh, is a um, biology medicine. So after visiting a couple of times, he said, Dr. Singh, the numbers which you have mentioned me last time, they are very interesting because they are coming close to the biodiversity numbers in the biology. So how come they know these numbers? <clears throat> so it's a very interesting question. Next. Similarly, scientific estimate of the age of the universe is 13 into 10 power 9 years, but Vedic calculation is 10 to the power 4 bigger than that. So many times religion or traditional wisdom is ridiculed because in some tradition, age of the universe is given as some few hundred years or some few one couple of thousand years. But we can look into other traditional systems where the numbers are even more profound than the scientific numbers. Next. So therefore, Dr. T.D. Singh, he said that traditional wisdom should be made a partner in this new science. It doesn't mean that we accept blindly, but we can consider those models and apply a scientific open process method in understanding them and if possible to incorporate them and acknowledge if something is plausible at least. If something is not denied, if something is not disproven by science, at least we can say, okay, is a possibility is there. So in this way, we can make uh, option or provision for the traditional wisdom. Next, happiness. So, uh, one of the foundations of science is fundamental loss and particles, right? So we have for every fundamental force, there is a fundamental particle associated with it. Next. And then there is pleasure principle. We have briefly discussed in the last talk. All living beings, they want to be happy. What they want to give happiness to them may be different, but every living being wants to be happy. It is very, very fundamental. This force to be happy is fundamental in all living beings, right? This is pleasure principle. This will work with all living beings from bacteria to plants, to birds, to animals, to human beings, to demigods. Next. <clears throat> so therefore, there could be a fundamental particle that is responsible for this property. So we can think about some fundamental particles apart from what we know in this science today. Because happiness is so fundamental. We are not seeing by chance, life came by chance, but somehow happiness by chance, there is no 50-50. 50 people trying to be happy, 50 people trying to be unhappy. I am not seeing anywhere. Everybody is trying to be happy. So therefore, it is very, very fundamental to be happy. So this principle can guide us to recognize certain more, to guess, at least we can guess, like, like symmetry allows us to guess fundamental particles. Then in due course of time, they are found. Similarly, we can guess this fundamental principle, pleasure principle can lead to the discovery of a pleasure particle that is the spirit on our atma. Next. <clears throat> Next. Next. And next there is inspiration. The, in the scientific discovery, it is still, there is no science for discovery. We di there is discovery in science, but there is no science in discovery. So we don't know how these ideas, where they come from, what is the science of creativity. Next. So I'm not going through this because we, our time is uh, coming. Ramanujan, next. An equation for me has no meaning unless it represents a thought of God for the happiness. A lot of times they ask, you are putting only quotes of Western scientists. Uh, one very nice quote of Indian mathematician celebrated all over the world. An equation for me has no meaning unless it presents a thought of God. Next. Next. So, in new science, we should be able to allow multiple interpretations of scientific data. 
this could be one of the things because when we have a large data there could be multiple interpretations possible is an example that uh, in uh, football you know red card is shown right they try to study the relationship between the color of the person and color of the card when the red card is shown does it have any association with the color of the person whether if he is a black person he is shown more or if he is a white person if he is less this kind of correlation they gave the data which happened in the football uh, matches and they gave to different teams and they came up with different results you see different dots are different results we invited all the researchers to discuss the results through email exchange some approaches were deemed less defensible than others but no consensus emerged on a single best approach so that means there are multiple interpretation data is same but interpretations some say there is association some say there is no association some say there is little significance so opinions are there is no single single approach or single model that can be applied to this data so therefore we have to live with the multiple interpretation similarly next um uh, okay this is about big data one of the most common misconceptions of the big data world is that from data comes irrefutable truth yet any given piece of data records only a small fragment of our existence and the same piece of data can often support multiple conclusions depending on how it is interpreted so data is very scientific but the interpreter has his own leniency his own world view his own likeliness to present the data so therefore data is sometimes may not lead to same conclusions next so therefore dr td singh proposed that theistic interpretation of data if it is theistic interpretation is if it is consistent with the scientific data we should be able to okay it is possible at least this much we can say in, in that way there could be some uh, synthesis of uh, science and traditional wisdom and there is possibility of exchange of traditional wisdom into science and scientific method into traditional wisdom traditional practices next and religion needs science importantly religion also needs science to organize traditional knowledge better sometimes because the traditional knowledge people they try to interpret whatever way they like and sometimes we see unwanted elements so therefore it is very important to properly organize the traditional knowledge both spiritual as well as some scientific data scientific related data distinguish faith from superstition if something is scientifically incorrect and it is very harmful we should be able to tell this is superstition so we can develop certain methods for that to value element of rational thinking within religion so in religion also rational thinking is required faith is rational faith it is not a blind faith so therefore science can help to have a rational thinking in the religion also and to avoid extremism extremism also respect other traditions this is where science can really help different opinions scientists they disagree but at the end of the day okay that is your opinion it is my opinion we we'll live with it this is what religions also need to do so therefore science can also religion also needs science so new science uh, mathematics and science as it is today cannot describe the complete reality we need new concepts new laws a new science to describe complete reality this science this new science could be a paradigm of science where consciousness is a fundamental aspect of reality spirituality and traditional wisdom could be a major part in all human endeavors next so we can allow for room for multiple interpretations and we can also provide room for subjective experience and verification because there is subject to reality also and role of faith included or acknowledged and also top down model top down knowledge is acknowledged like in traditional wisdom next next so the bhagavad gita says the knowledge what is knowledge kshetra kshetra gnayor gnanam yat tad gnanam matam mama to understand this body means matter and its knower the spirit the knower observer is called knowledge that is my opinion so knowledge is complete 
when both matter and spirit are studied together that's what we need to do in the new science but in a very systematic way rational way and uh, <clears throat> next science and technology alone cannot solve the problems of new millennium we need additional guidelines for our actions for the selection of research projects and research goals these guidelines have to do with ethics with philosophy and with faith next previous okay next so i briefly give maybe in 10 minutes time we have 10 minutes hello sir how much time can i have 10 minutes okay so i will try to give vedic world view briefly so that it may be helpful for you in vedic world view reality is divided into two fundamental categories matter and spirit matter is the physical body the periodic table which we know and then plus mind intelligence and false ego or ego or identity ego is nothing but identity the sense of identity these are also considered as material elements previously please previous slide so though we have this periodic table we don't have that periodic table yet they are also our vedic traditional wisdom says that there are also fundamental elements in this universe in this in this nature and they are waiting there to be discovered by some very intelligent <laughs> expert who can capture them just like somebody could capture the <clears throat> the electromagnetic waves they are sitting there to be discovered next and in the spirit there are two category one is god and another is souls next so this equation which you have already seen so this periodic table which is to is waiting to be discovered i will give some hints or some knowledge about that which may be useful next what they are <clears throat> next so many of you know about this subway surfers game so i will use this to explain those periodic table which is waiting to be discovered from the for the eng dynamic researchers okay so any sound no sound no? okay let us go back to the slides so this game all of you know that subway surfer one boy is there as soon as you start the game the boy is there and uh, the police is after him he has to run away from the police and collect all the gold coins this is the game and all of us play video games next <clears throat> what happened slide next slide please okay so um in this video game when we start playing the video game first video game has to be created right the universe of the game has to be created for that we need space and time right the space is the computer screen and time is there in the computer the clock is there right it is a separate time though it is running in the real time there is a separate time for the the this this world if you slow that clock <clears throat> maybe you may be running in slow motion <laughs> so this game has its own time time is there in this. so if you want to create something some simulated world you need space and time so that screen is part of this space right that is a, that is a space there is a disconnect you cannot enter into the screen only way you can enter is through the interface so so next similarly the vedanta says that this world is created with a separate space and time from the absolute space and absolute time ha huh? 5 minutes okay next 
and then what is ahankara i am giving just introduction of this fundamental material entities or forces or elements whatever you call they are there this ahankara is a is a element which is responsible for identity it will help you to identify because when you start the game you assume that you are that boy means you have to identify with the boy right how do you play a game whenever you start a game there is some character hero right we all want to be hero so hero i identify myself with the hero <coughs> hero of the game the boy so there is an element subtle elements which facilitates this transition of identity from you as a player or a student in the chair to a boy running on the tracks in no time you transform yourself into that world though you are sitting in here you are transforming yourself into that world so there is a subtle element that is called ahankara ahankara means literally aham means iness kara aham kara aham means i kara means ness iness that which gives or facilitates iness next and there is intelligence as soon as you identify with the boy you have a purpose right you have to save yourself from the policeman and catch gold coins so buddhi is another subtle elements which facilitates computation or ideas whatever it is we don't know but it helps to give us uh, intelligence next and then there is mind mind is designed so that we remain in this identity for example if you go to if you go to a reception sometimes they put a tv with nice programs so we immediately forget everything and get attached there because there are interesting programs are running right we don't want to come out so similarly mind it gives us interesting programs in the mind so that we remain in this identity it is designed to be in this identity okay next the next 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 so next so soul has these four properties sat chit ananda and vigraha morning we are discussing sat is eternal next next so we have law of conservation of energy it is not something new that something is eternal next there are more things that are eternal left side they are eternal right side they are temporary god soul energy of matter and time they are all eternal this but this universe and our activities and our identity mind intelligence and the body and universal time this time in this universe they are all temporary like the time in the computer switch off time is gone next okay i think i will stop here next and then there is mention of size of the soul it is mentioned 10th to 1000 part of the tip of the hair but at the end it says sankhya tito hi chitkana is beyond any numbers it means two things their number is beyond our calculation or their measurement is beyond our calculation beyond any number. means we cannot actually measure why it is so because next is called immeasurable is one of the qualities mentioned in the second chapter of bhagavad gita fundamental properties of soul is immeasurable you cannot measure the soul next is because because in this example if you want to use the instruments within the game to measure your height who is sitting in the chair it is not possible do you get my suppose there is a scale in his hand right can he measure himself that boy he can measure himself in the game that boy but he cannot use that scale to measure the person who is sitting in the chair because the person who is sitting and playing the game is transcendental to the game so therefore in the new science we should be able to identify or acknowledge the transcendental elements but we can catch them not physically but through the interface just like computer interface the character has some interface similarly there is some interface from the soul this is called mind body problem how soul is interacting with the body this is mind body problem if we if we get 
to the core of the problem, core of this problem, we may be able to catch the mouse. This is where he is operating it. That much we will be able to find in future. So therefore, traditional wisdom gives us a lot of insights into the nature of reality, which could be very useful, which can open up our uh, science as well and create very new fields and uh, new theories, particles, forces or whatever a lot to be discovered and as the Indians we have a lot of lot to contribute here so we have to think out of the box otherwise just like they take our stories and make nice animated stories we also clap same thing will happen in science they will take our concepts and they will make the theories and we will clap so if that does not happen then we should seriously think about our traditional concepts from today thank you very much thank you uh, before I take up uh, questions or comments or any uh, you know, additions, uh, I just want to give a little bit conclusions of his uh, talks. So we have this on the faith. Uh, just as a research scholar, those who have already gone through you know, research PhD work and they have got degrees, they know about this. Before they get this PhD degree to reach his goal, his or her goal, he, have, he or she has to have a faith that what I'm doing, that at the end there must be a goal that will be the conclusion of my thesis or my research work, that he has not perceived as what he was actually on the time when he reached in that level so this kind of faith how can we define in the field of science this is our Vasudev is saying that it is, should be one of the uh, you know paradigm that should be included in new science and morality and or ethics the science is so good to create so many innovative and inventions for example this uh, Alfred novels he invented dynamites. What is the, what is the morality of the dynamites? <laughs> so we are indiscriminately using it in the war, right? But now there is a political ethics and a bioethics that it should not be used. This nuclear bomb should not be used indiscriminately for a very, you know, uh, small aspect of a conflict. So it's a kind of a morality even for bombing, but science, do science has uh, uh, ethics? I hope they also have, but their Our ethics is, is different headquarters. from this uh, moral and uh, ethics that we have in a society. I'm from because Arnold. as being a living entity, we have a purpose for living in this world. If we are being just only uh, chemicals, then we don't have this, we don't need to know all such things, right? So this is one of the reason why in this new science, uh, morality or ethics should be included. Responsibility is the same in that way. When I do something, I should be responsible for what I do. And uh, consciousness is a very vast subject that we have to explore. But in our, this uh, summer foundations of science, uh, this is a kind of a, uh, in that level is the first of uh, our discourses. So consciousness had been discussed in a very, you know, different levels in the mm. novel laureates yeah, levels yeah, and okay. other Some things. Also, we also should do it on our own levels and our perception yeah, of sure. consciousness yeah. in Indian context among yeah. the students, it should be uh, very elaborate up to some degree. Otherwise, uh, as being we were also going to college and universities and that time we do not know what was consciousness. Only after you know, passing our degrees and PGs, and then we come to realize a little bit about consciousness. So without knowing the nature of consciousness, many students act like uh, mechanical robots. So consciousness is very important aspect for all the students, young students, especially those who are pursuing their degrees, PGs and research work. So that has been included. That is the foundation of our new science. And the forces, of course, we all know about this uh, uh, four fundamental forces, these uh, electromagnetic fields and um, 
gravitational field weak and strong nuclear forces. Beyond that also there are some forces that I cannot conclude here, but at least what I want to give within the context of the speaker, there is also a spiritual force <laughs> that we have not discovered that we can have in some other seminar or in some uh, class school. Okay, the one of the best thing I found that though it says that science and beyond, though science is there because this is the train of the modern world, whatever the scientist does, the rest of the world follows. So beyond that includes aesthetic and a metaphysical also. That include other streams of our education systems like politics, economics, and commerce, all the rest of the other, you know, walk of our life's education system. So happiness in science, what we get today is mostly, it's not happiness, it's a comfort, I would say in that sense. Of course, some degree of happiness is there, but most of those who are in the aesthetic world, they're more on happiness level. Because uh, like uh, those who are performing arts and uh, musics and others, you know, they're really enjoying life in some degree better than the scientists. Scientists are mostly enjoying on the uh, comfort levels. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so happiness is the foundation of our new science that, that is means for each and everyone. <laughs> okay, so with this, I would like to conclude a little bit of what it is. Yeah, yeah, that will come. And now, this yeah. is the last and concluding session. So we should have to have some extra time for question and answer because these are the hardcore marathon runners. They will not tear off from our you know, five or 10 minutes extra time. So with this, I concluded our uh, K. Vasudev Rao's uh, you know, concluding, uh, concluding speech and uh, let us take some questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir. A very ni nice presentation about uh, the limitations of the modern science and uh, how we can migrate to new science. But uh, I would just like to have your comment that why this modern science actually failed to integrate I mean, uh, is the answer lies with the, that we have taught, we have tried to understand the modern science in, in compartments. Say, we have studied physical laws separately, we have studied chemistry separately, we have studied biology separately. Then we integrated these domains, we, we made uh, biophysics, we made uh, biochemistry. So do you think that there is now a need to integrate the entire natural science at one platform, so therefore new laws can be devised, and maybe in that case, these uh, answers can be uh, given. Mike, Mike. Hello. Hello. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> A very good question. Uh, bringing together different disciplines, that work is already happening, right? Multidisciplinary, and now even there is transdisciplinary something is there. So that effort is going on, uh, but that itself is not sufficient. You have to go beyond the disciplines of science also. <clears throat> so it has something to do with the history, right? History of conflict between science and religion. And religion was very powerful. They tried to subdue science, <laughs> right? <clears throat> so they denied the place that science deserves. Of course, not here. In our land, <laughs> fortunately, here science religion very nicely coexisted in before, even now. They are fighting in the court evolution and intelligent design. We have no problem. <laughs> we are happy here. <clears throat> I mean, we understand there is data is there. Somebody is. We understand, but we don't have that much problem. But in the West, there is a big problem because of the history. A religion claimed to the totality of truth. Religion claimed its hold or its uh, <clears throat> what you call its uh, supremacy or authority on the entirety of uh, truth. So therefore, without realizing the limits of religion, 
religion also has its own limits including vedanta for example la newton's laws of motion they don't they are not there in the bhagavad gita so we should know the scope of religion we should know the scope of science and we can see where they overlap so therefore there was a mistake in the past the religion claimed authority to totality of truth and denying the place for science now opposite is happening <laughs> now science has been claiming the complete authority to truth though it is not explicitly told it is what it is how it is happening that's why the supernatural excluding supernatural from the science that is the origin so therefore there is no religion we don't need to deal with religion but that is also not proper we find limitations so either neither science nor can religion can claim complete um, truth through their through their system because reality is combination of both so therefore there should be a synthesis of both understanding properly the scope of each where what is the scope of science what is scope of religion similarly all other disciplines of knowledge like art everything has their own <clears throat> but nowadays all the brain has been drained to science <laughs> so, so there is no and what remaining in the other disciplines is mostly like a kind of drain right so we need we need brains in every field all fields have to grow including science including arts including if all fields of knowledge and when there is proper synthesis the proper place for traditional wisdom science and other fields of knowledge then we will have good hope so humility humble approach both from science from religion from politics from sociology from arts everything an humble approach acknowledging the others significance context and uh, contribution and imbibing with open mind that will give us some hope to understand ultimate reality thank you so much uh so one please one minute yeah please sir for your question sir there is a alma atta declarations health for all by who health for all by 2000 ad it was declared by the who in alma atta so in that declarations they declare western medicines they develop a lot so you the eastern country develop your traditional tra traditional systems that's why all the country like korea china in india and japan is they develop their traditions tradition means their parampara so that's why you see sir now in mbbs course they added the uh, 200 marks of, of the indian indian science health sciences ayurveda and yoga is a international field now, now recently the who open one center in jamnagar sir for a collaborations to know more about our religions and uh, know our tradition sir thank you sir thank you um next i would like to take questions from the audience uh, are there any more questions to be asked by the audience yes so we have couple of more questions <laughs> pranam sir namaste uh in new science uh, you have referred one top down knowledge uh, what do you exactly try to refer it is it it is uh, transcendental or uh, something from guru or whatever that uh, yeah top down that, knowledge yes very good question <clears throat> uh in the vedic uh, tradition there is concept of top down epistemology <clears throat> because Uh, there is limitation in our senses limitation or instrumentation there is limitation in uh, logic so <clears throat> uh, because logic is based on direct perception so in vedanta there is uh, shabda means revealed knowledge means receiving knowledge from somebody who knows so is the the vedic text they are known as apaurushaya means not written by any human being 
the Vedas. So we accept those knowledge, but as but at least as a starting point, as a premises, and then we can apply scientific method to understand. So top down knowledge is same, receiving some knowledge from revealed knowledge. <coughs> Reveal knowledge from body, who knows? Because every knowledge cannot be obtained by experiment and observation. For example, if I come to Puri, I land in the railway station. <clears throat> I have two ways to get the knowledge of route to the venue or to the hotel. One is trial and error, all the paths and see if it reaches. And another is ask somebody, sir, where is the, what is the path to go to the, the Niladri Nivas or to Vatika? <clears throat> so he will tell and I come. So this is top down knowledge. Because experimental knowledge has its limitations. <clears throat> of course, in top down knowledge, there is possibilities of be, being cheated, right? Somebody may cheat me and send me some other place. Possibility is there. <clears throat> but that is inevitable. I have no other way. I have no other way than to ask somebody. Either person or Google Maps. I also like another person. <laughs> right? Sometimes Google Maps also, it takes to dead ends. Right? <laughs> Sometimes you drive and go, <laughs> dead end is there. You cannot go forward. You cannot come back. So, it reveals our limitation in understanding the reality. Because we being limited, we have to depend on external source of knowledge. Even in science, top down knowledge is there. We go to a lab. I have gone to lab for the first time in the 10 plus one. For 10 years, I am receiving top down knowledge. I have not verified any of the scientific knowledge, right? So if you want, you can verify for yourself later. But in the beginning, you have to accept the knowledge, including scientific knowledge in top-down approach. Yes, you, you can verify after getting the knowledge, you can verify yourself. Sometimes you have to proceed without verifying also. Pramana means how it is known. Praman. Praman yes. How it is known. Yes, yes. Prama means what is known. So when we include both. Yes. Then the, uh, the knowledge is complete or it is again inconsistent. <coughs> knowledge is is complete when both top are down. top down and bottom up are combined. Yes. Both have to be combined. Yeah. An example is given about finding one's father. You know, general many times it is given. How do I find father? I cannot go and collect DNA. Everybody may not give DNA. If I ask our, our Prabhuji, he may not give, oh, I will not give my DNA. How do I check? Simply ask mother and she will tell. We have to live with it. Some knowledge, top down knowledge is actually a major portion of knowledge which we have. Bottom up knowledge is very little. Actually, if we see our life, bottom up knowledge is very, very little. All the knowledge we get is Top down, top down, top down. In religion also, we hear and also we check, we verify. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir. My question, like, uh, you sh showed one video game in that there was one character and, like, mm. there was one character and, like, uh, uh, that character could not see the actual player who is uh, controlling the thing. But like uh, so how means we are like those uh, cartoon characters only inside the game so like how would we actually see the means uh, controller means when we die then only we will see or like uh, when we will <laughs> means uh, it's like when game gets over then only we would be able to see that uh, actual controller or what will happen then yes this is the question thank you hello oh, thank you First of all, the character is yourself. He's not somebody who is playing. He's yourself who is playing. But you are unable to measure yourself. Understand? 
when you are within that game if you want to measure yourself you have to come out of that game and see yourself sitting in the chair but as long as you are glued to it you have no way to understand yourself because basically you forget right after some time you forget you are sitting in the chair you are wearing a blue shirt right you have this much height you forget all all you think is this small boy running on the tracks and collecting so unless you come out of it you will not know or otherwise somebody reminds you from outside for example your mother comes and say hey, niket what games you are playing it is time for lunch get up and say ma i am coming right at that point you are aware of the both worlds you are aware of the this world you are also aware of this world so that is spiritual transformation or spiritual realization means you are aware of the both worlds you are aware of your both identities your temporary identity your permanent identity the spiritual practice awakens your permanent identity just like your mother awakens a hey, niket you don't know that you are niket till that time you are thinking you are a boy running and you are very busy collecting gold coins which have no use <laughs> right so when your mother wakes up when my mother calls then you realize right so then you are still playing not come out so that time you know both worlds you are aware of both worlds so that is the spiritual process awakening or calling comes by practicing spiritual okay sir <laughs> yes okay this is a question which i don't understand i mean myself don't know at all we keep hearing this that submission before the that uh, unknown super power or whatever you say what is that full submission means full submission means full love full love full love <clears throat> developing that love if i want to stay with you right i have to develop i have to understand who you are what you do what is your personality i want to know that whether you want to talk to me or not right then <clears throat> start conversation try exchange develop some relationship so surrender is comes much later surrender is nothing but love i told in the morning that happiness is more fundamental than free will when you are very happy with somebody then you surrender right so similarly when you are very happy with god then you surrender is not somebody forcing you to surrender you just yes 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 <laughs> that is the surrender means you develop that uh, attraction or you develop that idea of our personality or concept of god you develop that attraction relationship and there is two way relationship it is not one way it is two ways so it grows and when you become fully happy with that relationship then you surrender i think all of you have this experience when you are fully happy in the relationship you surrender but after some time when you become unhappy you say call it a day <laughs> right friends or whatever it is but god is such a beautiful person once you develop um, attraction that uh, affection it is not going to go away because nothing else god is uh, is somebody uh, you don't find more attractive than him here we find more attractive things than the person whom we like the most now later but for god there is no possibility that you will find somebody better than god so therefore you will get shanti only when you enter into relationship with god so that is when you really when you become fully happy with god then you surrender you don't know that you are surrendering because you are very happy but now we don't want to surrender because we don't want to surrender it is very unhappy so surrender is love love is surrender happiness ah uh.
with in the robe of a scientist shall i then say that it, it should start with the inquiry then association and yes. then submission yes okay. submission submission nobody will tell you to submit Achha. that you do by telling somebody is not submission we are only waiting for time <laughs> the real submission comes when you are fully happy and it doesn't matter somebody in this dress scientist dress as a artist dress doesn't matter because for god everybody is equal whoever is interested in him god is interested in him instantaneously so only thing stopping is my interest i have no interest in god that is the only thing stopping as soon as you have interest immediately there is interest from god thank you sir for this is interesting question uh, <laughs> i think uh, with this we concluded this session and uh, i would like to request our chair to present a moment to k vasudev rawji thank you all once again for your patience in this <laughs> talk and throughout the three days and after this we have a short panel discussion little bit yeah please Okay. I would I would like to request the session chair and co-chair to kindly come on to the stage uh, in the meanwhile uh, uh, i think the session chair is uh, going to take a um, couple of time we will rearrange the stage and then we will reconvene uh, can we uh, can i have some volunteers near the stage so as to arrange the chairs thank you I would request the session chair and co-chair to kindly come on to the stage again, Professor Devi Prasad Das and Sri Subhash Chandra Singh. Uh, I request both of you to kindly come on to stage. I request Sri Melinda Sagar. to kindly extend a token of appreciation to our session chair professor deva prasad das on behalf of summer school 2022 i request sri sagar to extend a small token of appreciation to the session co-chair sir subhash chandra singh thank you sir so now we are done with the official talks and sessions and the final uh, open discussion or the panel discussion is 
about to begin. So I would like to request the moderator for the panel discussion, Shri Melinda Segar, to come on to the stage and uh, start the show. So please. So good evening, everyone. So we are almost coming to the back end of this uh, three days conference, I mean, summer school. And uh, in the words of uh, the convener, Dr. Devashish Khan, the purpose of this uh, summer school is, I'll just read it out. The main objectives of the summer school 2022 on foundations of science and beyond are manifold. It will bring together a multidisciplinary group of researchers and scholars around the world. One, to inspire and expose the audience to the amazing foundational concepts and their limits prevailing in various disciplines of science in exploring the nature and its underlying principles. Number two, to educate them on what further can be done, further can be known, and what will remain unknown forever. Number three, to explore the foundation, foundational principles, if any, which the present day science might be missing in its search for the ultimate reality or absolute truth. The school will also aim to provide alternative proposals and novel ideas to handle the issues by taking guidance from ancient spiritual tradition, mostly Indian knowledge system. The school is as well as intended to present future visions with an opportunity to learn from and interact with the leaders of both science and spirituality in a stimulating setting. Thus, the lectures, uh, lectures to be delivered will cover a broad range of perspectives and will enthuse the participants with thought-provoking questions, ideas, and undoubting hankering for answers to the questions on foundational issues in science. So, with this very basis, <coughs> we invited questions from the audience and there are very thought-provoking, really thought-provoking questions that has come to us. And to answer these questions, I would like to call upon a group of panelists who will, unlike other uh, panel discussion, who will come and stay here just to answer those questions while they're answering the questions, if you get some more questions, you can write it down, pass it on to us. Depending on the time, we'll answer those questions. So now, I would like to call upon the first panelist, Professor HD, uh, N.D. Haridas, uh, retired senior professor, IAMS Chennai. Sir, please. Give sir a big round of applause, please. wherever you <laughs> yes so i would uh, now call upon the next panelist professor sujit roy iit bhuvaneshwar sir please <laughs> next i will like to call upon dr ramji repeka Faculty, IIT, Ropar. Our next panelist is going to be Professor Debashish Khan, IIT, BHU.
Our next uh, panelist is going to be Professor Hare Krishna Mohanta Bitspilani. Sir, please. And our last panel, uh, panelist is going to be Sri Varun Agarwalji, Director, Bhakti Vedanta Institute, Kolkata. <laughs> Sir. Thank you, sirs. Uh, now, without uh, further delaying the session, we will directly start with the first question. And the first question comes to you. I will read the question and pass it on to you. Uh, what is the nature of time so far as we know it? I believe that mathematical equations and results make far more sense than common sense. How do, how far I can up? With this, with this approach, how far can I go in trusting the mathematical framework of the universe? Well, that's a, hard and all-encompassing question, what is time? I'll just try to make a few remarks about it. Certainly it will not cover the entire gamut of what the issues are. But uh, I would urge people to keep two things separate. One is things like psychological time and uh, what our uh, mind perceives time as, which leads to notions like flow of time and others. And on the other hand, time as used by scientists, particularly physicists, In the latter, time enters as a parameter in various equations. In Newton's equations, it's d2x by dt squared. Schrodinger equation, it is ih cross d by dt psi, etc., etc., etc. Now, this is, should be called a parametric time. And it is not time per se. And this awareness is not as wide as it should have been. And even among physicists, this has led to a number of confusions and contradictions. Ultimately, time for a physicist is what a clock reads. Some people don't like it and they call it an instrumentalist approach, but that's the only approach that is useful and sensible in physics. So then, what is a clock? Here you'll be surprised that almost everything can be a clock. Just as in thermodynamics, Almost anything can be a thermometer with a few restrictions. Any property can be used as a thermometer provided that property is monotonic in temperature, means either keeps increasing or keeps decreasing. But if something is not monotonic, say it goes up and comes down, then that will not make a good thermometer. That's why we don't make thermometers out of water. Because at four degrees, water reaches a certain minimum density. 
maximum density. Sorry, minimum density. Therefore, the density as a function of temperature of water goes up and comes down. Same way for time, any physical property that is monotonic in time is a good clock. And the clock doesn't even have to read regularly. It can have a nonlinear phase. You can even have a clock whose hands go backwards in time. Yet, it's a good clock. And use of one clock versus another does not change the physics. So this is a physicist's conception of time. Of course, it doesn't have all the wonders about the psychological time, the flow of time. And you say, oh, you know, my friend came and uh, we hardly noticed that a whole month passed. And then uh, here I am with my husband, and every day feels like it is a uh, year, OK? So this is psychological time. It's very interesting. Our life is tied up with that, but these two should not be mixed up. I may cite a very important dialogue that took place between Einstein and um, Uh, Einstein and um, Bergson. Bergson was a very, very influential philosopher. And he more or less dismissed Einstein's approach to time and said that it's not at all important. But he did admit that Einstein's time was mathematically correct and it was a time that relied on clock. Einstein stood his ground. He said, for physicists, this is the only time that makes sense. Your time doesn't even exist, he told Bergson. So those of you who are interested in following this discussion further, please read the exchange between Bergson and Einstein. Even this limited formulation of time for physicists is not without problems and troubles. When we go to quantum theory, we don't have a very clear idea of what time is. And when we go to general theory of relativity, there are various nuances. And in quantum gravity, we have no idea. I personally think that what is holding up progress in quantum gravity is our insufficient understanding of time. Thank you, sir, for this wonderful explanation. Uh, that actually brings me to one small question, if you can just answer to this question. If you are given a choice, how would you define the real time? This word real and reality has caused a lot of headache. Okay. So one, you have to tell me what you mean by real time. Is it a time measure which many people agree? Consensus, will it make it real? So what makes it real? For us physicists, consensus is what makes time real and it has a very definite role to play and in fact in a certain sense the necessity for time is a no-brainer because a world in which there is no change is no world if you imagine a situation where refractive index doesn't change at all you don't see anything. It's the change that really is observable. OK? And uh, this is extremely important. And therefore, a world without 
evolution. A world without dynamics is a dead world. If you have evolution, then you must have a way of keeping track of it. That the state of the system, state of the universe has changed is parameterized by saying at this instant of time it was that, at another instant of time it was that. This is all that is required for defining and using time in physical sciences. I would call that real time. Psychological time to me is in some sense not real, but that may be because we don't understand psychological time. In biology also we have clocks. So the so-called psychological time which Bergson talked about may in the end turn out to be just a clock output, exactly as time is in a laboratory. So to that extent, even the psychological time may become real time. But for me as a physicist, what I read on a clock is real for me. Thank you, sir. So I think we understand that there is a foundational problem in our understanding of time. So maybe as time passes, we'll get more perspective about time. So let's move on to the next question. This question is uh, from Abhijit Satpati. As students, uh, sometimes we get disturbed and diverted from our goal, that is study. How we can use our consciousness to get back to the track? So I would like to pass this question to Sujit Roy, sir. I as a teacher, I as a teacher in my class, make my class so much fun loving. Then uh, the students whom I teach, okay, they always uh, say that it's not, I actually I'm not bragging myself, but it happened that in IIT system, there is a brand change that after first year, you can do a change. So if you join physics, you can go to computer science. If you have done it, very good these things. But it happened in my life that students wanted to change from electronics to chemistry. And two BTEC students have done uh, their project with me. So I don't know a direct answer to this. I can only tell you that as a teacher, I make my classes very fun loving. So I think you as a student should make your studies, okay, quite fun loving. That means try to get happiness out of it, if I may take Vasudev Rao Swamiji's word. And that is the only way perhaps to not get diverted from studies. This is my small submission. And you can, it's not very difficult. You can simply work a little bit out and take, get connected with some other top people for their top down knowledge. And you will find that you will really not get diverted, absolutely not get diverted. Only keep in mind that you have to be happy. Now I have understood happiness very well. I was using this approach in my classes, but I really now understand that my, I have to make my students happy. The students have to be happy themselves in order to have their consciousness to net not get diverted from their goal. That much I only I can say as a practical teacher. Thank you, sir. Uh, does any other panelists would like to add? Any more points on this? As teachers, we have many faculty members. So they have a very question that is concerning.
okay um abhijit satpati it was a nice nice question as a student sometimes we get disturbed distracted or distracted and diverted from our studies goal that is study how we can use our consciousness to get back to the track of course there are two aspects of this no need to speak even about the consciousness in the first place that comes later as we have right. we have heard at least couple of lectures or couple of talks on consciousness first we will talk about i will just try to complement what sir has said so generally when we get into any program that is either out of our own interest or because of forcing by our parents because of the present circumstances at that time so as sir said also if really i am interested it will never distract me it may be seems to be uh, idealistic but it is real because when the teacher is teaching and then in a very fun way or very interesting way with many real life examples so it is never distracting for the students because once we study even we tell to our children that if you hear attentively the class then you need not to even put attempts at the home to make it understand so we generally get distracted because we are getting some so called higher test like in the form of mobiles in the classroom itself when the class is going on but we get distracted so there when we understand what is actually the happiness we get derived only for by watching the mobile but if you see what is the actual real happiness so higher and higher taste then definitely you will see that the purpose for which you have come it is never lost it is never failed so actually there is no chance for even a distraction in 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 my opinion yeah thank you very much yeah thank you i can also uh, add that i have I, i have come across several students who suppose were in, in finished their btech in mechanical engineering and later changed into english and then became very good english at abroad not india they became english professors abroad so perhaps they could not connect with that mechanical side i mean mechanical engineering at the time of their btech because some somebody inside might be telling that your happiness is in english okay so you have to also understand where you connect your heart connects okay that's what i personally feel as a teacher thank you sir that's a very very valid point that is that's the reason i think most of the parents in current uh, you know world they allow the students to pursue what they like to except for few the world is changing the thoughts are changing let's hope for the best so we'll move on to the next question with this the next question is from uh, savit and uh, the question goes like this if we connect all the science on scientific fields field with the spirituality how will the future look like is it really possible so i would uh, pass this question to sri varun agarwal ji the name of the person sabit uh, okay interesting uh, it will be fabulous <laughs> if we can do that means uh, everything connected and you have a holistic perspective of life that will be really great so certainly there will be uh, some limitations but whatever degree we can connect it will be very useful in terms of connection in our own personal life in terms of connection in our academics uh, whatever way means whatever we can do whatever degree we can connect it will be certainly uh, very good it will be very useful there is an article by josephson 
Josephson is a thesis based in uh, 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 UK, University of Oxford, I think. So you can, uh, he has written an article in one of our books, Seven Novel Laureates on Science and Spirituality. So he writes on this line that suppose we bring in spiritual things in science, so how the future would be look like? Exactly the thing which you are saying. So bring in God in science, for example, then how the framework of science would be? He discusses it. So we can go into more detail into that. Irrespective of how much we are able to bring in in academic structure, that may have limitations because of uh, politics, because of ministerial governments from different countries, that's fine. At least as much as we can bring in our life, that will bring revolution. Like quantum physics brought revolution in physics, bringing a spiritual connection in our own life will bring revolution in our thought. Like somebody was asking just now about distraction, what is uh, that same thing comes out, the spiritual practices makes the mind very calm and soothing and also makes the mind very focused. You are able to make clear decisions, means even if there are some distractions, you are able to choose your path clearly, that tomorrow is my exam or after one week I have NSM, so these are my priorities, even if there are distractions, I will take care of them, I want to attend other things, I will do it later. So that clarity of mind, that focus of mind comes from these spiritual practices. So if one inculcates, imbibe, at least in his personal life, that will help a lot. And the future of that person will be very holistic and very bright. And he can be a very good scientist, actually. If, uh, if you see the history of modern science, most of the scientists, uh, they had very beautiful uh, spiritual uh, side. Uh, that part is separate, we'll go later sometime. I hope some justice I could do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for that wonderful, wonderful question and wonderful answer. answer. Uh, spiritual practices bring in clarity of mind and clarity of mind brings in clarity of thought, consequently clarity in your actions. Okay. So we'll move on to the next question. Again, this question is from Savit. Savit has many thought provoking questions. Sir, question was also from Savit. Okay. Despite the magnificent endeavors that we have accomplished through mathematical formalism, it still has many problems within it. Should we think that the formalism is flawed and constantly look out for a new kind of formalism? If yes, if yes how can we go about it? So, I will pass on this question to Dr. Ramji Raipaka. Yeah, so I think a person who is engaged in scientific pursuit so definitely they would come across different sp steps or different aspects of that process right from inspiration then idea comes from there he make formalizes hypothesis and then theory theorem and then based on that he will establish he or she will establish theory and then law and then do the experiments and then he, he or she will refine that and then if any wrong thing is happened then again he will refine the theory and then once it is refined in cyclic succession then the finally the law comes out so flaw means because we don't know what is going to happen if we know everything then there is no research so with with our limited knowledge when we try to pursue that definitely that leads to an outcome which may be what is say warranted with refinement and hence you will, you will keep on refining the laws. So like the example uh, Swamiji has given that 
there are two aspects one is the apara vidya and there is the para vidya so apara vidya is the upward knowledge basically bottom up approach and then para vidya is the top down approach so as swami ji has given nice example in the last uh, in one last lecture that to find who is the biological father so there are many ways so one is to find ask the mother and then the baby would know the answer and the other thing would be you go for dna test which may be successful or may not be successful so if you take both aspects then definitely you would get a proper answer what it means is basically culmination of both the apra vidya and then the para vidya so both are complementing with each other so in this in this case so there are many flaws because our senses are flaw we have our senses are having many flaws in that so when we try to make a refinement in the due process so you get the fine refined law so nothing wrong in the material sense because this apra vidya is having that limitation so that is where we have to really take the help of the para vidya as far as possible in our endeavor yeah this is what i mean i could say this thank you very much that is uh, almost uh, spiritualist perspective of answer to this question i would uh, like to uh, get some comments from a scientist our would you like to comment on this this is from dr ramji repaka no, this is a question savit let me read it out despite the magnificent endeavors that we have accomplished through mathematical formalism it still has many problems within it should we think that the formalism is flawed and constantly look out for a new kind of formalism if yes how can we go about it now first of all i don't know what problems of about the mathematical formalism that you have in mind one problem of a mathematical formalism could be how to relate it to the real world i'm sorry i'm using the word real myself but uh, you know what i mean and this is not always straightforward and it can lead to erroneous conclusions but that problem is not a problem of the formalism but more of making a mapping between the symbols in a mathematical formalism and the objects that we are familiar with so the resolution to that would be better understanding of the objects which will help you to model them better and find a mathematical formalism that's appropriate but intrinsic problems with mathematical formalisms could be one of range one of consistency and so on these will have to be examined on a case by case basis and i don't think there is any general panacea for such issues for example when quantum field theories were developed which eventually led to one of the most spectacular success of physics where you could predict properties to 11 or 13 decimal places which had never happened before 
but in the early days everything that was calculated turned out to be an infinity which is obviously nonsensical so this was a case where a formalism which was thought to be applicable accurate and correct had limitations after much work it was realized this limitation arose not really from the mathematics that was used but in extrapolating laws of physics to domains where one had no right to do that maxwell's equations had been studied under a certain domain and they were extrapolated to arbitrarily small atomic systems it was that extrapolation that led to an inconsistency so the formalism didn't work again because of our understanding of the physics to which we had applied the mathematical formalism i hope that answers thank you i hope you got your answer so we'll move on to the next question in a formal system there will always be some truths that are improvable now say i am a mathematician trying to prove a conjecture which has been forced found to be experimentally true of course within the computational limits how do i know where to stop searching for the searching for the proof if there are way to resolve is there are way to resolve this dilemma okay so i'll pass this question to professor devashish khan so this question is again from savit so savit are you here yeah so uh, a lot of thoughtful questions from you so that is very good that uh, if you give a big round of applause <clears throat> okay so uh, okay so i am uh, telling you the answer uh, uh, in a steps like uh, first uh, people say that those who are pure mathematician if they work with thoughtful mind so either they become philosophers or spiritualist people say it's not my but uh, there are several limitations in the applied mathematics so that uh, one has to admit see i am from a uh, computational mechanics background so just i am uh, telling you the sequences Uh, why i am telling like this that there are several limitations so initially i started uh, with uh, uh, in the numerical method there is one finite difference method through which uh, we can uh, numerically simulate uh, the uh, deformation behavior of solids okay but later on uh, it has been observed that there are several issues in that and we need some better numerical method okay so people started and they they found that okay uh, there are several methods like uh, one of them is finite element method and nowadays of course there are other methods like meshless method wavelet method and uh, combination of like finite element method wavelet method and other methods as well in practice but what is happening so when i started to work on finite element method okay so uh, it is giving better results of course uh, at this stage uh, the finite element method is the only numerical method which is uh, mathematical very strong and that's why uh, in industry also till now people are using this in a very uh, large scale but when i started to look into the mathematical basis of this finite element method so there i have seen there are issues again so uh, in pure mathematics uh, the issues are less but in applied mathematics the issues are there 
at several levels starting from the mathematical formulation itself because you are expressing the physical phenomena or describing the physical phenomena through uh, the differential equations or through differential equations with some boundary conditions but okay science has given a lot because uh, through a only few number of differential equations we can actually describe uh, many of the uh, physical phenomena so that is wonderful uh, contribution from the science but when we look into the solution phase like this numerical method so there we see the flaws because okay analytical method is very uh, difficult to handle uh, when the geometry is very complex or when the loading is very complex or when the uh, there are multiple loads present in the system so practically we cannot solve through the uh, analytical method so there are this numerical method developed okay so to some extent this finite method or meshless method or even this wavelet method they, those are working but what we are again observing is that in due course of time newer kinds of materials are being developed in order to need the demand of the situation and for those again we are developing uh, newer constitutive equations and in order to solve those again we are facing difficulties in the presently available numerical methods so what is the solution so because in the numerical methods in the foundational aspects i have observed that there are several issues like one is this major theory which people do not understand even means at least those who are in the numerical methods but for those who are mathematicians they understand but still uh, in order to apply it properly uh, there are several issues in the computational level so but as our computer uh, constitutive model is becoming difficult and also the loading pattern is becoming difficult so we need some more advanced numerical techniques and in that way if we look into like finite methods was developed in 1968 or 70 so if we see that almost 50 years we have passed but uh, okay we are solving a fewer kind of problems but with that some more problems are also coming so in order to meet the demand so this is like a ever ending process what it appears that you like your question is that where you will stop so if you go in this way actually uh, in my opinion of course so this will never stop so you will be solving one problem and in the next level some more problems will be coming to meet the demand of the situation okay so you have to develop something else and in that where the things will be moving on so it will not stop in my view in my personal view so there what we can see so already uh Borunji has told that if we can add some higher intelligence or higher wisdom or some spiritual elements in our life then you can see the complete picture in a better way that okay because uh, like uh, i have seen the uh, history of many mathematicians so if you are very thoughtful and if you are a, a very sincere researcher if you are sincerely looking for the truth it is not that okay so if you take a very simple problem you can easily solve the problem and in that uh, you can publish so many papers no problem but if you take a difficult problem so your solution not be very simple and i am not saying that you don't take that you take difficult problems and you face the difficulties and in that process you learn many things which will help you to know the reality in a better way so in that way even the quantum mechanics was developed in that quest only so till now actually see suppose why the solution or why the mathematical basis of that mechanics is very difficult because because the space actually what uh, in the morning uh, presentation professor sandeep was uh, was uh, discussing about that spaces because still now suppose we are applying the uh, sobel of spaces the most, most generalized space but uh, it does not contain everything so we have to generalize our space with more axioms 
So in that way, I have seen that limitations of the numerical method itself. So therefore, in my opinion, it is a ever ending process and in order to see the better view of the whole problem, not that only this mathematical part, the whole part that is physical plus mathematical plus part. So you have to have some better intelligence or some wisdom which is available in our scripture, uh, what uh, the other uh, speakers also uh, have told extensively. So that is also uh, my view. So I think uh, take challenging problem in your life, face difficulties, and then you will learn the intricacies of the reality. But don't take very simple problem and simple solution. Then your life will be very simple. You will not understand the reality. Take challenging problem in your life. So that I suggest even to students that don't take simple project, take complex project, whatever results you are getting, keep it like that. Even I heard that the uh, best PhD thesis were, uh, which does not give the solution of the problem even in the history of our uh, this scientific discovery. So in that way, I, I should say that uh, uh, through only this mechanistic view, there is uh, no stop, you cannot stop. It will be going, going on, but only using the higher intelligence, using the wisdom of our ancient scriptures, you can see the better uh, complete picture of the problem as a whole, and then you can decide that, okay, where I can stop. So that is, uh, I'm leaving to you. Thank, I, you, thank uh, you, Professor, for that answer. I hope you are happy with that answer. I, I want to add just a small point. In IIT Bhubaneswar, we have a very strong group <coughs> who studies the air, water, ocean, and uh, land interaction. And there they find that chaos theory is the one which is very, very important. And that is at its infancy, absolute infancy. The mathematical equations they develop, every month it keeps on changing, okay? And if, of course, they become much more successful. We could uh, predict many of the cyclones and etc. Uh, much at a much better level than that of IMD or the uh, um, this thing US predictions, but there I see the mathematical equations they develop etc. There are such a the chaos modeling modeling of chaos. Now under the circumstances, sometimes I have asked my uh, colleagues, what is this chaos? Is it another form of God? I they keep thinking so. What is this chaos? Why suddenly chaos develops? Okay, if chaos is beneficial to humanity, these are the kind of questions comes to me when I ask them. Okay, you also think about it. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those answers. And uh, we, as uh, we are moving towards the closing of the session, we have 15 minutes left. We'll take as many questions as possible. I have a lot of questions. Uh, this is uh, the real purpose of the whole summer school to answer the intriguing questions of this audience. So next question is, what is the actual purpose of Jyotish Shastra? That is astrology in our scriptures. Doesn't it true that prophecies make people prejudiced? How do we comprehend it? according to the contemporary knowledge system. Google says astrology is a non-scientific form of entertainment that draws connections between human behavior and alignment of stars and planets. This is a question from our MC Manas. Anyway, this was not a part of the, any of the lectures in this particular school. Yes, something to do with cosmology, so Possibly, as a question. Okay, what is the purpose of uh, Jyotish Shastra, astrology, uh, in our scriptures? Is not it true that prophecies uh, make people prejudiced? How do we comprehend it according to? the contemporary knowledge system. Okay, um, and a nice question actually. 
So all uh, this Jyoti Shastra, uh, this is one of the Vedas, which is actually it's called Vedanga, uh, part of the Vedic system only. Okay, so Vedanga, and it is Vedic science. So it is based on karma theory. So if you understand karma, then it is okay. That means because all living entities, we are all living entities. So it is not that the first, for the past time we are here. So we are coming many times, okay, in some form or other. That means previous life's karma we are carrying. So therefore, one is having good fortune, another is having bad fortune. So one is having good facilities, another is having bad facilities. So how it is happening? So this is from the previous life, what karma he has done. Whether he has done certain uh, pious activities or uh, bad activities, so these are punya and papa. So these are there actually. So based on that, so he will take birth at a particular constellation time. So at that time, the, what is the position of all these planetary planets, nine planets basically, which are, which influence the life of a person? So it is straightforward. So from that, because just like a model, this was a model, Vedic model, so it will predict. It will predict. Just like modern, we have the models, so it, the equation is there, it will predict after five minutes what is the position of this projectile. Similarly, this will also project. So at the time of birth and place, so latitude, longitude, all these things, and what is the constellation, and then it will predict. So there are all the permutation combinations are already done by Brugumani, who has written as Petrai's College Brugo Sangita. For all the persons, because all the constellation positions, whatever permutation combinations, these are he has calculated and given chart for everybody. It is there already. But point is, so if one is not taking into spiritual practices, his course will go as it is predicted. But point one comes to spiritual practices, he can change his course of action. That means Jyotis will fail that time. That time, so because when Krishna, the Lord, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, will take charge of his previous karmas, he will burn out. So all the, that karma, where the pile is there, Parmani Nidhayanti Jai Kintu Bhakti Bhajan. One who practices spiritual practices, all his karma, puta, bija, prarabdha, everything will be fried out. So, he will be totally now given uh, <clears throat> under the direct control of the Lord rather than this Jyotisha predictions. So, okay. so, how you can comprehend according to the uh, contemporary knowledge systems? So, this is how. This is also Vedic, uh, this is science, completely science. Vedic science is a complete science and modern science also is doing the same thing. So you can understand in that way and better you can see you can see if you start practicing spiritual uh, uh, processes your even the uh, hand marks will change your predictions earlier and now we go after 10 15 years the same jyotisha will tell something else so this you can uh, test yourself uh, then from the result you can understand which is working really working or not working Okay, so I, I think others can add to this, uh, whatever I uh, knew, I just spoke. Anybody else? Yeah. I hope uh, that answers or satisfies the questionnaire. Now we will move to the next question as I have a lot of questions here. How to know the purpose of life? One may say that the ultimate goal of life is unison with God. But how to identify that path to that des destination? I personally believe that everyone has a different purpose, different route to that common aim. How do I recognize mine? So I would uh, pass this question to Sri Varun Agarwalji. Who is asking this? This question? is the question from Swagya, uh, Sarvagya Go Goel. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, good question. Um, it is true that uh, intellectual mind, educated mind, wants to find himself, the reason, the logic. Though the scripture says very straight that purpose of life is to revive our, to find out about God, to derive our relationship with God. But then now, um, suppose I want to find out by myself or do a logical analysis. Yes, so one can do that. Mm. You see, you, you have to go a couple of steps. One is that uh, one of the basic foundation uh, which comes in our life is one thought process is that one day all of a sudden uh, at t equal to zero for example i am here right one day all of us we just come out of the womb of the mother at t suppose whatever time t equal to t1 and i don't know why i am here is, does it you wonder about this when you go back contemplate i just each of us just one point we come out in this world and then uh, i am given the goals you have to become this uh, good academician good doctor good lawyer all this and then you have to lead a family and then uh, well everybody dies so you also die so what is the big deal <laughs> the, the process is presented in a, such a nice way so as to one side not to not to too much inquire first of all and not to question the very why i am here at all and this if one can not question why i am here then what good is our curiosity you are curious about stars you are curious about black holes you are curious about quantum entanglement you are curious about everything other than yourself that that's curiosity is good but the very foundation means why I'm suddenly here. So that was actually the purpose which science started with originally. Now things have changed. So if one goes with that foundation, one will come to a point that I should first of all inquire why I'm here. That I cannot avoid it. Even if others try to make me avoid, I will not avoid this question why I'm here. That is number one. Number two, hmm. you can add further. I, I, this is not a philosophy, theology, scripture, or faith. I have to leave this world. Whatever numbers of paper I publish, I attain the best position in academics in Stanford University. Whatever I do, I have to leave this world. Why? One can question. Very, very simple and logical question. I am not telling this our Bhagavad Gita or scriptures tell this. So even they go to the point, very strong words that if one cannot question these two points, birth and death, he is not considered a human being. Very strong words. Mean human being is not by two kidney, one kidney, two gallbladders, and two retina and nice hairstyle. This is not human being, we skip just step. So, uh, to, to put a foundation is that uh, there must be something behind in this cosmos. Means why am I given a window of 70, 80 years or 100 years and then finish, that's all. So this puts a thoughtful person, what is the purpose behind my life? That that has to come, any person, means if he is thoughtful, really curious, not just the partial curiosity as we have been propounding today. Curiosity is very important, it is a part of our ancient tradition and modern science both. But it has to come to foundational questions of life, then curiosity is complete. So then one can go to next level, uh, uh, well, next level. Mm, scientist helps in this. One Brower is there in history of mathematics. He very nicely analyzed. Okay. Uh, one is, I am here today. I don't know why I am here. But 
my birth i don't know my death i don't know after what happens both sides are unknown to me but one thing is very clear that i am here right okay so there must be something some force somewhere which has put me here right which is and certainly he should be above me then only he is able to put me in this situation what is that above me is there something above that above him you go and you come to the point of what point you come that is called god so scriptures are perfectly logical mathematical this is actually analysis by one of the founders of mathematics brauer from netherlands so he come to the point that if i exist and i don't know why i am existing certainly there must be somebody who has put me here in this situation because things are not and he has certainly more thing than me because i have no idea he is above me and certainly it should end somewhere so there must be a god when you come to logical analysis of god then next simple next question is if god is there i am there why he created me right you go to sequence is very mathematical you will come to same point of vedanta that unless one connects to god he will not be happy that's why the purpose which is told in vedanta in a simple three word shloka you can do a rigorous mathematical logic analysis and come to same point i told you partially uh, it will take too much you can rest you can fill up if you are not able to fill up i will help you to remaining fill up later okay but just to give you a, a glimpse second just to sorry to second you see uh, very simple about karma Kar karma is very simple question each of us are born to a separate parent and we don't decide whom we are born yes i don't decide if i would have decide or you could have decided he would have decided to be born in maybe governor's womb or somebody we have no choice so what the baby little baby just born has done a wrong that he one is put on the footpath one is put in the governor's womb you go deep analysis karma must be there even there are mathematical logic for understanding karma also when just giving a basic logic so when you come to this karma when you come to god so all this thing very systematically take you to the the basics of beginning of vedanta then you move forward from there i hope this much we can do sorry if i take everybody's time too much no no actually this in fact uh, uh so has covered uh, holistically many questions i had more questions in the similar line one question is uh, i have a question from past two days after attending lectures that people are saying so much like time mass computer etc but what i found i am i am here like i want here like meditation uh kirtan and bhajan etc but not that worldly knowledge first why is this happening to should i start to gain this knowledge to get something more in spiritual path question 2 yesterday i listened from one of the lecture that everything is for some purpose then how can one get to know about this purpose because there are many paths that one can obtain so this i think this answers this question also there is one more question the similar line what is the connection between nature love that is love towards nature and the spiritual attainment attainment can you have quick quick uh, points on this but but uh, the the nature love ah spiritual attainment oh okay nature love and spiritual attainment so 
this is a very um, interesting point nature so when we do scientific analysis the last thing we go there is how thing any phenomena is happening nature is doing it we stop there but what is nature from where the nature has come how can you stop at nature so in uh, scriptures it is told maya dakshina prakriti suyate sa characharam from i am the source i am the director of this nature this is bhagavad gita shloka so nature is the last last is lord from him comes the nature means what we put in cosmology the phenomena the planets right so that's what we were discussing what is this nature how it comes that's the most one of the foundational question so the nature's love is very good said love of any kind of anything with anybody in a sense of whether animals whether human beings whether nature love is very good but still it is not complete unless love comes with the god all loves will remain incomplete it will break down at some point means break down in the sense so many ways it will break down one is two good friendship good, good love after some misunderstanding happened separated one simple second is friend got a post doc position in germany he separated and after that he got married and settled there now once in a while you talk next level of thing is we leave the body so the word the love here is very good but is not complete so that but if one develops what is called love in normal language love with god is technically called bhakti if one develops that love with god all the love he will find completeness whether some and the person in front is loving him responding or not you can still love him that goes to such a deep extent so well, that is a deep thing uh, we are very ordinary small people but idea is that um, spiritual and light this nature's love is a subset of spiritual enlightenment when you have a spiritual enlightenment which means pure love with the divine with the lord nature love is automatic because you feel what a what a creation my lord has done see such a beautiful fish moving without any we are trying to understand the aeroplanes how their wings move of the bird what a creation every point you see the mountain every point you fall in love that how he has done it so if love starts from the root it will be complete and lasting this much i can say thank you sir thank you i think uh, there is given a wonderful pointer towards the unconditional unlimited love actually dr td singh uh, who is the founder director of uh, bhaktivenanta institute so he has given a talk on this science of the science of unconditional love the unlimited love which we call it in ahetuki apratihata which flows unconditional and which flows unstopped so that's the love sir is talking about so the idea is we have to move towards that or inquire about it or work towards reaching that kind of a love thank you so much and uh, i think we have come to the one hour session we completed it the topic of this session was um, foundations of science and beyond future directions so quickly 3 seconds i would request the panelists to just give what is the future what what is there in store for us in future based on the discussions we and deliberations we had in the last 3 days on this topic so 3 seconds quickly then we'll wind up the session thank you
I have been asked to speak for three seconds. Even uh, Weinberg gave himself three minutes. Jokes apart, the theme is foundations of science and beyond future directions. In these three days, we have actually gone quite deep into various aspects of foundations of science and some glimpses of what may lie beyond. At least to me, they are only glimpses, but I hope when we all go home and think about them, they will become more concrete and also suggest practical future directions in this uh, very exciting journey. Yes, sir. sir. I practice chemistry, so I can tell you this much that future directions in chemistry is actually in understanding biology because the now uh, already it is told, but now I am understanding I'll work with very small molecules. Okay, it is not enough to understand the nature. In order to understand nature, we have to go to big molecules. I thought that mercury sulfide was a very small molecule. Now this uh, nature told me or God told me or whatever I have told me that it is a very big molecule. And that is a drug molecule. It is very, very big. It is not HGS. It is a helix, infinite helix of a particular symmetry. I mean, how did our ancient forefathers come to know about it. Like Kekule had those dreams of binging structure. Did they also have that kind of a dream or meditation from where they got this knowledge that this particular mercury sulfide, which is a very simple material, is a very big chain like a DNA double helix. We talk about DNA double helix. Have we understood that it is full? Not yet. That talk, people talk about triple helix and etc. etc. So, biology is one definite future direction in an understanding the deeper meaning of biology with the context of spiritual revelations. That's what I think after attending this particular few three days lecture. Thank you, sir. Uh, you are reflecting the thoughts of Dr. Teddy Singh. He always he said uh, that future is the time of biology. <laughs> Okay, so three seconds, I can share three points. One is that in this summer school, we have tried to give you a small glimpse of the foundations. It is not enough. So it is your own journey. It's like a small kind of advertisement for you to know the field. So my request is that each of you try to go further. That is uh, in the foundations. That will be really helpful. Mm. Second is that uh, if it is possible, those who are research oriented or pursuing research, try to choose one specific topic and work in that for some, some years in this, in this area, foundation of science, in your discipline. That will really show you for yourself, by yourself. Means now you are listening to others, but that's not where intellectual mind ends. So he wants to himself see it. So my request is, you choose one of the topics and pursue research side by side, slowly by slowly. No need of any pressure of papers or any deadline. Do it. Over the years, you will see the gems coming out. And the things which are being talked, you personally will see with your eyes, you perceive. And third thing is, of course, uh, means my small request that uh, add some spiritual practices in life. So that will help you because life is not always like a up up going curve right is a sign is there are, there are always some ups and downs so when you are very down it will balance you to the axis uh, so add some 15 20 minutes per day not much uh, that will help a lot in your own comprehension of the academics as well as in your own personal uh, peace and happiness so that much uh, I, you need not to leave anything Pursue your research, pursue your academics and career, your profession, carry on it nicely, 
and just add few things of this side, official side, that will make you very beautiful journey. This much I can say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Professor Hare Krishna Okay. Uh, so, science and spirituality, so they are going to like, um, so they are actually two paths for the same search. In science also we are searching for the absolute, spirituality also we are searching for the absolute. So they must converge. Science and spirituality must converge at a point of time. Of course, one is top down, another is bottom up approach. But in future, it must has to converge. So, uh, the role of scientists as modern scientists. So they have to see the viewpoints from both spirituality point of view and modern science point of view, and they can actually uh, <coughs> create this synthesis. So that is the requirement, uh, and this is going to happen. So we can see that as people are more and more interested, and they are thinking about the spirituality from the scientific background, scientifically they are inquiring. So when they are given answer, uh, philosophically, they are convinced, so they must accept. So it is not a blind following. So definitely future of uh, uh, modern science and also spirituality uh, science. So they must converge at one point of time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ranjir Repetit. So, thank you. Uh, here, basically, the only take home message is where science and spirituality begins. So basically, the science is basically for our happiness. So when we search for happiness, that has to be permanent. And we require a holistic approach, where, as was said, the synthesis of science and religion, science and spirituality is the so only science alone is not enough, we require spirituality for holistic approach. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Debashis Khan, please. So, uh, a few months back, uh, when I got it. So, a few months back, uh, when I was in Kolkata, so uh, one day, uh, Borunji called me uh, to the Bhaktivinoda Institute office and he told me that I uh, want to do a uh, summer school on this uh, topic like it was known, knowable and unknowable. And Dr. T.D. Singh uh, had a vision to organize this. And uh, once uh, there was a conference in US on the similar topic, I think. And uh, uh, and this, con uh, this conference was organized by all the top scientists. And uh, this time also I invited a few, but because of their this uh, busy engagement, they could not uh, uh, join. <coughs> so uh, in that spirit, uh, Dr. Dr. Singh uh, told uh, uh, his disciples, Borunji and Brajapati, that tried to hold a similar type of uh, conference or school uh, in future because uh, this is uh, very, very important and foundational. So in the last three uh, deliberations on this topic, it appears that, okay, uh, through various disciplines uh, of science, uh, we have come to know many things in nature. We have explored the nature through several ways. We know many things, okay. And also, we may know many things in futures by using our, uh, by, by exercising our this scientific knowledge or by increasing our this uh, computational uh, technique or this power. So a few things uh, may be known in future, okay, but uh, they are also it appears from the deliberations that few things may not be knowable like uh, in many presentations I saw that like Turing test or good incompleteness theorem. So these are 
clearly indicating and uh, these are not that like these are like our experimental blockages or but these are inherent problems so therefore these problems are there at the foundational level so therefore to reinforce the foundations in science also and in order to make this unable to knowable so i think uh, in my view this spiritual wisdom or spiritual elements uh, can help a lot uh, so that Again, I am repeating the same thing that a greater and broader overview of the physical world or in a very uh, small scale for the problem in a very complete way, we can comprehend the things in a better way. So this may be a take home message that try to include some uh, spiritual elements in your life or the spiritual wisdom so that uh, this unknowable may be a knowable in future, which you are thinking that it may be not knowable that's all thank you uh, it's been a wonderful session and uh, i have been given this uh, responsibility of moderating the session i am really humbled by that and uh, as a moderator you know there are no points to be added but still i would try to add uh, my understanding of the whole discussion that uh, you question the foundations question the logic question the reasoning by doing so <clears throat> you will reach or you will get an opportunity to, to understand at least a glimpse of the ultimate reality. Okay, with these words, I would like to conclude the session. Thank you. I thank all the panelists uh, for coming here and answering all these questions. And I have a few more questions left, but we are running short of time. We will get this answered and try to post it to you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Could I have a couple of volunteers here near the stage? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. The, the kind of brainstorming in the last session shows that uh, we all had, uh, uh, as I, in my, what I was saying yesterday, our brain scratched. So uh, we have a lot more questions. And as uh, Sri Milinda Segaji su suggested that we might be able to uh, get some replies to that and post them in the future. So with this, all the uh, technical sessions end. And I, Manish Chandan Mishra from IIT Bhuvaneshwar, take this opportunity to welcome you all to the validatory, uh, validatory function of the sixth edition of summer school held at Gopabandhu Ayurved Mahavidyalaya in Puri. And uh, this is an immensely exciting evening for each, each one of us, uh, from, especially from Bhaktivedanta Institute, due to the diversity in the types of participants that uh, along with their ge geographical and uh, uh, academic backgrounds. So a big round of applause for all the participants, please. 
this summer school 2022 was the culmination of the supervision guidance and deliberations of swamiji's scholars speakers and veterans and the enthusiasm of all the participants so in order to further the validatory function i would like to invite dr debasis khan convener summer school 2022 to present his concluding remarks dear participants a very good evening to all of you welcome to the concluding part of summer school 2022 organized by bhaktivant institute kolkata for us organizing the uh, summer school has been challenging but uh, i can see it is productive we have sincerely tried to the best of our capacity to host this summer school in hybrid mode so please uh, excuse us for any lapses which i hope and pray are minor i would like to conclude this summer school with a few thoughts on what we have learned during these three days uh, during the course of school a group of experts brought together by the bhaktivant institute kolkata presented the work they had accomplished over the past several years <coughs> towards the overall theme of the school physicists mathematicians medical doctors engineers biologists chemists philosophers religious leaders are working for building a pleasant environment where we live they have sought deeper understanding of several complex issues associated with the foundation of science the work of the bhaktivant institute kolkata which has been contributing to a more profound awareness of foundations of science and beyond especially through dialogues seminars and conferences and thereby it has made it possible to bring together the various perspectives concerning the very foundational questions related to the present day science from the session of foundations of quantum mechanics the message by professor andy haridas was loud and clear for us he started with an overview of causality in classical and quantum physics both in mechanics and field theory then he ended with a brief remarks on time reversal violation in elementary particle physics and recent notions of indefinite causal order in quantum theory he also pointed out the issues like the concept of time currently we have at the foundational level of the classical and quantum mechanics we need something more then in the lecture of professor doring he presented topos theory for a realistic interpretation of the quantum formalism interested students are encouraged to explore this area because this is new area next in young mind speak mr dipankar sharma discussed how the phenomena like wave particle duality superposition etc introduces the idea of consciousness he concluded that it is very difficult for quantum physics alone to describe the very foundational basis of our existence the consciousness in this session on brain mind and consciousness limits in mathematical modeling which also includes the presentation by professor sandeep kumar today so professor cc rai mentioned deciphering noise in the brain is a major challenge in modern brain research how various particles of meditation reduce the noise in the brain question mark can we estimate the various noises in the brain and its reduction based on the current understanding of modern science in the presentation of sri varun agarwal he presented uh, an overview of the foundations of various disciplines in science and then mentioned the issues present at the foundational concepts he also mentioned the need of consciousness based foundation into our academic studies for resolving the issues 
Professor Sandeep Kumar presented a comparison of axiom-based spaces and hypothesis-based mathematical modeling. He also pointed out the serious limitations in the mathematical model of Big Bang theory. He personally told me about this superposition principle in that, uh, which is, uh, is valid in case of linear system, but our Big Bang is highly nonlinear, but still the superposition principle they are using. So that is a very serious flaw, he uh, told me personally. According to him, spirituality is based on the concept of existence of some higher intelligence, which is very logical and can be expressed in the language of mathematics. He also explained the axioms of dharma, which is very interesting. Uh, also, the role of mathematical space and logic to understand spirituality has been presented in his presentation. Then uh, Mr. Rajesh Pandit presented a very nice talk on the limits of mathematical logic. Yesterday, uh, in the first session, we had presentations on cosmology and time. Fantastic presentations were there from the speakers, Professor Craig Callender, Professor Pankaj Jassi, and Professor Ram Upaluri. All the authors have mentioned about the uh, serious limitations of the knowledge as laid down in the present day modern cosmology. Professor Pankaj Joshi and Professor Upaluri went further ahead by mentioning the need of imbibing knowledge from our ancient scriptures to resolve the issues such as quantum gravity concept of time. Really, the presentations were excellent and inspiring. Then in the session of Young's Mind Speak, Mr. Roshan Tiwari presented on is the precise matching of energy difference required to activate the biological reactions through very narrow wavelength range and the high ac acuity of our eye is mere a product of deep time and chance or involves some higher purpose. Then Mr. Nikhil uh, Enogu presented on a very foundational question on what is mass? Interestingly, from his presentation, it appears that we do not know even the, the basic definition of mass properly as we do not understand the electron properly. Next, in this session of foundation of computer science, Mr. Susan Sarma presented on computation, formal versus inimitable. Uh, he mentioned about the limitations of formal computation. Then, in this session of <coughs> That is uh, today's session, first session, uh, revisiting uh, the foundations of life science insight from ancient tradition. Dr. Bickness presented nicely how beauty and the fine tuning exist uh, from the smallest atom to the gigantic solar system is nothing but a small reflection of the supreme intelligence. Very nice presentation it was. Then, Dr. Dhiraj Dubey presented an interesting topic on revisiting the non-reductionistic uh, non Ayurvedic approach in the light of modern biophysics. He mentioned the need for paradigm shift in curing our diseases. Next, uh, Mr. Rithik presented on mystery of consciousness very nicely. In my view, all the young mind presentations were excellent. In the last session of today, uh, there were two impressive presentations. Uh, their contents are very, very interesting and inspiring to listen. But, uh, but Professor Joshi stopped, Professor uh, Mahanta started from there. And uh, Sri K. Vasudev Rao uh, gave the foundations of new science, I hope we should include those to resolve the issues present in uh, the present day science. So before we say goodbye, I would like to say not to say thank you to those who participated in this three day summer school, both through offline and offline mo uh, online mode and listen the lectures patiently and finally Thanks to the event management team, particularly for all their hard work to make this happen. Well done all. Knowledge sharing is an important part of what we do. So these 
past three days lectures as well as discussions help us to advance on the important journey to know many complex as well as very foundational issues of our very existence but it does not stop here we plan other programs we invite participants to join in the forthcoming seminars conferences schools organized by the bhaktivedanta institute kolkata thank you again thank you sir i hope summer school 2022 exploring the foundations of science and beyond has added a few memories in all of our minds along with unlocking new do uh, new doors to unknown territories so i would like to request some of the participants to share their experiences and give uh, give feedback of how they feel about this uh, particular summer school so i would request rithvik to kindly circulate the mic and get some feedbacks verbal feedbacks yeah i would like to request the audience to the way they are questioning similarly i would like to request them to yeah so could you please pass it on to niket uh, yes uh, actually like uh, i think that by synthesis what they meant is like we have to harmonize between science and spirituality because there are limitations in uh, spirituality as we all know already but like uh, in this uh, summer school they try to explain what all limitations in science also there because means we already know that uh, in spirituality it is like uh, as per bhagavatam culture it is in higher realm uh, means it is not in material energy control that's why we are not having any logical proof for the things and how we say it is a top down approach but like in uh, uh, this summer school there was purpose for understanding the limitations of science also so that people from scientific background could understand or could at least uh, get the ideas other people also what all problems in science also there so in that way these conferences have the meaning and purpose when we try to harmonize between science and spirituality with harmonizing means uh, we have to look upon the commonalities between both the domains uh, means uh, commonalities means there will there will be so many differences but we, we have to look upon the common good things also to move for the for the uh, solving of the mystical aspect so i think that is what is the purpose of such school is okay so and i thank everybody for uh, inspiring us to uh, move for, uh, in this journey of understanding how these things work like how nature works how supreme lord is there and uh, like it ignites the young minds i think for exploring further topics in that way uh, to think logically as well as uh, to think uh, what is inconceivable uh, yes thank you sir thank you niket for your very uh, deep insights uh, i would like to request niket to kindly uh, tell his uh, uh, in in one line his uh, academic background as well for the benefit of the audience uh, yes actually like uh, i studied mainly in bangalore only like i completed 10th class in bangalore uh, in 10th class like uh, my cgp was very good so like i was in merit then uh, in 12th class like uh, uh, my percentage was still very good like uh, um, means i had very like i am very good in english like uh, in 11th and 12th in all the standards i used to get almost good in english so english uh, i like so much then science also mathematics likewise then i uh, joined engineering in bangalore cmr institute of technology there i got a first class with distinction then i uh, did some i was means uh, uh, means i got placement in three companies also like all were three core companies then like uh, means i was doing some research but like i thought that i should go for government job like uh means i had dreams of getting into some good uh, research field so i was thinking about gate gate and all but like i'm still giving gate exam to understand more about this because gate exam is the foundation for further research 
so that's how it is going on thank you niket for yes. opening up so like i am trying to understand uh, more things in my background so that i can explore more uh, and i can get into some good uh, uh, means things uh, research and all that thank, thank you, you thank you uh, so who will be uh, yeah so uh, ritvik please oh, tell us your name and uh, uh, explain matlab in one line what do you do right now yeah i am i am a research scholar and phd student from iisr kolkata so right and i really liked all the lectures and uh, and uh, everything was very good but uh, i really got, got to know one thing that uh, okay that uh, a, uh, light or any any kind of energy which is interacting with the material so it is a materialistic world okay that can be connected to the spiritual world easily and science will help very much to connect all these things so consciousness and all the, i got all those ideas and i will try to still i am trying to grab all these things and i i will think that i can do something more and i will try to add something more and later whenever i will got some chance also so thank you very much to all of you thank you uh, ritvik to your left there were hands raised uh, sure, sure. please go ahead okay uh, thank you very much uh, to, uh, all the participants and uh, who organized i know very well who are roshan bhaiya and prabhu ji and uh, uh, you all guys are organized these things amazing uh, experience i got uh this is the very uh, much basics about the foundation of science and spirituality i learned a lot and uh, very big shots are giving lectures and i attend it and uh, learn a lot of things i enjoy a lot thank you very much thank you thank you Uh, this is raju i am from iit bhuvneshwar doing phd and it gives me immense pleasure that uh, to express my heartfelt gratitude towards bhakti vedanta institute for arranging uh, such kind of initiative where we uh, brought together and to interact with uh, very distinguished scientist which in the form of uh, spirituality and also science so uh, before attending this uh, these two day, uh, three day sessions i was under impression that the science is some just a part of life but after attending this session my uh, purview my understanding of what is spirituality and what is what is the connection between uh, spirituality and science and life also i got to know more about uh, spirit, uh, spirituality and, and the the thing that i have understood uh, by attending these uh, sessions is that spirituality is a part and parcel of everyone's life that we want we have to develop that as a part of that without spirituality there is no point of happiness with which in turn there is no life so life is spirituality so we should understand the importance and the significance of spirituality in our day to day life that is the first thing i learned and the second thing is the moment when we understand spirituality we, do, we should put into practice that the principles uh, and practice uh, we should put into practice that spirit, spirituality in our day to day life uh, that's the second thing so uh, i would also like to uh, express my gratitude towards my uh, iit bhuvneshwar for arranging bus facility and my uh, dean education con continuing education uh, dr uh, professor sujit roy sir for for giving me this for all for bringing us to here that's what i want to express uh, thank you one and all thank you yeah uh... Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Dinesh Joshi, and uh, currently I just have finished my M Tech from Triple IIT Delhi uh, in Computational Biology, and I have joined TCS Research as a research uh, as a researcher, pre-doc researcher here. So I have uh, like uh, uh, newly started my research journey, and uh, 
this uh, the previous AISSQ conference that was conducted by Bhakti Vedanta Institute. I attended that and that was an online mode. So uh, that conference uh, created a curiosity in, inside me for the science because uh, as uh, like uh, from school we have been studying science, we uh, like score good marks and then we uh, like uh, just for scoring good marks we uh, tend to study things. But uh, really when uh, uh, attending the conferences from Bhakti Vedanta Institute, I found the real meaning of exploring the science, like for the ultimate truth. So uh, uh, by my bachelor's was in computer science, but I have consciously chosen to shift into biology stream so that uh, I can be like, uh, can be in a search for the ultimate truth. And I think that biology will give me a larger span for, uh, for keeping up my spirits high because I generally with the technology stuff, I, my interest goes and like it comes and goes, but, uh, with biology, I think it uh, really like it amazes you every time you, uh, try to, uh, try to look into something, it will, uh, like open a thousand doors when you, uh, like seems a small concept, but it really unfolds into many dimensions. So, and uh, and I really feel blessed to attend such conferences because from college uh, where we uh, like we study no no teacher is like likely we talking about the spiritual aspect no one even no one want to hear that because and they are always in distress faces like here I see scientists they are like very with happy faces they are like uh, uh, this thing they are volunteering in this uh, idea with so much happiness. But in uh, colleges, we see they are like, uh, they, ha they don't have any personal life and they are doing research, but their personal life is really smashed. Like they're, they are really dealing with the personal problems. But uh, again, uh, so uh, I don't think I really don't idolize them because a person who is like well accomplished, he must have a person uh, like both work and life balance. And that is uh, really we can see in the lives of uh, like the people, the professors and teachers that have come here. So I really thank that. And it has this uh, short three days uh, workshop has been like a, uh, like a power battery charging for the current uh, coming year. And I will again try to like attend uh, the upcoming conferences so that it will like, uh, um, like keep the curiosity in, inside me to follow uh, the ultimate truth. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Joshi. Uh, anyone else would like to share something? A very good evening, everyone. So I'm Selvakya. I'm a MS project student, fifth year from ISA Kolkata. So the first thing I feel that keeping the venue in Puri itself is a very, you know, pious feeling that we are having uh, for the three days. So that idea, I don't know who's, uh, initiative but it was a very great idea for to begin with and i'd like to keep it short uh, saying that uh, we all i think entered a completely different genre of life attending the session with the spirituality as the motive and keeping the scientific background was itself a very intriguing thought and uh, i would like to thank for the initiators who could think of such a thought-provoking idea and giving us the chance you know uh, to to the mass of the people, especially the students, like this is the need of the art to keep it uh, in the people who are of young age group to facilitate that feeling within them. So it was a great initiative. Uh, as for the feedback, I have a couple of things to say. So uh, I would love to interact the people uh, in the offline mode and talk to them. Uh, so we need not have many foreigners out there. So the, those fascinations, I don't think exist anymore uh, to be to be truthful. So we can have the people from India also and uh, the people who can be physically present and guide us to their, you know, to their vibrations, the positive pious vibrations that we can feel through and interact with them. And uh, the last but not the least, I would like all of you to give a huge round of applause for the team, the volunteers, the people with the camera, the one at the back managing all the online stuff. So these are the hidden talents and the hidden forces that have made the program a huge success. Thank you, all of you, and thanks for the hosting. Such a great, great hosting, I would say. Thank you, everyone.
does anyone yeah uh, i am ramya devi research scholar from iit bhubaneswar i would like to thank rubik from iit bhubaneswar who is a reason for uh, for us to attend these sessions he encouraged us a lot so please sister please attend the session so after coming here we we really experienced a plethora of uh, topics uh, which made us to think on various things so we experienced spirituality in the food that we ate in the places that we visited and also in the lectures that we attended so thank you so much thank you everyone and thank you rithik especially thank you so much so is there anyone who would like to add something uh, avenues where we could improve for the next time hey shall you are asking so many questions hey yes please continue uh my name is savit i'm currently an aerospace engineering student uh so uh while studying engineering we uh i don't know about other people at least for me uh we are basically taught not to ask deeper questions so uh i think this three day experience generated at spark again uh, that uh, that spark that is generally with the kids of asking deeper questions so i'm inspired to ask deeper questions and probably find answers to some of them uh, but as i see uh, uh, many of the questions simply don't have the answers uh, the quest of finding them is uh, what life is really about so that's all i wanted to say thank you and uh, is for all the participants who are online on zoom uh we request you to kindly raise your hands so that we could take your questions online uh, sorry uh, feedbacks online for all the participants online attending the uh, program the event through zoom kindly raise your hands and give your feedbacks and in the meanwhile if we could take a couple of more feedbacks or any suggestions among the offline audience um i am uh, audible to everyone i have told to uh, i think somebody else that uh, our one person sitting uh, standing at the back our uh, swami ajitun dhal <coughs> a very good friend of iit bhubaneswar and uh, bhakti vedanta institute there is a constant source of encouragement for happiness to our students every saturday they do all sorts of things to keep be happy and it so happened god might have chosen me to uh, buy a plot Eight years back, when the it was the area was full jungle, Bhakti Vedant the issue it was also not there, and um, my wife uh, somehow we went there and she selected that uh, Barunai Hill and she said we'll have our house here, and there is nobody around, and I bought that plot and kept it just like that. Now uh, we see that Bhakti Vedant the issue it is my neighbor, okay, so. Uh, these are uh, what so, what somebody says this is like god's uh, uh, ultimate some kind of uh, uh, wishes perhaps so i also came here as a absolutely a participant okay we did the summer school uh, f- uh, as a curtain sorry curtain raiser to the summer school very spontaneously as soon as i got charge of the dean of continuing education that happened also 5 days before i at this uh, summer school i took the charge and said i'll do the summer school i mean sorry curtain raiser and then we all put together i wanted to uh, have uh, i wanted to really 
inspire the students and uh, we'll keep doing that i'm sure bhakti vedanta institute will come as a long term friend to at bhubaneswar for creating this uh, uh, synthesis of spirituality and science amongst all the students of iit bhubaneswar and also the family of iit bhubaneswar because all iits are you know residential so we are very close to each other so this actually this school also then therefore gives me an opportunity to have a very big handshake of love okay between bbs iit bbs and bhakti vedanta institute bbi okay <laughs> bbi bbs and iit bbs and i'm really thankful to all the swamijis uh, for showing us <clears throat> one step at least which we can take now or maybe half a step which we can immediately take towards this journey thank you very much thank you sir we have one uh, we have one hand raised uh, it's probably pranav mehan could we take uh, his feedback please could we yes i'm audible to everyone uh mr pranam you you are muted sir. give us a couple of seconds and now is it okay yeah you are audible yeah so so good afternoon so good evening to everyone i am pranam mehan currently studying in class 12th pcm uh the attending the science and spirituality session was really a great experience for me although some those subject matter was far beyond my understanding because i'm studying in class 12th and the professor at ndr das sessions were like phd uh, like bhakti vedant institute work uh, for spirituality and science engaging them both and uh, educating the society about our culture is really great and uh, and they also Uh, they have also motivated us to ask uh, good questions that that limitations of uh, science as well science has also ha has its limitations uh, mostly people don't come to spirituality because it's a, a non logical thing but uh, here the uh, swami ji uh, shri varun agarwal ji shri k vasudev rao ji and uh, professor anidas and uh, many other great people have gave us exposure to a lot of great things so i thank you all to all the participants and uh, to our host as well thank you thank you pranav i think we have another hand uh, raised here uh, could i get the name please yeah good evening i am uh, anula milinder and uh, i am really happy to uh, attend this uh, summer school online uh, it was a wonderful 3 uh, day experience and uh, unfortunately i wanted to be there but i could not be there for other reasons i'd like to extend my hearty congratulations to the organizers who have done such a wonderful job and i'm so happy to see the young generation uh, uh, expressing such uh, provo thought provoking questions and uh, uh, introspecting into their own personal lives and their quest for their life's journey and so i'm thankful to all of you and uh, uh, for this wonderful experience and uh, i'm sure dr tz singh will be extremely pleased uh, seeing such a nice uh, uh, audience and uh, such eminent speakers uh, spiritualists and scientists it was an amazing experience thank you so much thank you ma'am so do we have anyone else so with that if there are no more feedbacks to be uh, provided i'd like to request uh, secretary summer school 2022 mr roshan tiwari to come on stage and extend the vote of thanks so <clears throat> good evening to all respected speakers session chairs and all the assembled 
students, scholars, audience, and friends. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to thank you for your participation in this summer school. I hope all the deliberations were both intellectually stimulating and insightful for all of you. The success of the conference is accomplished by all of your presence and the hard work of all our dedicated members as well as our supporters and volunteers. We express our heartfelt gratitude to the generous sponsors, Dr. Tapan Kumar Chan, President of Vedanta Limited, Odisha and Chhattisgarh, Dr. B.D. Mundra, Emeritus Chairman, Simplex Infrastructure Limited, Sibramanan Mangaraj, Sri Krishna Contact Private Limited, and school partners. We would like to extend our sincere gratitude to Dr. Sudarshan Behra, the principal of Ayurvedic College, for giving us the support for our summer school venue. We would like to thank all our distinguished speakers for accepting our invitation to present their talk both online and offline. We also like to extend our gratitude to all the session chairs and the young mind session speakers. We acknowledge Dr. Ramji Repaka and Dr. Jay Narayan Todu for uh, giving their time, valuable time for ranking and comprehending the creative posters by our school students. And we, I would, we would like also to express our gratitude to the humble convener, Dr. Debasis Khan, for his continuous support and timely guidance whenever needed. We express our heartfelt thanks to the master of ceremony of the summer school, Sri Manas Chand Misra, Sri Kausik Gupta, and Sri Milinan Segarji. We also extend our thanks to the online event management team headed by Sravan Kumar and Susan Sarmaji. Without them, it's, it was a very difficult for us. So we, we would like to especially thank Professor Viren Kumar Tiwari, Director of IT Bhuvaneshwar, Professor Sujit Roy, Dean of Continuing Education, Dr. Rajesh Roshan Das, Dr. Tarakanta Nayak for organizing a special and memorable curtain raisin ceremony of the school at IIT Bhuvaneshwar. <laughs> and encouraging students to take part in this school. We as well express gratitude to the directors of AIMS Bhuvaneshwar, IMA Bhuvaneshwar, and Vice Chancellor of Soya University, Dr. Mukesh Tripathi, Professor Jasubanta Jena, Professor Asok Kumar Mahapatra for encouraging us to organize preschool seminars in their institutes, respectively. We would like to thank Dr. Devasis Hota, Dean of Ames Bhuvneshwar, Professor Nachiketa K. Sarma, Dr. Kamal Nochan Mohanta, Dr. Terlok Panigrahi, Mr. Hari Prakash, and Student Association of Ames Bhuvneshwar for selflessly supporting to organize the preschools. We also humbly acknowledge and thanks our institute members and volunteers for various services. Jitun Dhal, Avinash Kumar, Tusar Das, Sanjeev Saha, Susan, Susan Sarma, Madan Mohan Das, Siddharth Tiwari, Kalya Krishna Das, Siddhikant Pradhan, Chandrasekhar Das Ji, Somaranjan Jena, Sant Thakur Das Ji, Ajay Sahu, Akhai Das, Vedananda, Yogesh, Narendra Reddy, Kausik, Manoj, Rajat, Sasang, Bhaskar, Akshit, Ravi, Anand Ses Das Ji, Amar, Pavan, Siddharth, Uma Sankar, Raju, Ramya, Rishi, Naveen, Mayur, Trilok, Mohit, Aditya, Dharpan, Subhaman, Prabhas, for lovingly helping us, assisting at various ends related to website design, venue management, registration, accommodation, hospitality, outreach management on online platform as well as offline platform. Tour arrangements, serving food, fundraising, preschool seminars. So they have really did a great job 
So, we are also obliged to the financial help rendered by many of our volunteers in India and in abroad. Dr. P. R. Maiti, Dr. Arnab Sarkar, His Grace Achutanand Das Ji, His Grace Rayan Manda, Ray, Ray Man Raman Das Ji, His Grace Sanjeev Das Ji, Professors Bhas, Bhaskar Kumar, Vaman Malli Das Ji, Balaji, Simanchalam, Saurabh Das, Subramanyam, Chaitanya Madhav Das Ji, Namaneet Krishna Das Ji, Acharya Charan Das Ji, Desari Vankaya, Dadari Rupa, Jagan Natham Iswar, Ganesh Subramanyam Ji, T. Fanindra, Punapulli Bhaskar Naidu, Nag Raju, Ramu, Ram Mohan, Veena, Akshit, Prem Rupani Devi Dasi, Mithiles Parit, Anike Chaudhari, Vyasak, Sri Aristotel Maiti Ji, Nandi Ji, Dheeraj Dubey, Dipankar Sarma, Dr. Devasis Khan Ji, Amit Mandal, Vaman Bali, Bala Ji, Saurav Subramanyam, Bhakt Vatsal Das Ji, Srikant Chandragiri, Niti Siyanibu, Lal Babu Singh, Barun Singh, Anil Singh, Ajit Singh, Logel Singh, Roman Sarma, Manoj Bhakti Devi, Niva Devi, Trikent Singh, Suresh Singh, Viswajit Singh, Sanahandi Devi, Amarjit Singh, Chetan Singh, Braj Lila Devi, Suchitra Sikdara and many other generous supporters for this school. We would also like to thank the in-charge and staff of Niladri Bhakti Nivas, where our students are staying. Sripad Vatika Residences for helping us in logistics for accommodation and the supporting staff of Ayurvedic College in helping us out with all the value related logistics. We would like to express our heartful thanks to our food management team. Achyut Kesav Das Ji, Ram Gopal Das Ji, Krishna Kishore Das Ji and Chandra Sekhar Das Ji. It was really amazing food management and the, the, the prasad. We would also like to express our sincere thanks to all the volunteers from IIT Bhuvaneshwar. Mr. Narendra, Mr. Kausik, Rajat, Nitish, Akshat, Ravi Kant, Amar, Pavan, Siddharth, Uma Sankar, Raju, Ramya, Rishi, Naveen, Mayur, Trilok, Mohit, Aditya, Darpan, Subham, Prabhas, Sasang for their selfless support. We also especially thank the young poster presenters for coming forward to present their ideas in a very short time. We sincerely also thank Suvasitra Mahapatra for her cultural performance yesterday. <laughs> Last but not the least, we sincerely thank all the delegates for their enthusiasm and kind participation to make the summer school a great success. We are indebted to Dr. T.D. Singh, His Holiness Bhakti Swarup Damodar Swami, a pioneer of science and spirituality dialogue, founder director of Bhaktivedanta Institute, who has guided us immensely for organizing the school for the benefit of humanity. Our deep gratitude to Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the visionary saint for the modern age and the founder Acharya of the Bhaktivedanta Institute for giving us this wonderful platform and vision. We sincerely thank each and every individual, whether your name is mentioned or not, from the unlimited depths of our hearts. May good thoughts come from all directions. May everyone be happy, stay safe, stay well. Thank you. So, with this, I would like to invite uh, Swami Sri Varun Agrawal Ji for appreciating our whole team. So I'm amazed we had such a big list uh, who are behind our backbone. Means, wow. So. Um, what we will do, uh, we'll bring them to the stage, all our uh, 
uh, foundations of summer school. So now we studied foundation of science. Now is foundation of summer school. So um, we have um, website and publicity. So this was a uh, lot of hard work was done by Sai Vineet. He's uh, he's joining us online. Or he's uh, he's not here because of some work, but he did a lot of hard work. Uh, so we acknowledge. In registration, so we request Ritwik Gallam to come on the stage. <laughs> Tushar Das, if he's here, and Kalia Krishna Das. So I request uh, Swami Vasudev Rao also please come on the stage. We can right away we can give the participant certificate on no, the no, certificates appreciation certificates also and uh, let all everybody can be here so everybody can see uh, who are people involved then uh, venue arrangement venue arrangement Shri Jitun Dhal and Sai Vineet please come on the stage Accommodation, Jagdishwar and Vedananda. So many of you already know now our Swami Jitun Dhal. He has been working hard as our Professor Sujit Roy mentioned. He is a founder. He is the foundation of uh, our relationship, uh, Bhakti Institute relationship and IIT Bhavaneshwar. So, great work. Uh, this is Vedananda. Vedananda is a very bright doctor. He is in Ames studying and he will soon will come out with a lot of good things. Then uh, we have transport, Soumya Ranjan Jena and Nikhil. Uh, oh, those who are coming to the stage, they can stay, stay back together, let uh, stay here. Soumya Ranjan Jena. And Nikhil. Nikhil is where? Uh, Next is, uh, he will also come. Uh, next is hmm. food. So, if we have beautiful content, if there is no breakfast, no lunch, no prashad, it will be difficult, right, to digest the content. So, we have food, uh, our prashad, Achyute Keshav Das and Ram Gopal Das. So I think maximum claps I am hearing for the uh, this department looks like. <laughs> so he worked very really tirelessly. Uh, by the time we are ready, he's ready. Before morning, early morning, everything is working back in the background. Means we were really powered by him. Ram Gopal, um, oh, okay, he's not here, okay. Next, uh, poster, Ramji Repeka and Jayanara and Tudu. Ramji Repeka and Jayanara and Tudu had been wonderful judge. You see, judgment is not an easy task. So they analyze each poster, went to each uh, participant, the presenter, and they 